Watson has a medical practice to attend to. It's rather worrying. Um, his appointment book, have you seen it anywhere? Well, he usually keeps it in his doctor's bag, but I did find this on the all stand sort of note. Oh, let me see. Five, Westley, EC3, Tuesday, 10th, Royston. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. A friend in need. I was doing very nicely in my practice and thinking of going into partnership with an old medical colleague. His name was Royston. I'd met him on several occasions and knew he was engaged upon opening up a medical centre in one of the poorer parts of London. I didn't think twice about the authenticity of the proposal. One Tuesday, I called at a very grim and rather dilapidated building called Westley, just off the river. I was totally unprepared for my reception, for instead of meeting my old friend, I was shown into a small anteroom. It was dark. I couldn't see properly. Before I knew what was happening, hands seized me from behind. I struggled valiantly, and then a violent blow against the side of the head caused me to gasp. Stars swam before my eyes, and I lost consciousness. A star? Uh, Couldn't have been easier. The, um, falling for it like that. Yeah, you'd think anyone who'd associated with Sherlock Holmes would be a bit more careful. What's the next tip? We get him out and into a cab. Drive him to the boss's nursing home. From then on, it's nothing to do with us. They're not thinking of knocking him off, are they? Uh, I mean, it's not murder. No, the idea is to hold him as hostage, that's all. This is the one way of getting at Holmes. Those two have been buddies for years. If anything can tempt Holmes out into the open, this is the man. Come on now, pop him up. Yeah. He'll be coming round soon. We want to have him safe and sound by then. Uh, it's not going to be easy getting him into a cab. He's a big bloke. No, bigger than I am. Uh, we'll switch clothes. I'll carry the doctor's bag and it'll look like we're helping a patient down. Yeah. Uh, uh, here we are. Check the street. Yeah. Looks all clear. Getting just gas slams on down yet. But there's more than a bit of fog gathering. Yeah, what's you? Come on. No more talk. Get him on his feet. All right. He'll be able to put one foot in front of the other. By the time he comes to, he'll be in the nursing home with no idea of where he is or how he got there. Come on. You support him under one arm, and I'll take the other. Here we go. Hurry now. So that's the position, Lestrade. Watson is missing, and there's no trace. As you know, this is completely unlike him. I'm quite certain something's happened. He would never have remained silent if it had been possible for him to get a message to me. Hmm. Might have met with an accident. Have you tried the hospital? Well, yes, of course. Watson's well known in most of the local hospitals. There's no report of anyone answering to his description being found. And what do you think it's all about? Uh, well, I'm afraid I take it very seriously. This could be someone's way of getting at me. At the moment, there seems very little we can do except wait. But I should appreciate your help. Of course. Of course. Anything I can do. I need to carry out an investigation into a place in EC3. Now, all I have to go on is two names. One is Wesley and the other is Royston. Now, these were scrawled on a note that Watson must have left by accident on the hall stand when he was putting on his coat. Uh, can I have a couple of men and do a search of that river district? Of course. I'll do better than that. I'll even come along myself. What do you say to that? Now, this 
this sudden fog is not going to make our task any easier, Holmes. No, but in a way, it's an advantage. One can remain more secretive in the heavy mists. Look, I think we're on the right track. That large building over there. Uh, I have a shrewd idea that it's empty. And I think... Yes. Look here, see by the light of my dark lantern. The street is Wesley. Now, that building will be number five, and if it is, well, we're in luck. I might remind you that we don't have a search warrant. Oh, I'm afraid you're in plain clothes. I've no intention of letting all men swarm all over the building. Come on. I think there's bound to be a window open. I'll do the breaking and entering, and you can come in through the front door. Yes, sir. Nice and nice. There we go. If they could seat me at the yard now, I'd get a railroad telling off. What sort of place do you think this is, anyway? No, it's just a disused house. Strange. Now, why should Watson want to call here? Now, wait a moment. Look out here in the hall. There's signs of a struggle. A chair knocked over, movement in the dust. And uh, uh, hold the lantern up. Yes, look. Smudges of mud. It's here. Down by the wall. That looks like blood to me. Yes, I'm afraid the good Watson got into quite a bit of trouble here. Do you see this? It hasn't rained in these parts for some days, and yet... This is that grey type of mud that's found near the river. And imprinted in the mud are leaves and small particles of petals. Well, this should tell us something. Holmes, do you seriously mean to say that Watson has been abducted? Well, it certainly looks like it, Miss afraid. But why? That's the question. Watson hasn't got an enemy in the world. It can only be because of his connection with me. Yes, so who is behind all this? That's the question. What's the next move? Well, I don't think we can do a great deal tonight. If I'm right, then Watson will not be in any active danger until I've been approached direct. There will be an attempt to blackmail or coerce me in some way. I think we might well find something of interest if we question the cabbies who service this district. There can't be many of them on these routes. If Watson was abducted, he must have put up a struggle. He's a big man. I'll come on the straight. Let's get back on the street and see if any of your men have picked up any. Nothing to report, sir. The fog has settled in good and proper. Most folk have got themselves indoors by a good fire. Yes, something we'd all like. Now, here comes a cab. Perhaps we should return to Baker Street and wait for events to develop. Uh, but just a moment. Uh, hello there, cabby. Not many fares on an evening such as this. Going off duty? Oh, that's about it, sir. Leading the old mayor back to the stables. Can't see a thing in this. Are you a regular in these parts? Oh, that's right, sir. Been working in this part of the city for near 20 years. Well, then you must know it like the back of your hand. Uh, tell me, have you in the last 24 hours had reason to convey a sick man from that large house across the way there, number five? Oh, funny you should ask that. As a matter of fact, I did. Earlier on, there was a doctor and his assistant. He had a sick fellow with him. He was recovering from an accident. They bundled him in the cab and I took them south of the river. Place set back on its own grounds. They said it was a private sort of nursing home, sir. Why do you ask, sir? Well, because we're most interested in this accident. Uh, look here, I know it's a foul night and you're thinking of going home, but uh, could you find your way to this so-called nursing home? Oh, yes, yes, of course I could. Come on, up in, sir. It'll take a little time, but we'll manage it. Now, good man. Now, there'll be a sovereign for your pains at the end of it. Now, send your men home to their beds this trade and jump in. <laughs> the place where I dropped the doctor and the patient. That driveway. They say it leads up to the nursing home. Ah, thank you, cabby. I think you can find this place again, Miss Spade. Yes, certainly I can. Quite right. easy. All right, well, that's what we're doing tonight. Uh, to attempt to enter there, we'll be showing our hand and perhaps putting Watson in further danger. Well, I suggest that we now drive back to Baker Street. I shall be very surprised if the next move doesn't come from our adversaries. Whoever's behind this has thought it out extremely carefully. Right, Gabby, uh, 221 Baker Street, and there's another sovereign for you if you can get us there before midnight. Oh, oh, Mr. Holmes, oh, I'm so 
glad you're back, and you, Inspector. Oh, Mrs. Hudson, but why are you up and about at this hour? Well, I was worried about Dr. Watson and how you was getting on, and then I went into the kitchen to make myself a cup of tea. I spotted this on the front door, mat. It's a message, and it's from him. It's got to be. I recognize his handwriting anywhere. Oh, do open it, Miss Holmes, and set my mind at rest. He must be all right. Uh, no, it's only a note, it's not a posted letter. It certainly looks like Watson's writing. Uh, uh, yes, Sherlock. A reassuring note to say that I'm back in town and staying with an old friend, Dr. Hugh Royston at his nursing home. I expect to be away for another couple of days on this most interesting development, John Watson. Oh, well, that's all right then, isn't it? No, 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 it isn't. It's far from all right. Oh? Watson most certainly did not write this note. He's never called me by my first name in his life. This is practically an invitation to visit that nursing home that we traced to Strayed. And we must be careful. Watson's life is all important to me. But I'll never fall into a trap like this. Never. I had no idea where I was and knew better than to attempt to open my eyes. There were two uncouth voices and one cultured foreign one. Hey, your boss, delivered just like we promised. No trouble at all. Easy as pie. How long has he been like this? Oh, cool. Uh, several hours. Mm -hmm. Then we can take no chances. He is here in the nursing home, but he is not to stay here. He must be moved, moved once again to his uh, final resting place. But just as an added precaution... I think a small injection into the right arm. A drug I use is most effective. He will not regain consciousness for over a day and a night. And now the syringe. Ah, yes, the skin is neatly punctured. So, uh, no question of pain. Uh, ah, ah, caught him just in time. Now... In an hour's time, he will be moved. This time on a stretcher in a carriage ambulance, which you will drive. He will be taken to Bale's Wharf, the number one laboratory. I shall be there to arrange things. Will we then be paid off in full? No, your task is not yet complete. Then we have to await the arrival of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. After he's drowned Watson and is a fellow prisoner, you will be dismissed and it will all be over. You, you mean you're going to do them both in? The eventual outcome of these two men is really none of your concern. Well, we have given her hand, though. We're what is known as accessories after the fact or some such. Ain't that right? You are being handsomely paid. That is all that needs concern you. Well, I'm not so sure. If you get caught, then so do we. I shan't be caught, and neither will you if you will only keep your head and do as you're told. Now, enough of this. Come to our final preparations. There is no time to lose. Sherlock Holmes is a fast worker. Now that the overnight fog has disappeared, we must expect swift action. Come, enough of this chapter. Come, to work. Yes, I'm sorry to behave so strangely this morning, Miss Strait, but I believe this is more difficult than I thought. It's clear to me that Watson has been abducted for the sole reason of trapping me. I've therefore not rushed in, but taken things slowly. And the first essential is to establish the true identity of this man, Dr. Hugh Royston. I've therefore taken an hour of early morning, looking him up in the London Medical Register. He does exist, and he lives in this street. And we're about to call upon him. Now, this way, up these steps. Can I help you? My name is Sherlock Holmes, and this is Inspector Lestrade from Scotland Yard. Is it possible to see Dr. Royston for just a few minutes? Please, do come. I will inform Doctor that you have called. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Well, this looks respectable enough, Holmes. Doesn't look much wrong here. No, I didn't think there would be. Uh, would you like to come too, please? The Doctor will see you now. Uh, thank you. Oh. Sherlock Holmes... Uh, Great pleasure to meet you. You're a great friend of John Watson's, isn't that so? Please, won't you be seated? 
Tell me what I can do for you. It's Watson himself. He has disappeared. The only clue we have is your name and address in Wesley Street, EC3. Gracious, are you sure of this? Disappeared, you say? Extraordinary. You can throw no light upon this? For instance, when did you last see Watson? Some weeks ago. We'd been corresponding. I was rather keen to take a small nursing home in the East End and run it for hard-up people, the poor and delinquent. Watson agreed to consider this. The suggested site was at 5 Wesley Street, that rather derelict and seedy, run by a man called Henry von Bork. Von Bork? So he's the man behind all this. You know the man? Uh, only too well. One of the most treacherous spies in Europe. Yes, it's all becoming quite clear to me now. Von Bork is using Watson to lead me into a trap. Unfortunately, I cannot afford to ignore it. He will have no hesitation in killing Watson unless he thinks I am coming to the rescue. Thank you, Doctor. You've been a great help. Uh, come to the street. Uh, first, and tell me what I wanted to know. I know Von Bork's mind. I know it's tortuous and arrogant. He's convinced that he can outwit me, and in order to save Watson, I shall have to allow him to think so. Well, why don't I get a search warrant against his home and let's raid the place? The element of surprise is always good. This von Bork won't think you'd consider such a bold plan. No, no, you may do that by all means if you wish to stay, but I, I don't think that is the answer to our problem. I'm prepared to believe that Watson was enticed into that nursing home, thinking he would meet the good doctor there. But I cannot think von Bork will keep him there. It's too risky. No, you'll have him removed. But but where to? Van Bork used to have offices in the dock area. Uh, you may recall that we thought he was using them in the smuggling case of the Blue Peter. Now, wait a moment. When we called at 5 Wesley Street, we found evidence of a struggle. Undoubtedly, that is where Watson was overpowered. Then I also observed grey mud, do you recall? Imprinted in the mud were leaves and particles of petals. Now, the flowering petals were autumn willow blossoms. Those trees only flourish down by the river. If I think I can trace the old offices that Von Bork used. If I'm right, then that's where they would have taken Watson. Seems to be taking a long shot to me, Holmes. Wouldn't it be better to stick to more orthodox methods? There's no, no time. Von Bork will be getting anxious. He's not going to hang around keeping Watson alive if he can't get at me. Now, oh, I've got to move. The point is, Lestrade, are you still going to back me up? I've done so up till now. I'm not backing out when it comes to a crisis. Lead on, Holmes. I'm with you. Now, this is it, Lestrade. These are the offices. And I fancy Bork has been using them for experimental purposes. We have the appearance of being scientific laboratories. It doesn't look as though they're at all occupied. I think this way, round the side entrance. I know you do not approve of my methods of entering premises, but needs must when the devil drives. Watson's always said that the police were lucky that I didn't choose a career in crime. Huh. I should be grateful to the best of them. Observe, I have a full set of burglars tools with me now. For instance, this door, although made of steel and padlocks, presents no problems. Something tells me I'm going to regret this. We're caught. It's demotion for me. No doubt of that. Oh, nonsense. Now, oh, here. Watch. Now, come on. Come on, let's take a look. Bless you. I can see why you think Watson should be shut away in a place like this. It's quite dark. There's just packing cases. The workrooms must be through there. Uh, yes. Ah, yes. This looks more like it. Fully equipped as a laboratory. Yes, we're on the right lines, all right. Look, wooden steps going down and footprints. Muffy footprints. Now, you see how staggered they are? Now, those are the sort of prints two men would make if they were carrying a, a stretcher. Come on, Lestrade. The now, here. Now, once our eyes grow accustomed to the dark, and the straight I'm right. There, in the corner. It is a stretcher. And it is Watson. By Jove, you're right, Holmes. What? Devil? The door. The top of the stairs. Closed. Hot. Device 
which is triggered up by that iron bar door closing. Twenty minutes, Holmes. <laughs> Goodbye. What the devil? Holmes, we have fallen right into his hands. Explosive device. It must be here. Down by the stretcher. Aye. Look at straight. Gum and cotton, sulfuric acid. Yes. Nitric acid. Look, at, look, help me to move, Watson. Right to the far corner. If there's only one chance, we must make our own explosive first. Quickly, Miss Drake. Right over here, by the fence. Come on, give me a hand. The prepared cotton. It has to be three parts sulfuric acid to one part of nitric acid. It will burn without explosion on admission. But it's laid up by the iron door. With percussion, it goes up at about five times the power of gunpowder. Holmes, do you really know what you're doing? Oh, I'd better get right to the stage. Well, this really is a time for Herr Bork. Now listen, do exactly as I say and as swiftly as possible. Uh, take this. Captain. Right. Now, here. Now get right back. Back by the far wall. Cover Watson with anything you can to protect him. The percussion, when I flick it off, could blow the gate outwards. If it does, then we are safe. We grab the stretcher, get up those stairs as quickly as possible. You ready? Yes. I'm ready. Right, I'm nearly there, Will. Here, here goes. Now, 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 get down. Ah, we've done it. We've done it. Come on, come on. It was some hours later that I opened my eyes. My head ached and I could hardly see. But I was aware of familiar surroundings. Clean sheets under me and the softness of the pillow which smelt of lavender. I was in my own bed back in Baker Street. I tried to speak, but I couldn't. I knew that someone was in the room with me. A friend. A friend whom I knew very well indeed. Oh, Dr. Watson, I do believe you're coming round at last. Now, don't try to move or speak. Just lie there and close your eyes. You've had such a terrible time of it, but it's all over now. Mr. Holmes and Inspector Lestrade have got everything under control. They found you down somewhere by the river, brought you back more dead than alive. But you're all right. They've gone after the men who tried to kill you, and they'll get them. I'm sure they'll get them. They just surrounded Holmes. No chance of anyone getting in or out of this so-called mess of home. This is what we should have done in the first place. Perhaps it would have meant sacrificing Watson, and that I was not prepared to do. All right, Lestrade, this is more your line of country than it is mine. Go ahead. Do it your way from now on. Right, men. Follow me. In we go. Well, I'll be... Not a sign. Nothing. Not a living soul in the place. Now, what do you make of that, Holmes? I'm hardly surprised. If Von Bork had been successful and killed Watson and me, and you, in his booby trap, then he wouldn't have wanted to stay around London to be questioned. Now, clearly this nursing home's just a blind. A hideaway until he carried out his plans. Well, how truly it work out like this? Watson is alive and Von Bork has escaped. But... He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. I'll catch up with Von Bork, and when I do, it will be a fight to the death. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes, with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Ah, oh, Mr. Holmes, I was hoping I'd find you here working in the library. But my dear Tebbit, I know you are a tutor and lecturer at this college, but you must understand I am an extremely busy man. I realize that, but a very awkward and delicate incident has occurred here at Maudlin. By chance, you are here, and I must turn to you for help. I'm sorry, I cannot be disturbed. If there is any trouble, I should prefer it if you would call in the police. The, the police? Oh, oh no. No, that, that would cause a terrible scandal at all costs. Maudlin must avoid a scandal. I beg of you, Mr. Holmes, help us. For the sake of the college, help us, please. We 
present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, a hollow victory. It was in the year 1892 that Sherlock Holmes and I spent some weeks at one of the great university towns. We were residing at the time in furnished lodgings close to a library, where Holmes was engaged upon researches into early English charters. It was whilst he was busy with his research that Frank Tebbit, one of the lecturers at Magdalen College, burst in upon him. A gaunt man of excitable character, he was even more agitated than usual. I must explain, Mr. Holmes, that tomorrow is the first day of the examination for the Hamilton Scholarship. I am one of the examiners. Today, at about three o'clock, the proofs of the examination paper arrived from the printers. I read it carefully, as the text must be quite correct, a large part of it being passages in Greek to be translated. There must be no printer's errors, you see. Mm, quite so. At 4.30 p.m., I left as I had an appointment to take tea in a friend's room. I left the proofs on my desk. I was away for little more than an hour. As you know, our college doors are double. The green days one within and the heavy oak without. As I approached my outer door, I was amazed to find a key in the lock. But it was not my key. I knew I had not been so careless. My key was still in my pocket. Nevertheless, there must have been a duplicate. Who carries it? Oh, my servant, Jackson, who's been with me for ten years. His honesty is above suspicion. Have you questioned him? Yes. I met him in the corridor and discovered that the key was indeed his. He had come to my room to ask if I wanted to take tea, and he had very carelessly left his key in the door when he had left a few minutes later. Of course, in ordinary circumstances, it would not have mattered. And what are the examination papers on your desk? Oh, the moment I looked at the table, I knew that someone had been in there. The proofs were in three long slips. I'd left them all together. Now I found one on the table, one on the side table near the window, and the third upon the floor. Uh, tell me, Tebbit, is the scholarship a valuable one? Very. There is a lot to be gained by getting it, including money. Jackson entered the room with you. Uh, what was his reaction to all of this? He nearly collapsed. I had to seat him in a chair and give him brandy. He was so upset to realize he'd been the cause of such an outrage. Did you examine the room? Yes. While Jackson was recovering, I tried to be thorough. I found evidence of a broken pencil, the tip of some lead near the paper on the table. Ah, excellent. Continue. Then a definite cut, oh, about three inches long, in the red leather surface of my new writing desk. Both Jackson and I assured it wasn't there before. Ah. No, that is not all. I found a small ball of clay with specks of sawdust on it. <laughs> I am convinced that these are clues left by the man who entered my room. Mm, very interesting. Yes, well, of course, I see your dilemma. If the culprit is not found, then the examination will have to be postponed until fresh papers are prepared. That would call for an explanation and could create a scandal that would naturally reflect upon you... The college and, indeed, the whole university. That is it exactly, Mr. Holmes. Please help me to settle this matter quietly and discreetly. Hmm. Uh, very well, I will look into it. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, now, now, before you go to your rooms, just a few questions. Yes? Have you had any visitors in your rooms since the papers arrived? Only one, I think. Uh, Raoul Chabra, a foreign student. He lives in the block. He came to ask certain questions regarding the examination. Is he one of the entrants, then? Yes. And the papers were on your table while he was present? If I remember correctly, they were rolled up. Well, nevertheless, he might have recognized them as printer's proofs. Mm, possible, though unlikely. No one knew they were there, not even Jackson. Where is Jackson now? I left him recovering in the chair in my room. I hurried straight to you. Well, then he's a month to this. Either this student, Shabra, recognized the papers and is the guilty party, or whoever tampered with them... Came upon them by accident. So it seems to me. Yes, well, we'd better go over there. Uh, would you care to come along, Watson? I'd remained silent throughout this interview. I was useful to Holmes when there were medical matters that needed attention, but this was purely academic. However, not wanting to appear uninterested, I agreed to walk over to Mortland with them. 
It was nearly dusk when we reached Tebbit's rooms. He was on the ground floor, and above him, he explained, lived three students. Holmes stopped, and standing on tiptoe, peered in through Tebbit's window. Oh, no use considering this as a method of entry, Mr. Holmes. There's no opening in the window except that one pane high up. Uh, well, if there's nothing to be learned out here, we might as well go inside. Uh, this way. We entered the building, Chebet leading the way. Chebet let himself in with his own key and bade us welcome. Holmes set to work making a thorough investigation of the carpet. Mm, there's nothing here. The day's too dry for footmarks. Uh, Jackson has recovered, I see. Uh, which chair did you leave him in? Uh, there, by the window. I see, near this small table. Yes, I imagine what happened is that the man entered through the door, took the papers to the window so that he could see you if you crossed the courtyard so you could make a quick escape. Uh, as a matter of fact, that would not have helped him. I returned by the side door. Ah, that's interesting. Well, that's what he must have had in his mind anyway. Now, let's see the printer's three pages. Yeah, and here you are. Uh, there's no fingerprints that are visible anyway. Uh, so many people could have handled these. How long would it take to copy one of these using every possible method of contraction? Oh, allowing for careful study and taking pertinent notes, I should say a quarter of an hour. Ah. Then placing it on the table, he studied the next paper. He was still doing this when you returned unexpectedly. Yes, he could not have seen you cross the courtyard, but something disturbed him. He'd not time to replace the papers. Ah, yes, this... This is the lead of the pencil. Yes, I have not touched anything, I assure you. Good. It's an unusual type of lead. Not often used in ordinary pencils. Ah, valuable. This is a small black pellet. Yes, I need to study this through my lens. Ah, yes. Yes, and here is the cut in the red leather top. Yes, it's quite a tear. Well, this gets more and more fascinating. Uh, where does that door lead to? Uh, to my bedroom. Have you been in there since discovering all of this? No, I came straight to you. Uh, take a look, if you wish. Allow oh, me. Thank you. Ah, what a charming room. I don't wish to pry, but I presume this large wardrobe is where you keep most of your clothes. Uh, may I? Yes. Large and convenient. And now there seems to be... Ah, what have we here on the floor next to the shoe rack? Ah, it's a similar piece of clay. Formed into a pyramid shape. Identical to the one by your table. Now, isn't that extraordinary? Yes, sir. Let me see that. Ah, oh, yes. Yes, you're right. What does it mean, Mr. Holmes? I don't know. It seems that your visitor had access to your bedroom as well as to the sitting room, Mr. Tebbit. That does not make sense. Surely anyone wanting to take notes from my papers would be familiar with the layout of these rooms. Whoever it was could not have fled into the bedroom by mistake. But then he must have done so intentionally in order to hide... Do you mean that, that he might have been hiding in here when Jackson and I came back? Very likely. In which case, you would only to close this door and you have had him a prisoner. But first things first. It's necessary, I think, that I meet your servant, Jackson. Uh, can that be arranged? Excuse me, sir. No, Jackson. Just the man we wish to see. Uh, I came back to see uh, if there had been any new developments, sir. Uh, no, but this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson who are investigating. Uh, please answer any questions as clearly as you can. Of course, sir. I understand all this happened because you left your key in the outside door. How extraordinary that you should do so on this one important occasion. It's something I can't explain. I, I missed the key and realized what I must have done. I, I had a tea tray in my hand at the time, you see. I, I couldn't believe my carelessness. I hurried back but met Mr. Tebbit in the corridor. And when we entered together, I saw the worst had happened and... Someone had been in the rooms. I, I tried to be helpful, but the shock was too much. I felt ill, near to fainting. Where were you when you started to feel ill? Uh, by the door. Yet you collapsed in this chair by the window. Odd. I, I don't think Jackson knew what he was doing. We were both shocked. It, it was minutes before either of us could think straight. Mm. Yes, well, that will be all for the moment, Jackson. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tevitt. Uh, uh, ring if you need me again, won't you, sir? I'm... Uh, Dreadfully sorry. Mm. 
I'd like the names of the three students you say live above these rooms. Who are they? Uh, one of them is the foreign student I told you about, uh, Raul Shabra. He is quiet, uh, keeps himself to himself. Uh, his work is good, although I would say his Greek is his weakest subject. Uh, then there is Forbes, a fine scholar and athlete. Well, perhaps too keen on sport, but a fine young man. His father was the notorious Sir Stafford Forbes, who ruined himself gambling. The son is poor, but should do well. I see. I'm a third. Harland McBride, brilliant, one of the brightest intellects of the college, but wayward and unprincipled. I know what your next question will be. Which of the three do I suspect? Oh, I can't answer that. I'm glad, because I wasn't going to ask you anyway. But I was about to suggest a quick stroll outside in the courtyard before it becomes too dark. Shall we go? Holmes led us out of Cabot's rooms and back to the courtyard. It was not quite dark. Three yellow squares of light shone above us. The three students were spending the night before the exams in their rooms. Shadows moved across the blinds of one room. It's Raoul Shabra pacing the floor. An occasional movement came from Forbes's quarters. From the third window, there was a bright light, but no sign of activity. Holmes suggested that we make some excuse and call on each in turn. Kevitt thought it could be arranged and led us up the ancient staircase. At Raoul Shabra's rooms, we were welcomed uh, a trifle coldly. Please to come in, Mr. Tibbet. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but these are friends of mine who are looking over the college. Uh, this is Mr. Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Mm -hmm. I am pleased to meet any friends of my tutor. Oh, thank you. I'm interested in the internal design of these buildings. They're very well appointed, are they not? I find it very comfortable here. Be pleased to look around. Oh, I, I'm pleased to see that you're not doing any last-minute studying, Shabra. <laughs> that shows confidence. I do not feel confident. I am greatly worried. I am very nervous. I am lost to know how to spend this last night before the examination. Ah, you have an examination tomorrow. I'm so sorry. Uh, we did not know. Uh, shall we move on, Tebbit? Uh, good luck tomorrow. Good night. Uh, good night. Good night. Good night. I notice that Holmes' eyes have been darting about all over the room, especially at the large desk by the window. Raoul Shabra seemed a mystery. Courteous and well-dressed, he could have been thinking anything as he bowed us from his rooms. We went up another floor, and this time called upon Julian Forbes. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. How do you do? Come How do you do? Make yourselves at home. I'm afraid I have nothing to offer you in the way of a drink. Oh, that's quite all right. We're just making a brief tour of the college. If we accepted everyone's hospitality, we'd be here all night. However, it is very pleasant to meet you. I understand you have an important examination tomorrow. And may I wish you the very best of luck. Oh, thank you. I hope I will do well. I have worked hard for it. Oh, I'm glad to see you're so relaxed, Julian. Get an early night and do well. Oh, I shall try. Thank you for your good wishes. Good night. Good, good night. night. Good night. Again. I was aware of the intense scrutiny Holmes had given the room and its occupant. We followed Tebbit up further stairs to the rooms of the third student. This time, our reception was far from cordial. Who is it? Your tutor, Tebbit. Oh, go away! I beg your pardon. I have friends here who wish to meet you. Well, I don't want to meet them. Tomorrow is the exam and I have swatting to do. I won't be disturbed by anyone. Is that clear? Go away! <coughs> I rather think we're not wanted, Tebbit. I, I really must apologize at all. He has the right to sport his oak on an occasion such as this. I only want to know one thing about Harlan McBride. And what is that? How tall is he? I beg your pardon? Is he under six feet? Is he taller than I am? Uh, no. No, no, not at all. Much shorter. Uh, well built, but shorter. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> And now, Mr. Tebbit, I wish you good night. But, Mr. Holmes, surely you're not going to leave me in this abrupt fashion. I must have some definite action. I cannot allow the examination to proceed tomorrow if one of the papers has been tampered with. You must leave it as it is. I shall drop round early tomorrow morning. I shall tell you my views then. Meanwhile, leave everything as it is, understand? Do not change a thing. Holmes remained quiet as we made our way back to our lodgings. He said good night shortly after dinner and did no more work on his studies. At eight in the morning, he came to my room and was quite his old self again, quite changed from the preoccupied person of the night before. Mm. Oh, good morning, Watson. Lovely morning. 
Come, Simon, you meant to see Mr. Tebbit. Uh, can you do without breakfast? Oh, certainly. Uh, Tebbit will be in a terrible state until we tell him something positive. But, uh, uh, have you anything positive to tell him? Oh, yes, my dear Watson. I've solved the case. What? Well, how could you have done? What possible fresh evidence could you have got since last night? This. It's not for nothing that I got up at half past five this morning. I put in two solid hours of work and covered over five miles. And I have something to show for it. There it is. Hmm. Three small pieces of black clay, almost identical. But Holmes, Holmes, yesterday, there were only two. Quite. Now, this one I discovered this morning, and the three of them have solved the whole mystery. Come, Watson, let's go and put Tebbit out of his misery, shall we? The unfortunate tutor was certainly in a state of great agitation. In a few hours, the examinations would commence. He appealed to Holmes immediately. Heavens, you can't, Mr. Holmes. What am I to do? Shall the examination proceed? Oh, yes, let it proceed by all means. Yeah, but the culprit... He will not sit the examination. How can you say that? Does it, does it mean that you know who it is? I think so. And if this matter is not to become public, then we must pass judgment upon this ourselves. And so, in this private court-martial, so to speak, we shall take up official positions. Uh, Watson, will you stand there? Oh, uh, very well. There, and ring the bell, please. But that will bring Jackson. Exactly. Oh, very well. Uh, I say, Holmes, can't you tell us a little more? I mean, uh, what do we have to do? Just you stand there and glare, Watson. Fiddle with your moustache and frighten the life out of anyone who comes through that door. Ah, here is the first person. Come in, Jackson. Yeah, do as Mr. Holmes requests, Jackson. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, Tebbit, uh, would you leave us for a little while? Please go down and bring Mr. Forbes down to us. But I don't understand. I mean, what... Uh, do as I say, please. Very well, but I must confess that I do not understand this. It is lamentable, lamentable. Now, Jackson, would you please tell us the truth about yesterday's incident? I have told you everything, sir. You have nothing to add? No, sir. Then I will make a suggestion. When you came in here yesterday, and you appeared to be considerably shocked, you sat down upon that chair. The reason was to conceal something, was it not? No, no, of course not. I think you answered that a little too quickly. I wonder why. You know who was in this room yesterday, don't you, Jackson? No, sir, no. no. It is a pity you feel that you have to lie. Stay with us, but stand over there by the bedroom door and wait. Ah, yes, I think the time has come. Oh, well, it is lucky that I found you. I think you must have been coming to see me. Yes, yes, I was. It was very important, you see, sir. Uh, come in, come in. Close the door. Yes. Now, Mr. Forbes, we are alone here. We can be perfectly frank with each other. We want to know why an honourable man such as yourself ever stooped to become the treat you were yesterday. What? What? Jackson, how, how, how could you... It wasn't me, sir. Mr. Forbes, I, I never said a word. Ah, but you have now. Forbes, your only chance lies in a frank confession. I... I, I don't know where to begin. How can I tell anyone? Then let me tell the story and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Now, Tebbit told me that no one, not even Jackson, knew the papers were in this room. It was extremely unlikely that Rao Shabra could tell what the papers even looked like when he came in here. After all, they were rolled up. The chances of someone coming in here by accident and finding them would be too remote. Obviously, someone saw into the room from outside. Oh, I see. Forbes had been training that afternoon. He had his running shoes with him, the traditional kind, spikes on the soles. When he passed the window, he saw that you had been working on the exam paper. As he passed the door on the way to his room, he noticed that the key was in the lock. The temptation was too much. He let himself in and saw the situation at a glance. He placed his running shoes on the table and placed something, gloves perhaps, on the chair whilst he hurriedly made notes. Correct, Forbes? Yes. Thinking you, Tebbit, would return across the courtyard, he stayed by the window to watch. But you didn't. You came by the side entrance and he was caught. There was no escape. He grabbed for his shoes and made a tear in the red leather. Darting across to the bedroom, he forgot his gloves on the chair. Some of the black clay from around the spikes of his running shoes dropped off. One piece was left here, another in the bedroom cupboard where he hid himself. That third piece I collected from the pitch where he trained yesterday. Correct, so far, Forbes? Yes, it, it's exactly as you've explained. Is, is that all you can say for yourself? After such infamous conduct? I'm sorry. 
And to prove it, I, I have here a letter which I wrote last night. I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't live with what I'd done. In the letter, I say I'm withdrawing from the examination. I'm ashamed. Well, well I am relieved to know you have recovered your self-respect. Why the change of heart forced? Jackson. He persuaded me. Mm. Well, Jackson, can you clear up the last point in me? in this mystery for me. What was your interest in all of this? It's simple enough, Mr. Holmes. I was at one time butler to Sir Stafford Forbes, this young man's father. When he was ruined, I came here to work for Mr. Tebbit. I never forgot my old employer and made it my job to watch over his son. That's why I pretended to collapse when I sat in the chair in order to conceal the gloves. When Mr. Tebbit left to seek your help, I aided Mr. Forbes to escape. What else could I do? My loyalties. I, I didn't approve, of course, and I persuaded him to do the right thing. I'm sorry, but... Well, can you blame me, Mr... There was silence in those rooms at Morton Courage. Forbes looked down at the floor. Chebbett stared out of the window. And Jackson slowly left the room. Holmes said, Well, Watson, I think that clears up the matter. Breakfast awaits us. Goodbye, Forbes. You have fallen low. In the future, see how high you can rise. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Cricket, I'm glad to say, still holds the attention of many superior minds. But it's the sport of athletics proper which holds the highest interest from April to September. Well, there's nothing wrong in that, is there? I was a keen runner and long jumper in my youth, and not bad at throwing the hammer, either. Oh, a sport for its own sake, of course, is very fine. But the pastime is now attracting the attention of the bookmakers. Bets on matches between Oxford and Cambridge are the most unlikely events. Before we know where we are, those American universities which try so unsuccessfully to emulate ours now be opening their doors to students simply because they can play games like baseball better than others, really. Uh, it's hardly keeping up the standards. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, a problem at Oxford. It was but two days after Holmes had expressed his doubts about British sporting habits with reference to universities that I found Sherlock Holmes at the task of answering letters. It was an occupation that he thoroughly disliked. He rarely engaged in small talk and found casual correspondence a waste of time. If the matter required his attention, then it was usually answered by a short telegram. On this occasion, he looked up with a slight smile of welcome and said, mm, This may interest you, Watson. I've had a letter from the Dean of St. Mark's College, Oxford. There's been some trouble about a cheque, which he's asked me to investigate privately. It appears that some person, posing as an undergraduate and wearing the St. Mark's colours, cashed a cheque at an Oxford bank. Later, Lord Farewell, from whose private account the cheque was drawn, denied all knowledge of the transaction and claims the signature is a forgery. Not unnaturally, the Dean would prefer to have the problem solved without publicity. How much was the amount? A hundred pounds. Mm, quite a tidy sum, even for Lord Farewell. Actually, I know the young fellow slightly. His father is the Earl of Hartland, and we soldiered together out in India. I was able to treat his wounds after a skirmish near Rabo Pindi. Ah, then you must be interested. I wired the Dean, saying that I'll accept his invitation to travel down to Oxford tomorrow morning. Are you able to accompany me? Well, I can manage a day off. Yes, I think I'd like that, Holmes. Thank you.
We took the 10 o'clock train from Paddington and we were at St. Mark's College in good time for lunch. The dean entertained us for the most pleasant meal, refusing to discuss the reason for our visit until we had eaten and were comfortably seated in his study. Uh, now to business. I have here on my desk the returned check about which Farewell denies all knowledge. He states that he did not make it out and that the signature is a forgery. May I see? Thank you. Uh, the amount and dates are typewritten, only the signature is in ink. And quite. I understand that typewriters are as easily identified as handwriting and this newfangled business of taking people's fingerprints. Oh, yes. To the observant, typewriter key impressions are very easily identified. There are typewriters available in the college, of course. In the staff room, yes. The college business employs them. I can't say if there are private ones used by undergraduates. I imagine there must be. I read a number of typewritten manuscripts. Now, then we've got something to go on. Yeah? You, you sent me, sir? Ah, yes, yes. Farewell. Please come in. Meet Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson from London. Oh, now, how do you do, Mr. Holmes? Your name is, of course, well known to me. And, of course, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Hello there, Christopher. How do you do? Haven't seen you for about three years when you won the mile at Harrow. Your father was very proud of you. I hope he will have reason to be more proud in the future. I suppose the, the dean has told of my present trouble. We have called to see if we can help. The affair is quite trivial in a way. I mean, I've been tricked out of a hundred pounds, but the paper will recompense me, but well, that's not the point. The point is that someone in this house has stooped to this method of stealing. Naturally, I felt I had to report it. Of course. I was just studying the check when you came in. Uh, tell me, how could anyone have got hold of the form? I run several accounts. I admit I've never been too careful about locking up my checkbooks. I often find them in the inner pockets of my suit, or blazers, for instance. The whole form and the counterfoil were ripped out of a checkbook I found in the drawer of my desk. Mm, I see. And you stay here in the college? No, no. I'm at Falcon Lodge, across the playing fields. It's private. I have the first floor. I don't think there was a, any form of burglary or anything like that. I mean, anyone could have got at my checkbook, taken it from my coat or briefcase, when I was at lecture out on the sports fields. I see. So any of your colleagues could have seized the opportunity to tear out a check form and counterfoil from the book you were carrying. You would naturally continue to write checks without being aware that one was missing. When did you become fully aware of the fraud, Lord Fairwell? When I saw my bank statement. I studied the returns check. I, I knew it had been a forge since I came straight to the dean. Mm. Well, looking at the check, it's clear that it is a forgery. The person who did this is an old hand at the game. How do you deduce that, Holmes? The easiest way to copy is to perfect the handwriting upside down first. I think this was so in this case. I imagine that your signature is readily available, Lord Fairwell. I mean... There are specimens to be seen in public. Oh, yes, of course. I, I sign all the sports items on the next sport. The teams that are selected, for instance. Everyone knows my signature. So to obtain a copy and imitate it would be easy. Mm. I think that the typewriter that was used was also readily available. Is that not so? Uh, there is one in the common room attached to the library. Everyone uses it. Mm. Well, then it should be easy to compare the type. Good. Well, it's still early afternoon. I think a walk after that excellent luncheon would be a splendid idea. I'll be able to find the bank in question, all right. Perhaps you can meet later, Dean. I shall be here at your service, Holmes. And thank you for going to all this trouble. Uh, perhaps you'd care to take tea with me at Park and Lodge when you return. Shall we say four o'clock? Oh, that seems a very sound idea. Uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you, Lord Farewell. We shall see you around about four o'clock. Come, Watson. It was about a 15-minute walk to the main road and the bank where Lord Christopher Farewell had his accounts. The bank manager seemed to be expecting us. He listened intently to what Holmes had to say. And then called in a young man who was on duty at the banking counter when the fraudulent check was cashed. Together, they listened to Holmes. I'm undertaking a private investigation into the cashing of this forged check. So far, we've only established that it was typed on a communal typewriter at St. Mark's College. It could have been signed by anyone. Now, you were on duty when the undergraduate presented the check. You can speak quite freely in front of Mr. Holmes Hughes. This is all in confidence. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I was, sir. I must tell you that I've not been working here for very long, and the Oxford undergraduates who use this bank are, are, are not known to me. But you would be able to give a description of this one. Oh, you yes. You remember? Oh, yes, yes. It, it, it was a very rainy afternoon, and, and we were near to closing hours, and he came in wearing a wet Macintosh and the St. Mark's College cap, and he had a scarf of the same colours wrapped around his neck. In other words, quite muffled up. You could only see his hands and face. That's right. All I can really remember is that 
Well, he wore spectacles, the, the thin steel-rimmed kind, and, and he peered a bit through them. Did he speak to them? Oh, just a few words. I, I, I can't recall exactly what they were. It was, it was something like, a rough afternoon, please cash this for my friend. Did he have uh, any sort of accent? No, 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 no. He, he, he seemed to be choosing his words very carefully and speaking quite precisely in a, a rather affected English. Mm, quite common in undergraduates at Oxford. Anxious to be correct in every way. Anything else you observed? Only that when I gave him the hundred pounds in notes, he, he placed them in an envelope that he had with him, and he wrote the amount on the outside. He did? It's a very strange thing to do. I wonder why. Oh, I don't know. Oh, and, and there, there is one more thing I noticed. He wrote with his left hand. Ah, I see. Well, thank you very much, Hughes. Uh, thank you, sir. You've been most kind in granting this interview. I am sorry we could not have been of more help. You have been exceedingly helpful. Come, Watson. We shall be late for tea at Falcon Lodge. Good afternoon to you, sir. I do help yourself to more cucumber sandwiches, if you wish. Perhaps. I always take tea down here on the ground floor terrace. Uh, thank you. I rarely eat at this time of the afternoon. Dare I inquire if you're any farther forward in your investigations? I think a little, yes. Uh, tell me, have you anyone in this college who is an American, short-sighted, and left-handed? Goodness gracious me, oh, what a question. It's a three-part one, too. Uh, well, the answer is yes. There is a man here who is an American, Guy Lewis. He is left-handed, and he is rather short-sighted. He, he wears those American steel-rimmed spectacles. You know the kind. Is he a friend of yours? Uh, no, not really. I, I always feel so ill at ease with foreigners... But he is an extremely fine sportsman. Excellent oarsman, good runner. Could well get his blue this term. Why? Because evidence is building up against him. Is he in need of money, do you know? Oh, dashed if I know. I shouldn't think so. His family hit it rich in the Yukon or some outlandish place. Uh, are you suggesting that he is the man who forged my signature? No, I'm simply trying to establish facts. And the facts are that he fits the description of the person who... <laughs> Gracious... What was that? It sounds as though it came from the floor above. But my study is directly above this dirt. It's locked. I've taken the precaution of locking everything up since this business of the check. I, I wondered, do you think... That... I think we should go up to your rooms immediately, Lord Farewell. Perhaps someone is still intent upon tricking you out of even more money. Shall we go? The rooms occupied by Lord Farewell were small and self-contained. They consisted of bathroom and shower a small bedroom, and a large sitting room, which was also used as a study. They were directly above the dining room, kitchen, and terrace room. It was a few moments before we could climb the stairs and unlock the main door. Then, there was a small passage into the sitting room. That door was also locked. Christopher Farewell had his keys, and soon we were standing in the elegantly furnished apartment. It was immediately clear that there had been an intruder. A chair near the window had been overturned, the window itself was open, with lace curtains flapping in the breeze. Great heavens! Someone's just been in here. It, the, the drawer of my desk is open. Yes, well, whoever it was got away through that window. My Fiora, the lock's been forced. Part of my stamp collection is missing. The latest stamps. I, I was about to paste them into the album. They're very valuable stamps. They, they've gone. You were right, Miss Holmes. Someone is intent on getting money from Enoch. What on earth are we to do? Remain calm. Now, you locked up the whole of this self-contained apartment. Is there any other entrance? Well, no, to just the main door to the stairs and ground floor. Well, it seems clear how the thief got away, but how did he get in here? Blessed if I know it. He couldn't have been in here before I'd locked up. I went into all my rooms, washed my hands, changed my blazer, collected my keys. It, it, it's impossible. Well, then I think I'd better examine the window. Ah... Uh, Miss I see that there's a flat roof right outside here. A stretch of about seven feet before the drop into the grounds. One can actually get out onto the lead surface. Yes. Uh, do yes. be careful, Mr. Hurd. Yes. Yes, that's it. Yes, this must be the roof over the terrace rooms. Two bays. I suppose it is possible to jump down. It's quite a drop, all of ten to twelve feet. Ah, what have we here? There are numerous indentations in the lead. But this looks recently made. It's here by the guttering. Most curious. It couldn't have been made by a ladder. A, 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 a rope, perhaps? No, 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 no. It's too broad for that. That's quite a mystery. Now, shall we go down and examine the earth beneath? Yes, please. Then you better make a thorough search of all your belongings and report the whole incident to the dean. Come, there's nothing more to be gained out here.
Holmes and I made our way down to the grounds, while Christopher Farewell made a thorough check of all his possessions. We knew the alarm would soon be raised and the whole of the college agog with the news. It was one of those spectacular incidents that could not be hushed up. The burglary had actually happened above us while we were quietly drinking tea and eating cucumber sandwiches. I thought it all had an air of unreality about it. But Holmes was not at all put out. He went over the gardens under the window with his usual thoroughness. Ah, uh, yes, here in the grass, this is freshly marked. See, Watson? Hmm. Yes, it's a sort of triangular indentation. I think I can actually remove this section of turf. Yes, it could be valuable. Yes, I wonder if anyone here at the college comes from the Ten country. Well, well, why do you ask that, Holmes? That's just a thought. Following the logical conclusions of the evidence so far. Oh, oh Christopher, oh, some of his friends. Holmes, oh, uh, Mr. Holmes, I, I'd like to meet a few of the men from my college. This is Jolly Fan. So how do you do? Stocking business. Uh, my friend Eric Davidson. How do you do? I can't believe all that Chris has been telling us. And this is our American scholar, Guy Lewis. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I, I guess this is something no one ever thought would happen. A thief at St. Mark's. I, I don't get it. Uh, I'm pleased to meet you all. Um, I know that this is likely to cause a lot of talk and a great deal of scandal, should it become public knowledge. I think you should remember the college and try to hush it all up. The news may be given out by the dean as he thinks fit. But you know what will happen if the press gets hold of this. Yes, indeed. It go a long way to smear the reputation of Oxford. And with the big sports encounter with Cambridge coming up, well, it won't do us any good. Well, I agree. I am the one who's been chosen as a victim, but I must insist that we keep this within the house. I know you're all good friends and will support me in this request. We will. But it can't be overlooked, Chris. The man who did this must be found. If it isn't stopped, who knows where it will all end. Oh, I agree. I think there should be a general search made of everyone's rooms. It needn't be rowdy, just quietly and methodical. What do you say, Guy? Uh, uh, sure. I go along with that. Sure. Why not? Right. Let's put it all to the dean, as quietly as we can. We must be guided by him and Mr. Holmes. Now, what do you say, Chief? Holmes watched the retreating backs of the young men with a thin-lipped smile. I could tell he'd already formed a theory, but was not prepared to discuss it. It wasn't until over an hour later, when we were gathered in the dean's study, that Christopher Farewell entered hurriedly. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I wondered if you were available. And Mr. Holmes. Uh, ah, good, you are still here, sir. My stamps have been found. Ah, they have. And may I ask where? They were found at the back of a drawer in, in Guy Lewis's study, sir. I see. Hmm. Well, this is a very serious matter, Farewell. What does the young man say? He protests his innocence. He says he knows nothing about the stamps. He, he maintains that he's not responsible either for the forged check or the theft of the stamps. Mm -hmm. He must be given a fair hearing, of course. But it does seem that he has a great deal of explaining to do. Uh, Mr. Holmes, you are the expert on these matters... What do you recommend? Well, with your permission, I should like a select group of your friends, including Mr. Guy Lewis, to gather here in the Dean's study as soon as possible. Yes, I think I can rely upon you, Lord Farewell, to choose the right men. Those I've just met, for instance. Jollyphant, Eric Davidson. A few more who are chosen athletes. They must all be sworn to secrecy for the sake of the college. Can you arrange that for me straight away? Of course, it was arranged. And within 20 minutes, the half a dozen young men were seated quietly in front of the Dean. Holmes immediately took the floor. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to address a group such as yourselves in a place of learning such as this. I'm very pleased to do so. I'm just disappointed that the circumstances are so unpleasant. As a private investigator, I've always maintained that crime is never what it appears on the surface. Not big crimes or international intrigues, or small crimes such as fraud and theft. I don't think the trouble here lies with the usual motives of love or money. As you all know, Lord Farewell has been cheated out of 100 pounds and has had part of a stamp collection stolen. He's the first to admit that these are petty crimes, but they are not what they appear on the surface. Oh, no. If I can reveal the name of the person responsible for all this trouble, would you drop any charges against him, Lord Farewell? If it were for the sake of the college, then yes, of course I would. And what does the sake of the college mean? It means maintaining the good reputation that St. Mark's has when entering for the next games, is that not so? I'm afraid that is where the danger lies. Athletics is a branch of sports that has hitherto been almost entirely free from professionalism and the evils of betting. But now, competition has risen to such a state that it has become work and not play. 
Now, this is the basic reason for the petty crimes we are investigating. A most interesting thesis, Holmes, but uh, I'm blessed if I can see how. Well, let me show you. But first, to get back to the crimes themselves. Excuse me, sir. Wouldn't it be better if we just asked the man himself to admit his guilt? Quite. Come on, Lewis. You know you've been caught out. I have not. And I don't admit anything. I'm not guilty. Uh, just one, one moment. Just one, one moment. That's overwhelming. Now, let me start with you, Mr. Lewis. When I carried out an investigation at the local bank regarding the cashing of the forged checks, the cashier described the man to whom he gave the money as muffled up in caps and Macintosh. Then it could have been anyone. <laughs> at the time this took place, you were nowhere to be found? I was out walking. It was a dreary day, but I wanted exercise. I was quite alone. That is no alibi. The man was wearing spectacles and was left-handed. He spoke very precise English, which could be an effort to conceal an American accent. Now, look here. This just isn't fair. The check which was typed out had the dates of the day and the month transposed. In England, we put the day first, then the month and the year. Of course, correct. In America, it's the month, the day and the year. All this adds up. As the stamps were found in your study, the case against you looks complete. But, as I have said, most crimes are not what they appear. Supposing there was someone in the college who wanted you to be disgraced, dismissed from the college and the sports, then wouldn't it be a simple matter to imitate you? A pair of steel-rimmed glasses, easily obtainable. The subtle typing of an American way of dating a check. The affected voice. Even the unnecessary writing of the amount taken on an envelope so that the cashier should note that the left hand was used. Uh, look here, yeah, Mr. Holden. Do you mean someone was trying to get Lewis wrongfully accused? Oh, yes, that is exactly what I do mean. It's all too obvious. It's all too pat. Guy Lewis is quite innocent. You're right, Mr. Hopkins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then who oh, has committed me. this annoyance? Well, it would be someone who, in the first place, would like a hundred pounds in ready cash, a gambling debt, perhaps. Two, someone who wants very much to be included in the Oxford sports team, desperate for his blue. Three, someone who is jealous of you, Lord Farewell, perhaps a lady friend. Well, but, but that, that can only be... It can't be. Four, someone who is a fine athlete and a very fine pole vaulter. What? A pole vaulter? None of us is a pole vaulter. Except... Except Eric Davidson, Lord Farewell's best friend. A man whom I suspect is rather in debt. A man who is in love with your current lady friend, Lord Farewell. A man who is desperate to get into the Oxford team and has probably got a lot of money on certain events, particularly the pole vault. The distance from the ground to the lead roof outside your rooms is over ten feet, Lord Farewell. Eric Davidson is the only one who can clear that distance. At least, according to your sporting records, which I took care to examine. This... this isn't true... You, you can't prove a thing against me. No, I think we can. I took an impression from the turf outside Falcon Lodge. I'm willing to bet that your vaulting pole has a triangular base such as is used up in the Fend district. The spikes will fit the turf specimen exactly. You've been a little too clever all along, haven't you, Davidson? Well, gentlemen, I've concluded my investigation. If you examine all the facts I've placed before you, you'll find my conclusions are perfectly correct. What steps you take against this man who has so outmaneuvered you is not my business. I just regret that jealousy and deception can exist to this degree in an institution such as this. Well, that is all. Would you excuse us, Dean? I think there is a diner on the nine o'clock train back to London, Watson. Shall we go? It was some weeks after this that Holmes paused while refilling his pipe and turned the newspaper over to the back pages. There were the sports results in full. Mm. Mm. Ah. I see that the results are here of the athletics meeting between Oxford and Cambridge. Most interesting. Well, what about young Christopher Farewell? Does it mention him? Oh, yes. Quite prominently. St. Mark's acquitted itself well. Good to see that the American guy, Lewis, was very much to the fore. He won the sprint events quite easily. And the pro vault? Cambridge won. No mention of Eric Davidson. I imagine he's no longer at St. Mark's. <laughs> well, let's hope we never hear about that young man again. He's far too ingenious a mind. The sort of mind that makes a good criminal. Or perhaps a good private investigator? <laughs> well, one can only hope, Watson. One can only hope. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. I don't know what the world's coming to. Well, I don't, Holmes, and that's a fact. Hang it all. Here we are in 1903, now in the 20th century, and look at the headlines. 
assassination of royal family of Serbia. The turning of the years is no guarantee of human nature improving, Watson. I fear this sort of outrage may increase as communication between nations makes the world grow smaller. Well, thank heavens I'm living in England. That's all I can say. You think such a thing cannot happen here? I wish I were as certain as you are, Watson. Ah, an early morning visitor. Well, if it's the man I'm expecting, he may be the very man to throw fresh light upon this rather ugly incident. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Counter Assassin. In the middle of July, 1903, my wife's brother, the Reverend Percy Phelps of Great Paddock Parish, Nettlebed, was taken ill. After a short time in hospital, he returned to his vicarage, but Mary was concerned about his health and persuaded me she should go down and nurse him during a convalescence period. Of course, I agreed. And, as usual, when I was left alone, I returned to my old rooms at 221B Baker Street, where I knew Sherlock Holmes would be grateful for my company. Holmes had not changed in his habits and was still prepared to accept visitors from all ranks of life. The gentleman Mrs. Hudson showed in that sunny morning was a mid-European of striking appearance. Tall and thin, with white flowing hair, his black bushy eyebrows and waxed moustache contrasted with deep-set blue eyes. He was as near Mephistopheles as I've ever seen off stage. Holmes appeared unimpressed, but then he knew the gentleman and greeted him most cordially. You are most welcome, Monsieur Kodosky. Meet my friend and colleague, Dr. John Watson. Watson, Jules Kodosky. I am most pleased to make your acquaintance, Doctor. How do you do, Monsieur? Watson is a very old friend and confidant, Kodosky. Please feel free to talk quite openly in front of him. We share no professional secrets, uh, but please, do be seated. You have time for coffee, surely? Thank you, yes. Uh, good. This must be a very fleeting visit, for I observe that you are in something of a hurry... I've already been working hard since you woke this morning. Did you leave the remainder of your luggage at the railway station? Perhaps you plan to catch the northbound express to Liverpool. What is it this time, Kodosky? America? Oh, I see you have lost none of your powers, Holmes. Or are you now a mind reader? <laughs> Not at all. You've been here but a few minutes, and you've already looked at the mantelpiece clock several times. Your fingers have an ink stain upon them which indicates you have been writing at some length. You carry an attaché case and a raincoat. Yet it is a fine, warm day, so you are traveling. The Northern Line's timetable shows from the right-hand coat pocket. Now, why should a man like yourself travel north unless to board a ship heading west? It's really quite elementary. Now that you have explained your reasoning, I do understand. I do not think it is as easy as that to other people, but, of course, you are quite correct. I have been working. I'm leaving the country as soon as I can board this ship. And I cannot stay with you very long. Here's your coffee, monsieur. And now, if you'd prefer to speak with Holmes alone, I... No, no. If he wishes you to hear what I have to say, then I have no objection. But you must be prepared to believe every word I shall tell you. It will sound unbelievable, but I assure you it is all true. And of very great importance. Then as swiftly as you can, tell us what it is. There is a plot afoot to assassinate your monarch. What? Shit. You can't mean this. This is impossible. It is true. I beg you, Mr. Holmes, to take this seriously. Unlike Watson, I do. I know your background, Kodosky. I know how your loyalties in Serbia will have placed you in very great peril with the revolutionary units in that part of Europe. You have always been a brave man. If you chose to leave and seek comfort in America, then it must be because you have reached a point of desperation. But tell me more. What do you know of this plan? Alas, very little. There is an organization known as La Pocheta. It has sent a man to this country to recruit insurgents for the purpose of assassinating royalty and all those who actively protect them. I cannot tell you more than the name of the man in charge. He is known as La Perte, but he has several aliases. I am told his English name at the moment is Ronald Morgenstern, and that he has acquired the most advanced weapon for killing, a unique rifle with special sighting equipment that can assure an accurate shot 
from twice the distance previously achieved. Mm. And the assassination will be by shooting? So I believe. I wish I had more information to pass on to you, Holmes. But alas, I have to leave all my files and correspondence behind. The little I can recall I have put to paper. Here, I have the envelope in my briefcase. I uh, have none of the technical expertise to pass on, but in layman's language and in a crude fashion, I've put down on paper all that I can recall. Here, take it. Do as you think fit with it. Thank you, Kodrowski. You are a brave man. I realize you're taking an extreme risk in passing all this on to me. I can hardly be in greater danger than I am at the moment, Holmes. And now, if you will excuse me, I have to leave. There is just time to reach the station and catch my train. Thank you for the coffee. Goodbye, monsieur. Um, may I wish you Godspeed. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Goodbye. Goodbye, Holmes. I think it's very unlikely that we shall ever meet again. Goodbye. I didn't hear of the death of Jules Krodowski until noon next day, when I returned from my rounds to find Holmes in a very dark and pensive mood. On the table lay the papers. One glance was enough. Yes, Watson. As I've always said, Krodowski was a brave man. It was sobering thought to realize that had he not taken the trouble to call here with that envelope yesterday, he might have given his pursuers the slip and got away. And it was they got rid of him by neatly pushing him under a train. Holmes, this is dreadful. It, oh, could it not have been an accident? Mm, extremely unlikely, Watson. No, the La Prochetta got him. When they seek publicity, then they openly assassinate. When it's a private matter, they simply stage an accident. Oh, you are both then. Good. Uh, this part's a while for you, Mr. Holmes. I've signed for it. Oh, uh, put it down, will you, Mrs. Hudson? Thank you. Oh, right -o. I've got some cold roast beef and pickles if you want lunch, Dr. Watson. Uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Hudson, but I, I really haven't got much time. No, it won't take long. I'll bring some in on a tray. Oh, just a pot of tea will do for me, thank you. Whoa! <sighs> Look here, Holmes. If Kradosky really was murdered, then it means he must have been... Uh, just a moment, Watson, just a moment. The label on this parcel is typewritten. All quite correct. And the postmark is Paddington. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, don't worry about the tea and luncheon, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, just bring me a very large bowl of cold water immediately, will you? No. Oh, very well, sir. This really is only to be expected, isn't it? Uh, well, is it? To what are you referring? To the parcel, Watson, the parcel. I'm always suspicious of parcels through the post, particularly of that handy square size. Yes, of course, it looks harmless enough. Uh, Holmes, what, what are you implying? That, that this is uh, a... Look, Paddington is just round the corner, isn't it? Why send something through the post... Well, it'd be quite easily be delivered by hand. Oh, uh, here we are, sir. Uh, Mr. All right, it's me enamel bowl from the bathroom. Mm, yes, that's excellent, Mrs. Hudson. Now, Watson, come closer. Of course, there's no danger at all as long as the string and seals are intact. But once they are broken, well, let me let me demonstrate. I'll hold the parcel over the water. Can you please take those scissors on the desk and, when I tell you, cut the string and tear the brown paper. Now, are you ready? Yes, ready. Thanks, Very well. Right. Yeah, now. Good. Now, listen. As I thought, into the water, Watson. Good. Now, I shall undo the parcel under the water, and you will see that there is a clock-like mechanism attached to the spring fuse. Yes. Rendered it harmless. Now, out of the water. Goodness gracious me. What's going on? I'm afraid, Mrs. Hudson, I'm going to make a bit of a mess in here. I'm going to cause a minor explosion. Oh, oh, don't worry. I shall fill the room with a great deal of smoke and there will be a very loud explosion, but it will not harm anyone. Now, wait a moment, Watson. I have the required materials handy in that cupboard. My, my gun. Well, Holmes, what are you proposing to do? I'm going to make a very big bang near the window. From below, it will seem that the bomb has gone off and, and wrecked the room. Ah. Ah, this, this. this will do the trick. It's all right, 
Mrs. Hudson, I know exactly what I'm doing and the effect I wish to cause. I must carry it over there and set it in place neatly so that the blast, such as it is, will be directed outwards. There, that should do the trick. Now, I must ask you both to stand well back. Are you ready? Yes, as ready as possible. Oh, don't lock it. It's one little bit. Now, with my revolver, I shall fire at the parcel, and with a little luck, we shall get just the effect necessary. Ready? Then, now. The whole of the small window was shattered by the bomb. Holmes had planted it most carefully, for while the curtains billowed out in clouds of black smoke, there was little or no actual damage within the room. Mrs. Hudson was horrified until Holmes explained that it was all quite necessary and swore her to silence. I spread the news all over London that Sherlock Holmes was seriously injured by a mysterious bomb blast in his Baker Street home. An ambulance arrived, a great show was made with a covered stretcher being taken out of the building and driven away at top speed to St. Mary's Clinic. It was there that Holmes took the superintendent into his confidence. You must give me complete cooperation, Superintendent. I know that my request is most unusual, but I must insist that you do exactly as I say. I will get Scotland Yard to confirm it all. If necessary, I will obtain an official government order signed by the Prime Minister himself. The fate of some of the most important people in this land is at stake, even the Sovereign himself. Well, this is quite amazing, Mr. Holmes. Well, naturally, I should, in normal circumstances, demand confirmation of all that you say, but well, since you stress the urgency of the matter... I will agree. Splendid. I will arrange for Scotland Yard to call upon you and verify everything I say. Uh, meanwhile, I wish it to be given out that I've been admitted to your care in a serious condition. No one is to be allowed into my private ward except a special nurse and yourself. You will have to take one of the matrons into your confidence, but she must be completely trustworthy and prepared to take the risks for her king and country. I know just the person. Have no fear. You can rely on us. Good. Now, Dr. Watson here will be my go-between. I shall not be able to communicate with you in person, but... Whatever Watson asks you to do, you must carry out without question. Do you understand? Yes. Yes, I understand. Good. Well, that's all for the moment. Make your first official bulletin about me very cautious. Then as the days go by, you can report steady progress. No publicity over and above the daily health bulletin. I understand. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. It shall be carried out to the letter. And so all England believed that Sherlock Holmes lay in hospital seriously injured by an anarchist bomb. I put on as good a performance as I could as the heartbroken friend, only breaking faith with Holmes to reassure my wife that things were not as they seemed. She was aware of Holmes' methods and tactfully withdrew her inquiries. Meanwhile, I went about my duties, and as the days passed, I made arrangements to have the window at Baker Street repaired and tried to resume a normal existence. There was no news from Holmes, but one morning, returning before lunch, I found some activity in our sitting room. Oh, dear. Hasn't that been repaired yet? It, you know, it should have been finished hours ago. Oh, sorry, Governor, we got started late. And my mate here and I just fixed it up. Could be all right. Uh, that's right, Cubby Addy. Yeah, right you are. Here's it. Ah, uh, uh. Uh, she down she goes. Ah, uh, that's it. Oh, yes, yes, that seems quite satisfactory. Uh, how to paint? It's good as new. Don't you agree, Watson? What the... Oh, I should have guessed. I've been, I've been waiting to hear from you, Holmes. Yes, I'm sorry to have entered my own home disguised as a workman, but it seemed the safest way. Oh, uh, please do meet my assistant, Harry Boggs, in the trade, but Roger Brent to New Scotland Yard. How do you do, Dr. Watson? Nice to meet you. Oh, it's a pleasure. Well, Holmes, what's been happening? The superintendent in the clinic is becoming rather difficult to handle. He doesn't know what to do. He wants to know how long this pretense of yours is to be carried on. Well, tell him it will not be long now. In fact, I have a specific instruction for him. Things are moving towards a climax, Watson. Yes, well, thank goodness for that. Well, what's been happening, Holmes? Have you found out anything about the man known as Lepert and this organization, La Pachetta? Is there any truth in the warnings Kodosky gave us? Uh, one question at a time, Watson. Uh, briefly, the position is this. Yes, those warnings were well-founded. There is a royal assassination plot afoot, and it's our duty to thwart it. Oh, but how? Well, there's already been one attempt upon my life, and it will become necessary to draw their fire, as it were, yet again. But you don't mean that you're deliberately going to place yourself in danger, Holmes? My friend Brent here is the man who will risk most, I'm afraid. He's been brave enough to impersonate me on several occasions. The real risks will be taken this weekend. Now, Watson, time is short, and I've got to work swiftly. This is what you must do. 
I want the superintendent of the clinic to give out that I'm making a surprisingly good recovery. I'm out of bed for a few hours each day, and by the weekend I should be able to be wheeled outside in a bath chair. A special male orderly, my friend Brent here, will be in charge of the proceedings. I shall rely upon him to arrange a convincing enough dummy in the chair. My hat and cape will be sacrificed for the occasion. Now, it's most important that the chair is positioned correctly. Next Sunday morning, between the hours of 10 and 11, when I shall be taking the sunshine... Here. I have drawn out a plan of the clinic and the nearby buildings. You'll see that here is Brunswick Square, and Kenton Street is here, across the road from the hospital gardens, is St. Mary's Church. Now, Brent will wheel the chair out and place it right here. Now, with the plans I have laid, I'm sure the opportunity will be so great that my enemies will not refuse the bait. They will think that they simply cannot miss I think we cannot miss Leopard. Are you sure of this information, Gresswich? I am. An orderly from the hospital had a little too much to drink in the bar of the George and Dragon in Soho Square a few nights ago. Mm. It was easy to get detailed information from him. Good, good. Uh, Sherlock Holmes will be convalescing at the weekend. He will be allowed the use of the small gardens at the end of the wards. So, then we must act. This time we shall not fail. Holmes was very lucky not to have been blown to pieces last time. He will not be able to escape from the sniper's bullet. It also gives me an ideal chance to try out the new equipment. I have assembled the latest rifle. It is a superb weapon which I'm most anxious to use. There must be a suitable advantage point from one of the roofs of surrounding buildings. There is a church right opposite. It is isolated, but it might be hard to enter during daylight without being noticed. <laughs> what, on a Sunday? Not with everyone attending church service. It'll be simple. Come, we must work out a detailed plan. It will be necessary to visit that church, find out exactly the position to take up. And then, for once, we shall go to church on a Sunday, Preston. This is the longest Sunday morning I can ever remember, Holmes. I warned you that it would be extremely tiresome, Watson. Yes, well, I seem to have been crouched in the corner of this parapet for days. Mm, mere two and a half hours. It was necessary that we took up our positions ahead of the men we are about to catch. You could hardly allow them to hear us climb up here. Oh, look at the view. It will take your mind off your cramped limbs. It's been attempting to do so, but it doesn't help matters. No sign of any activity down there in the hospital garden. Mm, it's a little early. But all of the wards are clearly visible. Dr. Brent, who wheeled the bath chair out of those first doors. The perfect target. Yeah. Or supposing the patch falls into the trap. Supposing it doesn't. How long are we to stay up here like this? Well, until the service is over. Most of the congregation will arrive now. And then... Quiet. Listen. <laughs> Things are about to happen, Watson. Stay back and don't move until I get the word. Yeah, yeah good. Now, this is the exact spot. Perfect. From this church tower, we look straight out into the gardens. And no sign of anyone down there. No, no. Well, then we must be content to wait. Yeah, meanwhile, from the case, I take the parts of the rifle and assemble them. I think something is happening down there in the building. There are people appearing at the windows. I can see through these binoculars. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that Mr. Sherlock Holmes is about to be taken into the garden. Mr. Brent? Oh, Roger? Are you sure you can manage this? Of course, nurse. Now, don't worry. I think that the dummy we have arranged in the chair is very lifelike. A deer stalker hat, the cape and rug over the knees. It's convincing enough from here. From outside the gardens, it must look totally real. Open the doors. There you are. Thank you. Don't worry. I shall not stay with him very long. Here we go. There. There, you see. It is just as we were told. There is the orderly wheeling the chair with Holmes sitting in. Do you see them? Yeah, 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 of course I see them. I can see them most clearly. Uh, the orderly standing in the way. I have the chair in the sights of the rifle. If the orderly moves back, it is clear. Yes, now to make quite sure. 
I have got him. <laughs> He's fallen from the chair. Stay where you are. Don't move, no, what, don't move what? either of you. Take your hands from the parapet no. and drop that rifle. I'll shoot you on spot unless you obey now. Holmes, and how was well, you are told, Lepert? You also dropped the rifle. Yeah. Sorry to disappoint you, Lepert, but I'm very much alive. Hands above your heads and move away from the parapet. Slowly now, and no tricks. So, oh, Sherlock Holmes, you have tricked us. Laid the trap. You surely do not think you will take us alive, you? Watson is a good shot. He can just cripple you. No, 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 no. I would prefer death. And so would you, wouldn't you, Bresswich? Well, well, what do you mean? I mean we have failed, and because we have failed, we pay the extreme penalty. Together. So! Uh, no! No! Oh, no! Oh, you're coming, Bresswich! No! No! Do you... You were right, yes, Watson? Yes, yes, I, I'm sorry, Holmes. I just couldn't hold them. The short was impossible. Well, perhaps it's just as well. Oh, we'll pick up that rifle, Watson. That's the most important piece of evidence that's come our way in many a long day. Of course, as always, Sherlock Holmes took no credit at all for uncovering the assassination group and thwarting their plans, which, had they been successful, would have caused total chaos throughout the British Empire. Of course, there was discreet recognition from the correct authorities, Scotland Yard, and an audience at Buckingham Palace was commanded. Holmes made light of all this. He'd had important assignments before and treated it as all in the day's work. The person who did come out of it rather well was Roger Brent. I must thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. I owe my promotion entirely to you. Not at all. You deserved it. And uh, didn't I hear something about more congratulations being in order? You are to be married? Yes, that's right. Susan Bennett, the nurse who was supposed to look after you at the clinic, the one who helped me with the wheelchair. Will you come to our wedding? And will you, Dr. Watson? Oh, but of course. And, of course, congratulations. There, Holmes, you see? Good can come out of all of this, after all. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watts. I just drop by to explain why the wife hasn't been at work, Mr. Holmes. She's that sorry to be letting you down. That's quite all right, Mr. Hudson. I quite understand. I knew Mrs. Hudson must be unwell. She so very rarely stays away. Is it the flu? Asian flu. That's what it's called. Trust these foreigners that come up with something really nasty. Uh, she'll be all right, though. Tough old girl she is. And he's uh, Dr. Watson about. He might like to look in on her. Unfortunately, Watson is away on the continent. In Bern, I understand, for a European medical conference. He won't be back for another fortnight. Oh, oh well, uh, oh, the missus will be up and about the right rain before then. Well, I'll be getting along. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'll, I'll see my own way. I'll, bye for now. Well, goodbye. And give Mrs. Hudson my best wishes for a speedy recovery. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Bye. <clears throat> so I'm all alone for a bit. We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Curious Case of Ira Pasha. Almost all the cases of Mr. Sherlock Holmes have been chronicled by my husband, Dr. John Watson. This is the one case he has not written about, simply because great care has been taken to keep the whole affair a secret from him. Mr. Holmes advises me to write it all down in order to rid it from my mind. I hope it will do so, for it has been one of the worst experiences of my life. It occurred when my husband went away to Switzerland to attend a European medical conference. About two weeks after John had left, something occurred that threw my life into grave confusion. I was in utter despair. There was only one person I could turn to. In spite of the lateness of the hour, I hired a handsome cab, and with minutes it was clocking its way through the stormy night to Baker Street and Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mary Watson. My dear sir, 
Still crackling in the grate. You can take off that wet cloak and bonnet. Now, come along. I simply had to come. Now, now then, not another word. Not a word until you're more comfortable. Now, now place yourself in front of the fire. Oh, thank you. Tell me what it is that so upset you. It's not Watson. There's not bad news from Switzerland. No, no, John is all right. His last letter was very cheerful. It's nothing to do with him. That is, that is it. Very indirectly, you see. I think he... No, 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 no. I, I cannot help you unless you explain quite clearly what all this is about. I think a small drink might help you. Now, here. Drink this. Come along. Oh, thank you. Right. Now, start at the beginning and tell me everything. Well, it started late this afternoon. I'd been doing a little shopping, and when I returned, I found a stranger on the doorstep. A young lady, dressed in the height of fashion, but with an elegance that was not English. She was very beautiful in a dusky sort of way. She asked for my husband, and I told her he was not available. I thought she wanted a doctor, you see, and started to recommend John's friend across the road. But she asked to come in and talk. Well, naturally, I agreed. I'm sorry that my husband is not at home. He's abroad at the moment. I do not expect him back for the next week or ten days. Oh, that is most unfortunate. I need his help so much. It, it was a, how you say, a, a last resort. Pray sit down and tell me what is wrong. I ill in need of medical care. I... Oh, no. No, it is nothing like that. I, I did not know that Dr. Watson was a married man. I, I, I'm sorry. There's no need to apologize. But what is it you want, you... Obviously, do not know my husband. No. No, we have never met. And you are not ill, so what is it that brings you here? Mrs. Watson, it is so hard for me to explain. This is all so different from what I had imagined. I do not know how to begin. I have been in Great Britain only seven weeks. I came from Turkey. My name is Ira Pasha. My mother came from Takar in Afghanistan. That is where I was born. I've been traveling with my fiancé, Anton Fournier. He is in trading enterprises, a junior partner in an international export organization. We, we stay at the Bedford Hotel, Bailey Street. This should be the prelude to, to our marriage and, and, and the start of our honeymoon. But unless I can produce a thousand pounds within the next two days, it, it will all end in tragedy. A thousand pounds? But, but I don't understand. Why should you need such a vast sum of money? It is Anton. He has to pay the money to a man named Grigor Harat within two days. Or he will be ruined. He owes this money and cannot pay it back? But what about his firm, oh, his no, partner? No, no, no. you do not understand. And I... Oh, I express myself so poorly. Anton, he does not owe the money. He... he he's being forced to pay it. He, he is being blackmailed. Oh, what? Blackmailed by the man Grigor Harat? Well, can he not go to the police? Oh, no. You see, there were stolen goods brought into this country by Anton without him knowing. But the man, he has the evidence to say that Anton was guilty. He will not hand over the evidence if he's, if he's not paid 1,000 pounds. If he does not get the money, then he exposes Anton's crime. Oh, dear. Well, I am most dreadfully sorry for you, but when I... I cannot see any way I can help, and forgive me for asking, but... But why do you seek out my husband? He's unknown to you. Just a name. He's simply a struggling London doctor. Why did you come here to him? Uh, I, I, I cannot say. It was a wild idea. I I have no friends. I, I, I do not know anybody in London. It, I, I was at my wit's end. I'm sorry. I shall go back to Anton. We must find some other way of raising the money. I'm sorry. I go. No, no. Wait. I'm not satisfied. How did you know that John Watson lives here? Who told you about us? And I repeat, why did you think of turning to him for help? I, I knew his name. I found the address from, from the medical list of doctors in the city. That is all. There is no need for explanations. I will leave you. No, please. There is more to this than you say. I must know. What has my husband to do with you? 
You have not been married to him very long. You were not childhood, sweetheart. No. <laughs> no, I've only known my husband since he practiced in Paddington and lived for a number of years in Bay Street. Then his early life is unknown to you. Well, I know he was honorably discharged from the army after a distinguished military career as a doctor in India and Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yes. That is where he met Kanina Pasha. Kanina Pasha? My mother. He was highborn, the royal blood of the princess. They were never married, of course, but I am her love child. I am your husband's daughter. I couldn't believe my ears. It, it didn't make sense. I, I sat looking into the eyes of this stranger, this beautiful young woman who had made the most extraordinary claim. Then I realized that part of her beauty was because, in contrast to her complexion and the jet black hair, her eyes were grey-blue, John's eyes. Mr. Holmes, you, you cannot imagine what a shock this has been oh, to me. Oh, yes, I can, Mary, but try to think dispassionately. The very fact that this woman has grey blue eyes does not mean a thing. It will take far more proof than that to establish her claim to be Watson's daughter. However, pray continue with your story. I imagine you were stunned by her statement, but surely you questioned her. You didn't calmly accept what she said as a fact. No, no, of course not. But I was shocked, and then... Then, very angry, I accused her of being an imposter, of making it all up for some reason. I am not lying, Mrs. Watson. My mother told me everything many years ago. She was a brave and wonderful woman. She did not wish to bring disgrace upon my father or make any claims. She bore the brunt of her shame alone. I'm sure that Dr. Watson does not know of this unhappy heritage. But I... I still refuse to believe it. You... you cannot expect me to. Why any one of your kind can come here and make such claims? I, well, I refuse to allow you to. To disclose these facts, these dreadful lies. I assure you, they are not lies. And I shall not disclose them. Why should I? I have nothing to gain by it. I simply came here because I... I was in despair and, and wondered if he, if he could help me. Well, he cannot. Even if he were here, I would not allow him to. It is a preposterous claim that you are making. I do not believe a word of what you have been saying. Then I will go. But I do have proof. Photographs, letters, much proof of who is my father. I'm sorry to have caused you anxiety, but I shall go. Wait! You say you have proof and carry that proof with you? Yes. Well, not here, of course, but amongst my luggage. I'm sorry we've met in these unhappy circumstances. One moment, if I... I am able to help you. How, how do we get in touch? Through the hotel. The Bedford Hotel. Or oh, better still, my husband and I will be lunching at the Kabul restaurant in Charlotte Street tomorrow at 12.30. Perhaps you would care to join us there. If you do not, then I understand. Good afternoon to you, Mrs. Watson. So, you see, I do not know what to do. Is this woman speaking the truth, Mr. Holmes? Is she John's daughter? And if so, what am I supposed to do? You first of all keep your head. Don't you realize that you could be being blackmailed in exactly the same manner as this person claims her lover is being blackmailed? No, Mary, you do nothing. You wait until you hear from me. And and when will that be? Before noon, tomorrow. And meanwhile, I shall call upon Grieg or Harat. Oh. oh, then there is such a person. You know him? Not personally, no, but I soon shall. He's one of the most dangerous international crooks in London. Yes. About time I crossed swords with Grigor Harat. I was aware that my problem was a deeply personal one. I had never questioned John about his past. I knew he'd been a doctor in the Indian Army and had been the attractive man he was in his youth. He must have had many lady friends. But to be confronted by his daughter was a shocking experience. I knew that Sherlock Holmes would see it all in a completely different light. But I had gone to him for help, and he had given me advice, so I could only obey and wait. This table taken? Mind if I sit here, mate? No, no, help yourself. What? What? Well, if it is Mr. Holmes. Hello, Jasper. I thought I might find you here. Well, well, well quite like old times, ain't it? <clears throat> Isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. Doing well, Jasper? Can't complain. Straight as a die, of course. Oh, of course. 
but not above earning a few pounds. You can't say no, not these days. Why, Mr. Holmes, what have you got in mind? Can't be anything crooked. No, 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 no. just information. At one time in your dubious career, you worked for a Mr. Grigor Haras, didn't you? I want to know everything about him. Well, I'll tell you all I can, and if it helps you to nail that blighter to the wall, then it'll be a real pleasure. Yeah, I worked for him, all right. A few years ago, it was, and he shot me good and proper. He lives in a house in Sutgard Place, two floors. His only two servants, a sort of manservant and a cook who lives out. Keeps a real posh place. Uh, his interests are uh, pottery and photography. Mm. Where does he keep all this uh, secret information? In a safe, uh, back of the dark room, but no one can get in there. Uh, he has an alarm system, all controlled. Oh, yeah. Very up to date is our Mr. Erard. All the latest devices. I see. So no one can get into the house without the alarm bells ringing? Yeah, that's about it. But there must be a switch, a main switch. If he has electricity installed, there must be a box worth switches on. No, oh, that's right. It's in the hallway uh, above the act stand. They're sort of hidden away in the corner. It looks like part of the act track. Oh, he's a clever one, is Mr. Arthur. He's as slick as a snake. Better be careful if you tangle with that one, Mr. Holmes. I remember your advice, Jasper. Thank you. Oh, and, uh... Oh, oh uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you kindly. Uh, oh, the number of the house is number 12, by the way. <laughs> Thinking of doing a bit of burglary, Mr. Holmes? If so, well, the best of luck. I spent a troubled night and woke tired and strained. I waited anxiously for news from Sherlock Holmes. He was the most dependable man. And sure enough, just before 12 o'clock, the doorbell rang. He was there with a carriage waiting and drove me to the Kabul restaurant in Charlotte Street. By this time, I wondered if it had been a dream, if Ara Pasha did exist, if there was a friend called Anton Fournier. I rather hoped there wasn't, but there was. I'm so glad that you came, Mrs. Watson. This is Anton. How do you do, Mrs. Watson? I've heard much about you. How do you do, Mr. Fournier? Uh, may I present Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Mr. Holmes, this is Miss Ara Pasha and Mr. Anton Fournier. Hello, Mr. Holmes. How do you do? I'm very pleased to meet you. Uh, may we talk before we order our meal? Yes, yes, of course. Perhaps I'm the one who should explain. I seem to be the cause of all the trouble. I take it that Mrs. Watson has explained my difficulties to you, Mr. Holmes. I think I am aware of the situation. Now, tell me how you became involved with this man, Grigor Harald. I find that out. Uh, I am a foreigner to this country, like Ira. I import the goods, and this man, he says that he finds in the China vases that I bring here is the opium, the heroin, the drugs, you understand? I cannot prove that I know nothing of this. And he has the bills of loading. He says he has the proof, and he wants the money before he destroys the proof. Exactly what is the proof? He has a sample of China, a small vase, exactly like the all of my cargo that lies in the wharf at Lamas. He has papers, much evidence. Mm, I see. And what of you, Miss Pasha? Has he any evidence, any papers against you? He knew my mother. He knows a great deal about my family. I have to support Anton. Oh, Mr. Holmes, this is very distressing for me. I know of your friendship with... with, with, with Dr. Watts. For his sake, I wish that you can help us. I shall do my best. But you do realize that we're all known to this man, Herat. I cannot confront him openly. He knows me. And I should be unable to negotiate in any way. Both of you are known to him, and so... There is only one person who can help us. And that is you, Mary. Me? But what can I do? Anton will give you a sample of his chinaware. You will go to number 12, Sutgard Place, and offer it to Mr. Grigor Harat. You will talk knowledgeably about the china and porcelain, and then you will contrive to find the alarm switch. It must be perfectly planned. You are capable of doing this, for everyone's sake. Now listen most carefully, for it all depends upon you, Mary. And so, you bring me this example, and you say it is for sale. How much do you want, madame? Five hundred pounds. Hmm? It is worth more than that. Surely you are able to value it more accurately. Well, I, I know that it is of the continental kind. It is a product of the Vincennes period. See, the base is marked with two swords and the letter A. It is of the year 1753. Yes, yes, that is true. How knowledgeable you are. You say these things as though you have just learned them. Have you just learned them, Mrs. Watson? I... I beg your pardon? You surely did not think that I would be taken in by this obvious pretense. 
The girl, Ira Pasha. She goes to you, and she says that she is your husband's daughter. You believe her. And her lover, the man Anton, gives you this kind of ass. Why did you come here, Mrs. Watson? Did you think you could trick me? I am Grigor Harat, and I know more of what goes on in London society than any man alive. Well, what sort of bargain shall we make? You wish me to give you proof that your husband is not the father of that young lady? <laughs> Why surprise you? Do I not, sir? I seem to know everything. I... I came here because I thought you would wish to buy the vase. I don't know what you are talking about. Mm. If you do not wish to do business, then with your permission, I shall leave. But of course, you may leave immediately. I am a gentleman. I do not cause trouble with the married men. Ah, permit me. Here, take the vase. Tell Anton Fournier that my bargain remains good. I want the money. He knows the amount. I want it by tonight. Otherwise, I shall expose him. And the young lady who says she is your husband's daughter. You may leave now. Very well. I shall go. You have won, Mr. Herat. I acknowledge that. It has been a great pleasure, madame. At this way. Um, before I go, there yeah? is one thing, one very important important thing that I wish to know, and that is, have you proof that this Ira Pasha is the daughter of... of, of... <laughs> you are very concerned about that, are you not, my dear lady? But it never pays to delve into the past. I only ask because... Uh, huh? uh, I, I'm afraid that all the emotion is too, too much. I grow faint and... Yeah. Uh, uh, madame! Madame! Uh. Typical of a woman, fainted away. Well, lie there. A little brandy will revive you. And from now on, nothing will alter my plans. Uh, oh. There. There. Here, here you are. Drink this down and get out of my house. Come on, Mrs. Watson. You have failed in whatever you wish to achieve. Drink. Mm. Thank you. I, I, I will go now. Goodbye, Mr. Harad. Goodbye, Mrs. Watts. I had done all I came to do. I had managed to deceive this man to the extent that he left me alone in the hall, where I pulled down the alarm switch. I believed he had not noticed, and all I could do was wait. I knew that Sherlock Holmes would have calculated everything to the nearest second. Come, Anton. This is the way. The windows will not be barred. The alarm is off. Come, gently now. There. Now, in we go. I Beautiful young lady. Together we have one. I have all the evidence to get money from your so-called lover <laughs> and from Mrs. Watson. She must be a great fool to have believed your story. With what we shall make out of this and the traffic within the China delivery, we shall be able to retire most comfortably. Huh? <laughs> that is all I have ever wished for. I want nothing but the riches and power. That fool of a woman. Most women are fools. Yeah, all of them. Except you, my darling. Mm. Stay just where yeah. you are. Do not move, either of you. Oh, no, no, no. Not while I can fight. I never knew the conclusion of this most curious case. Sherlock Holmes was careful to protect me from the details. I did read of the death of Grigor Harad and the sudden disappearance of the young woman who called herself... Ara Pasha. Mr. Holmes thanked me for my part in the affair, but I was most unhappy about it all. Uh, there's nothing to feel at all guilty about, Mary. You've seen the death of a monstrous man. Grigor Harat would have ended up dead somehow or another. 
He was so evil that someone would have had their revenge sooner or later. But, but Anton and, and, and that woman, Ah, uh, When thieves fall out, anything can happen. Yes, but was she? Was she John's daughter? She was a liar and a cheat, but she still had John's eyes. What do I do now? What I have always advised, you do nothing. If the contents of Grigor Harat's darkroom reveals photographs, evidence, then you pretend not to know about it. And you must never mention this to your husband. Not ever. Do you understand, Mary? There are some things best left alone, and this is one of them. You love your husband, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Then be silent, Mary. And let things remain as they are. This is our secret. Be silent. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watts. I'm sorry to intrude upon your consulting rooms unannounced. Holmes! But there are reasons. I, I have been greatly pressed of late. Oh, this is a wonderful surprise. You've not met for months. Have you any objection to my closing the shutters over your windows? If I edge my way round the walls, I, I can just reach them. Uh, there, 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 there. Well, uh, Holmes, you look greatly distressed. What is it? Are you afraid of something? Yes, yes, I am. Of what? Of air guns. And one man, Professor James Moriarty. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the final problem. months since I'd seen Sherlock Holmes. Since my marriage and years in private practice, naturally the relationship between us had been modified. Nevertheless, we'd always kept in touch. But for the past winter and early spring, I'd not heard or seen of him. I read in the newspapers that he'd been engaged by the French government upon a matter of supreme importance, and I gathered that his stay in that country would be a lengthy one. I was therefore taken completely by surprise when he burst in upon me that evening. I must apologize for calling so late, Watson. It will be a quick visit. Well, Holmes, what does all this mean? Uh, one thing at a time, Watson. Uh, firstly, is Mrs. Watson in? Oh, she has a slight headache. She's gone upstairs. Uh, then let us not disturb her. Oh, now, Holmes, please, sit down and have a cigarette. Uh, uh, light your pipe, as in the old days. Now, just quieten down and explain. Oh, very well. I think I shall be safe for a short while. An hour or so with you, and then I shall leave quietly. All right, now, come along. Explain. Where have you been all this time? And uh, what is the crisis with Professor Moriarty? Well, I have been engaged by both the Royal Family of Scandinavia and the French police. I'm happy to say that these endeavours have left me in a position where I can relinquish my career and retire to the country to concentrate upon my researches in peace and comfort. But for one man, Moriarty. Yes, he's <laughs> always eluded you, hasn't he? The man pervades London, and few people have heard of him. That's what puts him... On a pinnacle in the records of crime, he is the Napoleon of crime. A genius. A philosopher, an abstract thinker. He sits motionless like a spider in the center of its web. But controlling half the crime in this land of ours. Oh, he does little himself. He has dozens of agents. If caught, they are bailed out or defended to the hilt. The central power which controls the agents is never caught. Never so much as suspected. Until now. I have come to grips with my worst enemy. I have woven my net around him until it is ready to close. I shall be able to in three, three days' time. <coughs> well, Holmes. <coughs> Holmes. <coughs> here, here. Drink this. Now, take your time. Oh, thank you. Now, you say you have a trap set for Moriarty. Yes, in three days. That is, on Monday next, matters will be ripe. The professor with all the principal members of his gang, will be in the hands of the police. Only the very heads of Scotland Yard and my brother Mycroft know of this. They will succeed. 
Then will come the greatest criminal trial of the century. The clearing up of dozens of mysteries and the rope for all those found guilty. Including Moriarty. Of course. But he's wily. He knows I'm planning his downfall. The last steps were taken and three days only are wanting to complete the business. This morning I was sitting in our old sitting room at Baker Street. Then without any announcement, the door opened and there before me stood the man himself. I thought it time we met face to face, Holmes. Do not be surprised at this unexpected visit. There are a few doors in London that I cannot open with ease. Your housekeeper is shopping. We're quite alone. May I come in? Hmm, you are much as I imagined in the flesh. Less frontal development of the forehead than I expected. Your own shoulders are more rounded than I thought. No doubt through too much study. A bad habit? Not as bad as fingering loaded firearms in the pockets of one's dressing gown. I heard you cock the revolver as I closed the door. Then I had best place it on the table between us. Uh, pray take a chair. I have five minutes I can spare you if you've anything to say. Uh, there is little to say that has not already passed between us in thought. You stand fast in your opposition? Absolutely. I intend to destroy you. Hands away from your pocket, please. Oh, I am merely removing a notebook. Now, I see here, from the 4th of January, you have hounded me, incommoded me, inconvenienced me on some six or seven occasions until now. This continual persecution endangers my liberty. The situation is becoming impossible. Have you any suggestions to make? You must drop it, Holmes. You really must. The alternative is your inevitable destruction. You must stand clear or be trodden underfoot. Have you anything to say to that? Only that I have another appointment and that you're wasting my time. It seems a pity, but I've done all I could. It is to the death, then, Holmes. It is to the death, Moriarty. That was my singular interview with the professor. Holmes, you must take police precautions against him. No, it is not from him, but from his agents that the attacks will be made. Indeed, they've already been made. Within an hour of the professor leaving, I had to go out to transact some business. I was almost run down on the corner of Bentink and Welbeck Streets. A two-horse van tore around the corner and was on me like a flash. I jumped aside with seconds to spare. Later, a brick fell from the roof of Veer Street, shattering to fragments of my feet. There were builders on the roof. Just an accident. <laughs> I took a cab and stayed with Mycroft most of the day. I came round here and was attacked by a thug with a bludgeon. See, my knuckles give evidence of the fight. Oh, Holmes, why didn't you show me this before? Here, look, I must attend to those. Oh, it is a small matter. It was on his front teeth that I barked my fists. Well, at least let me cleanse them. John, dearest, don't you think? Why, Mr. Holmes, what a wonderful surprise. How are you? Uh, as you see me, Mary. I'm afraid, Mary, my dear, that our old friend is in deep trouble. There are forces at work that mean him harm. Now, come, Holmes, let me dress those hands, and Mary will make up the bed in the spare room. Uh, no, 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 I insist. I will be quite all right. I'll attend to my knuckles later. And thank you for your offer of a bed, but I cannot stay. I would almost certainly bring grave trouble to this house during the night. But what is it? We are your friends. Naturally, we must help you. I can seek no help from others in this country until next week. There is only one thing that you can do to help me, Watson. Name it. Whatever it is, I shall do it. I have to get away. Out of the country until Tuesday next at the earliest. Can you come with me? Over to the continent somewhere, France, Switzerland, keeping on the move. I should greatly appreciate the companionship. Oh, Mary, my dear, will you consent to my going? Oh, my practice is quiet. It should just be for a long weekend. But of course. I myself would like to visit my brother, the Reverend Phelps, at Nettlebed. I can wire him to meet me at Great Paddock tomorrow afternoon, and I can return on Thursday. And I have a most accommodating assistant who will look after things. So it's settled, Holmes. I'll come with you. Oh, thank you. Then listen carefully. Now, you must follow these instructions to the letter, for you are now playing a double-handed game against the cleverest rogue and the most powerful syndicate of criminals in Europe. Carry on. What must I do? Dispatch whatever luggage you intend to take by trusted messenger to Victoria Station tonight. In the morning, take a hansom, being sure that it's a cabbie known to us. Drive to the strand end of Lauber Arcade. Have your fare ready. The instant the cab stops, pay the driver and hurry through the arcade, 
timing yourself to reach the other side at a quarter past nine. Now you'll find a small brougham waiting close to the curb, driven by a man in a black cloak. He will take you to Victoria by a devious route, but in time for the Continental Express. Where shall I meet you? At the station. The second first-class carriage from the front will be reserved for us. The carriage is our rendezvous, then. That is correct. Now, thank you for the brandy, but I must leave you. I will go by the window, into the back garden and over the wall. But, Mr. Holmes... I assure you these precautions are quite essential. Goodbye, Watson. See you at Victoria in the morning. Uh, Goodbye, Mary. May we meet again in in happier times. Uh, Goodbye, and thank you. Take care. Goodbye. Uh, And good luck. Good luck. Mary and I obeyed Holmes' orders to the letter. I sent a small case to Victoria, using my worthy assistant, who agreed to help in all ways. In the morning... Mary called me a cab. She'd made all her own arrangements to visit Littlebed. I drove to the Lowther Arcade and found the cab waiting for me on the other side. Rome dropped me at Victoria with minutes to spare. The cabby insisted on seeing me to the carriage. Uh, yes, this is it. I note the reservation. Thank you. I think you'll be an angry to case, sir. Oh, I see you already have luggage. They're on the rack. Is that you? Uh, yes, yes, it was sent in advance. This garage is for me also, see? Ah, I see. I got And, uh, thank you, Cabby. Thank you. Good luck to you, sir. <sighs> You know, I, I don't think you should be in here. Uh, Prego, English, uh, not, not, not... I said, uh... Oh, no, uh, never mind, never mind. Oh, come on, Holmes, you're cutting it fine. On the contrary, Watson, I'm exactly on time. Holmes! I'm sure I didn't imagine I'd attempt to leave England without donning a disguise. An Italian priest is rather effective, don't you? Well, you just see me, all right. Uh, every precaution is necessary even now. Look... Look, Watson, the tall man battling through the crowd. There, that Moriarty himself. He's lost, he's confused. We've done it, Watson, we've got this far at least. Glancing back, I saw a tall man pushing his way through the crowd and waving as though he wished to have the train stopped. It was too late, however. We were clear of the platform and on our way. Holmes threw aside his disguise and packed it away. With all our precautions, you see, we have cut it rather fine. Now, uh, have you seen the morning paper, Watson? No, anything of interest. Uh, well, our rooms at Baker Street were set afire last night. No what? great harm done. No great harm. Oh, Holmes, this is intolerable. Uh, they must have lost track of my movements, otherwise they wouldn't have thought I'd returned to my rooms. Uh, they must have taken to watching you, however. And that's what brought Moriarty to Victoria. You could not have made any slip in coming here? I did exactly what you advised. You found the brougham. Did you recognize the cabby who put you into the carriage? No. It was my brother, Mycroft. Oh, yes. He's also good at disguises. But enough. Now, we must decide what to do. Well, this train's an express. It stops at once in Canterbury. Uh, that would not deter Moriarty. It is possible to hire special trains, you know. They're always at the ready at Victoria, should the price be right. Moriarty will do as I would do if the positions were reversed. He will hire a special and get to the coast within minutes of this train. And there's always a delay of half an hour before the boat sails. He's out to kill us both before we can leave the country. One would think we were criminals on the run, not him. Let's have him arrested on suspicion upon arrival. It would ruin all my work of the last few months. We should get the big fish and allow the whole shoal of agents to dart out of the net. No. No, next week we shall have them all. It's just a question of time. So what do we do? We shall get out at Canterbury. Make a cross journey to New Haven and so over to Vienna. We shall leave our luggage to travel on to Paris and so confuse anyone who misses us. We can pick it up later next week. Meanwhile, we can treat ourselves to a couple of carpet bags and buy all we need for the next few days. We shall be able to make our way very comfortably into Switzerland by Luxembourg and Basel. Well, let's hope it works, Holmes. But what if he anticipates your new moves and heads us up at Canterbury? And if he does catch us up there, it's no doubt that he will attempt murder. But let us not consider that. When we arrive at Canterbury, we shall have another Brexit question to face. Oh, and what's that? Whether to have a premature lunch there or risk the chance of starving before we reach the buffet at New Haven. <laughs> oh, settle back and light your pipe. At least we have a brief respite, haven't we? All worked in our favor. We got to Brussels that same night and spent two days there. Holmes being sure we had not been followed. On the third day, 
we moved on to Strasbourg. On the Monday, Holmes telegraphed to the London police. And at the hotel in the evening, we found a reply awaiting us. Hmm. Damnation, damnation, I might have known it. He's escaped. Moriarty? They've secured the whole gang with the exception of him. He's given them the slip. I really did believe I could have left it to Mycroft and the police, but I was wrong. Uh, look, I really feel you had better return to England, Watson. Why? Because you will find me a most dangerous companion from now on. Moriarty has only one thing left to live for, and that is my death. He will seek me out, and it will be a battle of wits to the end. Look, you must return to your wife in practice and allow me to finish this on my own. Uh, Holmes, after all we've gone through, you must know that I cannot be put off by danger. I insist on staying with you for a few more days at least, just until we see how things turn out. Now, please be reasonable. I don't like it, Watson. I insist that you leave me at once. No, you cannot make me, so I flatly refuse. I shall slip quietly away. You will have no chance of following. The argument continued for some hours. Eventually, we reached a compromise. I would telegraph Mary to say I was continuing to tour Switzerland with Holmes until the end of the week. But regardless of the outcome, I would leave for England on the Friday. And so we journeyed over the Gemi Pass, still deep in snow, and by way of Interlaken to Meringen. There we put up at the Englischer Hof. Our landlord was one Peter Steiler, who welcomed us warmly. This is my wife, Maria, and this is my eldest son, Hans. I am sure you will be most comfortable with us, monsieur. The gentlemen, they are English, Maria, not the French. I know. I know where because I have been the Londoner. I worked for three years at the Grosvenor Hotel. <laughs> years ago, I understand. You will be interested in walking the trips here, Mr. Holmes. And the good doctor, I act as a guide. Ah, uh, yeah, and Goody is too, best guide in these parts. He takes you up to the mountains, over the hamlet of Rosenlaui, and on the way you see the best sight of the whole of the mountains, the falls at Reichenbach. Uh, they must be seen. I take you tomorrow. The weather, it will hold good for two more days only. Well, what do you say, Holmes? Shall we do the trip? Oh, why not? It's best to keep active, is it not? Uh, very well, we shall look forward to it. You leave everything to Hans and me. We will arrange it all. Food, drink, equipment, everything. Not for you to worry about a thing. An early start. That is all I shall require. An early start. And an early start we made. Hans was right. The weather was perfect. Clear blue skies, crisp air, the dainty green of the spring valleys below, and the virgin white of winter above. We had to make a small detour to see the Reichenbach Falls. It is most impressive, awesome sight. The torrent, swollen by melting snow, plunges into a tremendous abyss from which the spray rolls up like dense smoke. A long sweep of green water roaring forever downwards, and the hiss of dense spray being forced up made us quite giddy. It was a place of curious fascination. I found myself unable to drag my eyes away from the unending torrents. We decided to camp in a flat field near the path of the top of the falls. There, we were able to explore for some hours. Hans was just urging us to pack our things to continue the climb when there was a cry from below. Some minutes later, an elderly fellow on a mountain donkey came into view. He hailed us again and drew up Proffering a letter towards us. Oh, what is it, Pier? Oh, this is Pier from the village. Now, in. What is it? Pier is in north. Uh, from the in the, the north. Uh, he tells me to, to bring this here. Uh, the doctor. English doctor. Uh, 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 Watson. Well, I'm Dr. Watson. Uh, yeah. well, what is this? Let me see. Mrs. Brendan C. Marshcock, English lady, wintering at Davos Platz and journeying to Lucerne. Certain privilege have taken her on the way to Lucerne, refusing to have Swiss position. Can you come back at once? <laughs> well, Holmes, an English woman has been taken ill back at the inn and she repressed my help. My dear, you must go back, Watson. How's that to you? Oh, nonsense. Go back to old Pierre. Uh, he'll see you back quickly, now. Huh? Come on to Rosenlauri tomorrow. We will rendezvous at the hamlet there. Of course you must go. You cannot refuse to help a fellow country. Well, yes, if you're sure it's all right. My father, he would not allow this unless it was necessary, Doctor. Do not worry about Mr. Holmes. I shall look after him. Go, and with God's blessings. Until tomorrow then, Watson, and God's you. It was then that I left Holmes and traveled back down the mountain with the old Swiss and his donkey. I felt... 
curiously uneasy. And my unease turned to despair when I reached the inn and Peter Steiler confirmed my worst fears. Well, I... I trust her. She's no worse. Worse? <coughs> Who is it that you say should be worse? What are you doing back here? Now, where's Hans? Well, this, this letter. Did you not write this? Is there no sick English woman here in this hotel? Oh, oh certainly not. And this note has the hotel mark on it. Ah, it must have been written by that tall Englishman who came in after you had gone. Ah, he took coffee in the waiting room. Moriarty. Well, what does all this mean? It means we've been tricked. Holmes is in grave danger and so is your son. We must get help, raise an alarm. Get all the men you can together. A dangerous murderer is at large. Now gather arms and ammunition. We must get back to the Reichenbach Falls with all speed. Hurry, hurry, there's no time for talk. I'll explain on the way, so hurry, man, hurry. He must have broken all records in getting back to those falls. On the way, I tried to explain to Steiler about Professor Moriarty and his murderous intents, but it was impossible. When at last we arrived at the spot where we had camped all those hours earlier, it was becoming dusk. There was no sign of Holmes or young house. There, there, someone near at hand. Help! It is here. It is... It is my hands. Hans! Right. Let me see him. Uh, she's been injured. A, a knife wound, but I, I think you'll be all right. Hans? Hans? You're going to be all right. Holmes. Holmes. And, and the other... The other was the knife. They... They talked. And Holmes, he... He, he wrote... Wrote... Letter... In my pocket. A note from Holmes in your pocket. Yes. Yes, here. Ah, it is for me. I I was was charged with delivering it. They made me leave. I I didn't want to. I came back. They they were fighting. I tried to help and, and the other man he, he he cut at me with a knife. Mr. Holmes, he he fought. I crawled away. It is all right. All right, now. Yes, but Holmes, Moriarty. Hans, where is Holmes? They, they fought near and nearer the edge of the falls. They disappeared with a scream louder than the water. And then over and over and down. So, this is the end of the best and wisest man I have ever met. I returned to England a heartbroken man. There was nothing I could do. Any attempt at recovering the bodies was absolutely hopeless. There, deep down in that dreadful cauldron of swirling water and seething foam, lie for all time the most dangerous criminal and the foremost champion of the law of this generation. My wife, Mary, steadfastly refused to believe Holmes was dead. I, I can't believe it. There must be another explanation, John. After all, no one actually saw him die. Well, listen to this letter, Mary. My dear Watson, I write these words through the courtesy of Professor Moriarty, who waits for our final encounter. I am pleased to think that I shall be able to free society of the further effects of his obnoxious presence, though I fear that it will be at a cost which will give pain to my friends, especially you, my dear Watson. However, I have already explained to you that my career has reached a climax and I am well pleased that this should be its conclusion. Indeed, I make a full confession to you that I anticipated the hopes of the letter forcing you to withdraw and allow me to end it all this way. My brother Mycroft will attend to all my affairs. I made every disposition of my property before leaving England. Give my greetings to your wife, and believe me, to have valued your friendship every minute of every year. Sincerely, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, John. John, it can't be true. It can't be Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. All right, 
John, I'll answer it. Uh, this is a, this is a home of Doctor Doctor Watson. Please to help. Gracious. Come in. These are not surgery hours, but the doctor is in. I'm sure he'll see you. Come in. Come in. Let me help you. John! John, dear, a patient. Please come quickly. Uh, Hurry, dear. Uh, Hurry. I, I, I'm all right. Just to, to sit down. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, good heavens, this man does look in bad shape. On the contrary, Watson, for a man of my years, I have never felt better. Oh, oh it s- can't be. You'll be dead for years. of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, his last star. never been so stunned with surprise in all my life. My wife, Mary, practically fainted. We, we simply couldn't believe our eyes. Although Sherlock Holmes had never been far from my thoughts in the years that followed the tragedy at the Reichenbach Falls, I had come to accept the fact that he had perished, along with his arch enemy, Professor Moriarty, in the dreadful swirling waters of that immense abyss. Yet... Here he was, peeling off yet another of his many disguises, requesting permission to smoke his favorite pipe, sitting on the sofa in my sitting room, as though nothing had happened. He appeared a little older, perhaps a little thinner, but his voice was still incisive and unchanged. The years fell away. I have to apologize, both for this sudden shock and for the great time of silence, but... Both were necessary. But I, I have never believed that you were dead. Not for years. Mary's right. She kept faith longer than I did. <laughs> but I, uh, Holmes, surely the, 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 the chasm, the, the young Swiss Hans, he uh, said I know, you. I know. An explanation is required. It is essential. Well, the facts are these. Hans was mistaken. Moriarty and I did fall from the top ledge of the falls. We fell to the narrow pathway that leads up from that final ledge. Ah, I knew what Moriarty was intent upon. I could see the purpose in his eyes. He had given me permission to write a note of farewell to you before this final encounter. He knew his own game was up. He intended taking me with him to his death. He rushed at me, grappling with me, trying to pin my arms to my sides and take me with him over into the water. Well, I have some knowledge of Japanese baritsu. It stood me in good stead. I slipped through his grasp and applied a throw. He screamed most horribly as he lost his balance. With my head over the brink, I saw him fall a great way. He struck a rock and then disappeared into the foam. But but the tracks. I saw with my own eyes that two men went down the path, but none returned. No. I think my brain has never worked more speedily. Fate had placed a great chance my way. I'd long wished to retire. I knew that for as long as the world had faith in me and I lived in Baker Street, I should never be left in peace. Here was my great opportunity. If I could get out of the falls alive, then I could start a new life. I climbed the face of the cliff. That's impossible. The the face wall is sheer. Uh, Not quite. I decided to attempt it. If I failed, then Moriarty would still win. If I succeeded, I could enjoy a life of retirement. It was by far the hardest climb of my life. At times I imagined I heard Moriarty's voice screaming at me out of the depths. But I managed it. Well, I will not bore you with the details from then on. I took my time before returning to England. There was only one man who knew the truth. My brother, Mycroft. Oh, Holmes. Holmes. Holmes, don't you think that you could have... It wasn't that I didn't trust you and Mary Watson, but I preferred it this way. We would have been bound to have taken up our friendship again... Others would have found out. Mrs. Hudson, Lestrade. I simply could not afford to take that chance. 
I still think... I don't care, John. I don't care. Whatever Mr. Holmes says is all right as far as I'm concerned. I believe him and I stand by him. I will remain silent about all this. Oh, oh so please. I'm so please, don't really know, dear. I don't know if I shall laugh or cry. Oh, no. Do neither, my dear. Why not go and brew us all a good strong pot of tea? I think that will do us all a power of good. Now, excellent suggestion. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes. Perhaps you're right, dear. That is a good idea. What a morning. What a wonderful, wonderful morning. Well, you seem to be well settled, Watson. The years have been kind to you. And Mary is unchanged. Yes, we have a lot to be thankful for. Oh, but now come, Holmes. To, to the second part of your explanation. Why now? Why suddenly, after all this time, have you come back into our lives? Mm, good question. I made sure my retirement was complete. I lived the life of a hermit among my bees and books in a cosy cottage on the South Downs. But, through my craft, the only man who knew of my existence... I've been forced into action again. You see, Watson, this is 1914. And in the summer of this year, war will be declared. The greatest war this world has ever known. A world war. Oh, Holmes, you can't be serious. Well, there are always rumors of war, always quarrels with Ireland, arguments with Germany, disagreements with the French, but an open conflict of never. How oh, I wish you were right. But the Kaiser has already made his plans. You'd be amazed if you knew how riddled this country is with German spies. It is inevitable, Watson. And that's why for some months now I've been engaged in counter-espionage. I can tell you that at this moment two gentlemen are engaged in a most important conversation in the garden of a large mansion just south of the city. One is known as von Bork, a remarkable man, the most devoted of the Kaiser's agents. His companion is Baron von Herling, the chief secretary of the German legation in this country. Now they are putting the finishing touches to a plan that is the Culmination of Von Bork's work over the years. So far, as I can judge, the trend of events, you should be back in Berlin within the week. You will be surprised at the welcome that awaits you. <laughs> Your work in this country is most highly sought of. Oh, the English are easy to deceive. I have achieved everything simply because I am a born sportsman. It is not a pose. I hunt with the English squires. I play polo. <laughs> I match them at it every game. I box against the young army officers and sail against their best yachtsmen. Yeah. What is the result? No one takes me seriously. Quite a decent fellow for a German, you know, old boy. <laughs> <laughs> and all the time in this quiet country house of yours lives the most astute secret service man in Europe. You are a genius, my dear von Bohr. You flatter me, Baron. But I certainly make claims that my four years in this country have not been unproductive. I have never shown you my little store, have I? No. Would you mind stepping this way for a moment? Ah, yes, certainly. After you, Baron. Dankeschön. I must, of course, claim protection from the embassy for the important papers that I shall be taking with me. Oh, naturally. You have already been booked in the embassy entourage. There will be no difficulty for you or your baggage. Of course, it is just possible that none of us will have to go. England may leave France to her fate when we start to march. <laughs> There's no binding treaty between them. As there is a definite treaty with Belgium. England will honor that. England is not ready for war. We are. A special war tax of 50 million has made it possible. But here, as far as essentials go, anti-submarine measures, munition storage, high explosive bombs, nothing is prepared. How then can England come in? We have managed to stir the devil's brew, the Irish question. All England's thoughts are centered at home. She must think of her future. Yes, that is another matter. Mr. John Bull must decide whether to fight with his so-called allies or without them. But fight Germany... She must. This is a week of destiny. But come, you were speaking of your papers. Indeed I was. Here. Uh, uh, oh. There. See, the safe is opened. And here, in neat files. Oh. See, harbor defenses, aeroplanes, Ireland. Egypt, all under their headings. Portsmouth Forts, the Channel, 
Each file is filled with papers and plans. Brilliant. Oh, not bad for the hard-drinking, hard-riding country squire. <laughs> <laughs> but the gem of my collection has yet to come. It will go here under naval signals. But you already have a good dossier here. Oh, out of date and a waste of paper. Somehow the Admiralty got an alarm and the coat has been changed. It I was see. a blow to me. But thanks to my checkbook and the good man Altamont, all will be well tonight. Oh, a pity that I cannot wait. You can imagine that things are in an upheaval at the embassy. We must all be at our post from now on. I had hoped to bring news of your great coup. Did Altamont name no owl? Here, read his telegram. We'll come without fail tonight and bring new sparking plugs. Altamont. The sparking plugs? <laughs> he poses as a motor expert, and I keep a full garage. In code, everything likely to come up is named after a spare part. If he talks of a radiator, it is a battleship. Oh. Of an oil pump, it is a cruiser, <laughs> and so on. Sparking plugs are naval signals. <laughs> you see, this was sent from Portsmouth at midday. Oh, by the way, what do you give him? In this case, 500 pounds. Uh. Greedy rogue. They are useful, these traitors, but I begrudge them their blood money. I grudge Altamont nothing. He has never let me down. I know him well. I assure you, he is not a traitor. Uh, he is a very bitter Irish-American who is filled with intense hatred towards this country. Ah, Irish-American. With full Aryan blood on his mother's side. Uh, must you really go? He should be here at any moment. I regret. I can wait no longer. Then we place these things away, and I will see you off. Uh, thank you. Ah, good. Come. I will walk to the gates with you to say goodbye. I shall call upon you tomorrow with the new, uh, <laughs> sparking plot. <laughs> Rest assured, we shall not fail, Baron. Oh, come in. Yes, Annie. What is it? Have they come? Lights of a car coming up the drive, sir. Must be Mr. Altamont, as you expected. Good, good. Then I go to welcome him. Thank you, Annie. Uh, Tell me, it's all well with you. Well, <laughs> it's great. Terrific. Uh, you're going to give me the glad hand here tonight? Okay. Just wait until I show you. I'm sure bringing home the bacon. <laughs> Come on, bring out the drinks. The show calls for celebration. Mutton, you're right. Uh, good health. Uh, and the signals? Just as I promised. Every last one. Semaphore, lamp code, Marconi. Coffee, mind you, not the original. That'd be too dangerous. But it's the real McCoy. You can lay to that. Well, of course, a copy is better than the original. If an original were missing, they would change the whole thing. Now, let's see. Say, hey, you don't mean to tell me you keep your secret papers in that? And why not? See, a wide-open contraption like that by a Yankee crooked... Be through that with a can opener. It would puzzle any crook to force that safe. Nothing can cut through that metal. It has a double combination lock. You need a word spelt out first and then a set of figures. In this case, it is A U G U S T. August. And then 1914. August 1914. The date the war starts. Hey, come back. All I said, that's real smart. You got a heck of a lot of stuff in there. And it is all going out at once. I am what you would say, shutting up shop tomorrow. Oh, well, I guess that goes for me, too. I'm not staying here on my lonesome. I'd rather watch the fun from the other side of the big pond. But you are an American no, citizen. No difference. Cuts no ice with a British copper. What about Jack James? He's an American citizen. They got him. He's doing time in Portland, ain't he? Incidentally, talking to James, it seems to me you don't do much to cover your men. What do you mean by that? Well, he was his employer. Not so. 
It's up to you to see these guys don't fall down. And when they do fall, do you pick them up? It was James' own fault. He was too self-willed at his job. Ah, he was boneheaded, I'll give you that. But then there was Hollis. Ah, the man was mad. But lose it all in the end, I grant you, but he was proper bugged. And now there's Steiner. Steiner? What about Steiner? Uh, I got him last night. He and his papers are all in Portsmouth jail. You go after Germany, and that poor turf will, will have to stand the racket, and lucky if he gets off with his life. How could they have got to Steiner? This is the worst blow yet. Well, you nearly had a worse one. But I guess they're not too far off me. You don't mean that. Sure do. My landlady down Frattenway had some inquiries made. When I heard that, I guessed it was time for me to hustle. Oh, don't ask me how it's worked. I don't want to know. I know Stein is the fifth man you've lost since I signed on with you. I don't aim to be the sixth. Are you ashamed to see your men go down like this? How dare you speak to if me I like this? tell you the facts, I wouldn't be working for you now, would I? Oh, here's something more straight. I've heard tell that you Germans ain't sorry to see an agent put away once his work is done. How dare you suggest I give away my own agents? Well, there's a stool pigeon somewhere. It's up to you to find out where it is. Huh, I ain't taking no more chances. It's me for Holland and a ship from Rotterdam to little old New York. No other ship in line will be safe in a week's time. So, here's my last assignment. Ah, now, what about the dough? The what? The boodle, the reward, the 500 pounds. Oh, you don't seem to have a very high opinion of my honor. You want some money before you give up that book you've wrapped up. That's about it. It's all here in the book. After all, this is a business proposition. All right. Have it your own way. I will write you a check. Here we are. This should be sufficient. Now place the book down there on the desk. After all, I don't see why I should trust you any more than you trust me. There. There is the check on the table. Now let me examine the contents of your parcel. I claim the right before you take the money. Uh, what? What kind of joke is this? This is the practical handbook of bee culture. Altamont, what kind of... Uh, 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 gently now. Gently. Let the chloroform do its work. That's it. That's it. Another glass, Watson? Or should I say Smith? Don't mind if I do, Governor. <laughs> you know, Holmes, I think this is the first time I've given an impersonation for you. Well, let's hope it'll be the last. And there he is, poor fellow, flat out on his own sofa while we enjoy wine from Franz Joseph's special cellar at the Schoenbrunn Palace. <laughs> oh, do open the window, Watson. The chloroform vapor does not help the palate. And while you're doing so, please touch the bell. Oh, very well, Holmes. Uh, there's little need to hurry, Watson. Just help me pile all this material from Von Bork's safe into this handy valise. Uh, there's no one in the house but the faithful old Annie. You ran, sir. Ah, yes, Annie. You'll be pleased to hear that all is well. Oh, I'm so pleased, sir. Oh, oh dear. He does look bad, don't he? Simply out cold for a short while, Annie. Nothing serious. Oh, he was quite a kind master, sir. Within his rights, of course. He, he actually said he, he would pay for my passage to Germany. Can you imagine me living out there with all them Huns? <laughs> it would hardly be suitable, would it, oh, sir? Hardly. <laughs> Thank you for your help. Now, would you be kind enough to take all these things and place them into my car? Also, telephone to my brother, Mycroft, and report that all is going exactly as planned. Very good, sir. It'll be a pleasure, sir. Are you sure you can handle his nibs? I think so, Annie. I think so. But that will be all. Thank well, you. thank you, sir. Well, Holmes, so far, so good. Uh, you must have been impersonating this American Altamont for some time to have ingratiated yourself so deeply in the favor of von Bork. Uh, it's taken nearly two years and entailed actually living in America... But now I can return to my books and my bees. Ah, here is my magnum opus, my book on bees. I intend to write a second volume, Observations on the Segregation of the Queen. Have you never missed the old life, the catching of ordinary, everyday criminals? Oh, not really. The passing of Moriarty, I rather lost interest. It was only when the Prime Minister himself appealed to me through Mycroft to enter the game again and tackle this gentleman, Von Bork, that I felt any enthusiasm. Von Bork is a superb spy. He matched the English in everything. Yeah. That's why I assumed the role of an Irish-American uh, was persuaded to join his team. 
Since then, I've managed to make most oh. of his plans go subtly wrong. And I've placed five of his top men in prison. Uh, I... I heard that. I heard what you... You said, Altmont. Good. Because you, Herr von Bork, will be the sixth bird in the cage. I shall get level with you, Altmont. If it takes me all my life, I shall get level with you. That was the favorite remark of the late, but far from lamented, Professor Mariotti. Colonel Sebastian Moran was also known to have muttered it. Damn you, Altamont, for a double-dyed traitor! I am no traitor. Neither am I Altamont. Surely my speech now shows you that I am not an American. Altamont of Chicago had no existence, in fact. <laughs> I used him and he's gone. Then, who are you? It's really immaterial to you, Herr von Bork. But I've had dealings with you and your kind. It was I who brought about the separation of Irene Adler and the late King of Bohemia. I also saved from murder Count von Grafenstein, your mother's elder brother. It was I... There is only one man. You are Sherlock Holmes. But but they told me you died years ago. The high command... Uh, It never does to believe the high command. Now, if you'll be so kind, we shall take you to the car and then to Scotland Yard. You are not the police. You have no right under British law to threaten me and abduct me. You are kidnapping a German citizen and stealing his private papers. They will reject you. I will take that chance. Now, come. Watson, take the papers. I on board. Come. No point in resisting now. This is the end. No, no. Stay there. You are uh, the Almighty Sherlock Holmes. You chloroformed me, dragged me down here, and forgot to even see if I was armed. The revolver, my German service revolver, left in my inner pocket. Well, this is the end. <laughs> Yes. Yes, I think so. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not used to these high histrionics, Holmes. Uh, neither am I, but I had to make him think he was winning. I had to make him think that I was stupid enough not to check the revolver and replace the bullets with blanks. <laughs> yes, the only way I could let him escape with confidence. Now, ah, listen, there he goes. That's his car, not mine. Mine has a special geared-up engine, racing quality. Now, come on, Watson. This is the last time. My final bow... Now, let's get after him. He's the only one who can involve the Baron and lead us to the rest of the conspiracy. Holmes took the wheel of the motor car. And as we raced up the country lanes and out into the well-made roads, I pondered yet again on this strange twist to the autumn of our lives. Gone were the handsome cabs. Taxis were now replacing them. There were even motor buses, and the horse bus was fast disappearing. The underground railway tunneled its way under our very feet. What lay ahead? The hideous cruelty of a modern war with trenches and shelling, bayonet fighting, and even war in the air. It seemed that a curse of the Almighty hung heavy over a degenerate world. And there was a feeling of doom in the sultry and stagnant air. Holmes dragged me back to earth. There. There, look ahead. That's where Von Bork has left the car. He's rushed into the building. The lights are on. That means they can suspect nothing. Come, Watson. I'm careful now. The net closes for the last time. Careful. You are sure this is the truth, von Bork? I am sure. Baron von Herling will vouch safe for every word. Of course. We are lucky to have discovered the truth in good time. And we are assured that this Sherlock Holmes and his colleague are dead. I shot them myself. But he must act swiftly. He must cancel all previous plans. Our information is false. If we act upon it... If we act upon it, the German war machine will start at a tremendous disadvantage. Herr Conrad, you must know as leader of the espionage unit in this country that Van Bork would never go to these lengths unless it were true. He must act now. I agree. The whole of our network is in jeopardy. I therefore disband this organization... You will all go your own ways, making for the fatherland with as much information as you can take. Oh, I well, Watson, my true friend, let us stand here on the terrace for a few minutes. This may be the last quiet talk we shall ever have. I know. It saddens me, Holmes. I remember so much of the past. How many cases, the rooms at 221B Baker Street... Dear Mrs. Hudson and those precious breakfasts. Mm, best meals of the day. The pipes we smoke before the fire, the fogs, the endless journeys and handsome cabs. The arguments with the trade, The agony columns in the newspapers. Oh dear, is it really over? Yes, it's over. The whole era is over. But we've ended it effectively as far as you and I are concerned. 
We have beaten the most ruthless spy organization this country has ever known. It won't prevent the war that is upon us, but after the war, perhaps because of our small efforts, a cleaner, better, stronger land will lie in the sunshine after the storm has cleared. Let us hope so, Watson. Let us hope so. For five years, Graham Armitage has played Sherlock Holmes and Kerry Jordan has taken the part of Dr. Watson. And the series was written and produced by Dennis Falvig. Uh, now, Watson, let me see if I can hit the target with ease. <coughs> oh, yes, good shot, Holmes. Yes, but I can't understand for the life of me why you wish to bring a leg of mutton out here into the park in order to shoot at it with a bow and arrow. You know, you've done some bizarre things in your time, but never anything as bizarre as this. But why not use an ordinary bullseye target? Now, come with me, Watson. You'll see. Yes. Now, you will observe that I've shot the meat cleanly in the center. The shaft of the arrow is deeply embedded. The arrowhead sticking out the other side. Now, just try and remove the arrow, will you, Watson? I think you'll understand my slight experiment. We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Crouch End Mystery. Over the years, I'd grown used to Sherlock Holmes' strange ways. I'd learned that he never did anything without a good reason. All the same, I was quite amazed one early morning in the month of May, 1893, to be asked to accompany him to Regent's Park where he quietly indulged in an archery practice. I knew he was a keen toxophilite, but could not understand why he should practice on a large leg of mutton. It, it, it didn't make sense. Well, try to extract the arrow, Watson. You're a strong man. Mm, very well. Anything to humor you, Holmes. Well, I must admit, it's extremely hard. I'm fine. Can't pull the arrow out. Right. Now, try pushing the arrow through and pulling from the other side. Ah, uh, yes, it's considerably easier. It comes through quite cleanly. The feather flight gives no trouble. Exactly. Now, observe the marks that it's left, small and round. Now, as a medical man, would you not say that this could be a bullet wound? The bullet passing right through the limb? Yes, I, uh, I suppose it could. Yes, I suppose so. Good. And that's why I've conducted this small experiment. We can go home for breakfast now, Watson. <laughs> Very well. A strange way to start the day. Yes, and I fancy there'll be stranger things to follow. It all has to do with the mystery down at Burnham on Crouch, of course. Well, come, let's leave before we start attracting attention. Uh, this way. Well, come this way. Oh, sounds like a visitor, Holmes. You expecting anyone? Well, I think it'll be Carter of Scotland Yard. He's engaged upon the Burnham on Crouch case. I've been advised that he wishes to consult me. Uh, Mr. Carter, sir, says he has an appointment. Oh, very good, Mrs. Hudson. Show him in, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, do come and join us. Just a light breakfast. Uh, thank you, but I've already had an early meal at the hotel where I stayed overnight. I came up town from Burnham on Crouch to report to Scotland Yard, but thought I'd like a word with you first. And what have you to report? Total failure, I'm afraid. I'd hoped to impress Inspector Lestrade, but I've got nowhere. You've been informed of the case, Mr. Holmes. I've read all the available evidence, including the report of the inquest, very carefully. Uh, I believe there was a tobacco pouch found near the body. Did that tell you anything? Mm -hmm. It belonged to the dead man, sir. The initials were stamped on it. It was made of ostrich leather, and that fits. Mm. He lived at Oatswan in the Cape, South Africa, for many years. He was a heavy smoker? Uh, not according to his wife. We couldn't find a pipe, for instance. Hmm. Odd. I only mentioned the pouch because that seems the only tangible piece of evidence so far. Is uh, this a new case of murder, Holmes? Oh, I do beg your pardon, Watson. I'd forgotten that you know little of this. Uh, take some coffee, Carter, and go over the case for us. I should be none the worse for hearing the sequence of events once more. Just give me the essentials. 
Very well. <clears throat> I have my notes here. Now, uh, yes. This is the rough career of one Nathan Savage, born about 50 years ago and lived the life of an adventurer. Worked an ostrich farm in South Africa and prospected for gold out there. Made and lost several fortunes. Yes, about five years ago, he retired to Burnham on Crouch to an estate called Crouch End, where he lived with his wife. He died in mysterious circumstances a few days ago in the grounds of his home. An absolute enigma. At times, strict and puritanical towards his wife and others, and other times, a drunkard who had the power of evil in him. An extremely unbalanced and dangerous man. Quite. He was feared by everyone. Known on the gold fields as Mad Nat Savage and lived up to the name. At Crouch End, he was loathed and avoided by the local people. He lived the life of a recluse. He had a small one-roomed cottage built by the stream in his garden. And no one, not even his wife, was allowed to enter it. It was his hideaway and furnished with the uh, personal effects of all his travels. The curtains were always kept closed. He had no visitors. Savage lived alone there. Yet at the inquest, Bob Leggett, a local farmer... Gave one of the few positive bits of evidence we have to go on. He said... Oh, it were about one o'clock in the morning. I'd been up attending a sick cow and I took a shortcut along the back lane to my home. Oh, you can see that hideaway cottage from the lane and there was a light on. I saw shadows across the curtains. Uh, Madnet weren't alone. There were another man in there with him. I could see the outlines of them very clear. The other fellow were bearded. And they were arguing something terrible. Oh, but that were on the Monday. Savage didn't get himself killed until Wednesday, so I suppose it don't mean much. But he did have a visitor with him on Monday night, and that's a fact. All the same, it might be significant. Don't you agree, Mr. Holmes? Every detail, however unimportant, is significant. An unknown visitor to a forbidden spot is most interesting. But uh, do continue. Hmm. Well, um, come the Wednesday, Savage went into one of his blackest moods. His wife, Grace, told the court about it in the frankest manner. She said, I knew those moods. He was a drunken, wild beast who roamed the grounds of the house looking for trouble. I locked myself in the upstairs room all day. At night, I came down to get food. I could see the lightless cottage. It was quiet. I thought he was in a drunken sleep. I went to bed and locked the door. At about two in the morning, I heard terrible yelling. Oh, I did the sensible thing. Pulled the blankets over my head and tried to ignore it all. Early the next morning, I went out. The door to the cottage was open. I went down the path towards the stream, and well, there, by the wooden bridge, he, he was lying on his back. I thought he was still drunk until, well, till I saw the, the blood on his chest. I just turned and ran, raised the alarm, called the police, and, well, that's all I know. I swear to you, that's all I know. I was called in. I inspected the grounds and the cottage. <laughs> Never been in such a strange place, filled with trophies, books, maps, and a clutter of bottles. <laughs> Smelt to high heaven. Flies all over the bed. Horrible. Yes, it must have been. But you haven't yet told us how this man Savage died. Well, I'm coming to that. It's baffling. For it seems that there was a bullet wound went right through his chest under the heart, but no bullet. Just a small hole. And no one heard shooting. Police surgeon says he'd never seen anything like it. Hmm. Yes, so he was shot by a bow and arrow, Carter. Now you see the reason for my morning exercise in the park, Watson. Bow and arrow? How could he be sure of this, Holmes? Well, I can't. Until I viewed the body and visited the scene of the crime. But from the nature of the wound, I thought it the only possible explanation. But there was no arrow found. Yeah, well, there couldn't be if the murderer wished to cover his tracks. Now, may I make a suggestion? By all means, Mr. Holmes. Well, then I propose that you do whatever reporting you have to do to Scotland Yard, and we catch the 12.30 train to Burnham on Crouch. If I remember, such a train has a dining car... Shall we risk the Eastern Line's luncheon? What do you say, Watson? Can you manage that? Oh, and we'd better take overnight bags, just in case. As usual, I could not refuse a trip with Sherlock Holmes. And after an hour or so's hasty rearrangement of my affairs, I was at the station in time to join him and Carter on the journey. It was uneventful and quite pleasant. We took a carriage from the station to Crouch End, where we met the widow of the dead man. She was a hard-looking woman, but quite charming and was soon telling us of the years of hardship and ill usage which he had endured. My husband created havoc wherever he went, Mr. Holmes. Towards the end, everything he touched seemed to turn evil. I do confess, if I have any feelings left, there, there's a relief rather than sorrow. Uh, I've said it. I've nothing to add. Just one question before we ask to see your husband's hideaway cottage. 
I understand there was a large knife found near the body. Have you identified it as belonging to your husband? Indeed, I have. What he was doing with it out there, I cannot say. He must have intended using it on someone. But he was stopped in time, thank heavens. Perhaps he was killed in self-defense. Who knows? Yes, who knows? But it's our duty to find out. Now, Carter, will you be good enough to lead the way to the cottage? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Savage. The cottage was, as Carter described, filthy and incredibly neglected. I could tell that from outside. Carter was about to insert the key into the door when he stopped. Hello. Someone has been tampering with the lock. Someone has been trying to force this window. Whoever it was fails to gain entry. Yes, well, open up, Carter. Yeah, nothing has been touched, I take it? Not since I was here, Art. Oh, good. I shall take the best part of an hour to examine this place. And I must go over the grounds, particularly to the spot where the body was found before dark. Yes, it'll take longer than I thought. Perhaps you can find an inn nearby where we can rest for an hour or two. I'm afraid we shall have to stay over, Watson. If someone tried to break in here last night, then the odds are that he or she will have another attempt this evening. I think we must be here to receive the intruder, don't you think? I'm agreeable to any plans you make, Holmes. Good, then please leave me. I prefer to work on places like this alone. Uh, give me an hour, just one hour, that's all. Thank you, Carter. It took well over the allotted hour to complete his examination of the hideaway cottage and the surrounding grounds. He even ventured into the neighboring fields and appeared well pleased to discover it hadn't rained in those parts for some weeks. And the set of horse and cart tracks that led to a small copse were fresh and clear cut. We then paid a visit to the local mortuary and inspected the body of Mad Nat Savage. I'm used to seeing death, but it wasn't a pleasant visit. And I found myself agreeing with Holmes regarding the cause of death. By the time we got to the Hare and Hounds Inn, it was quite dark. We had a short rest, and then, fortified by an excellent home-cooked supper, we journeyed back to Crutchend Estates, where Carter was anxiously waiting for us. <laughs> Thought you weren't coming back, Mr. Holmes. I'd been here for eight. Good. Then you must know that no one has yet arrived and tried to enter the cottage. No, no, no at all. No, well, that's good. Now well, we better settle down. It may be a long wait. It was some hour and a half later, as I was nodding off, my back against a large oak tree that Holmes touched me lightly upon the shoulder. Someone was moving about along the wall of the cottage. There was a silence, a step in the gravel, and some metallic scraping. The lock of the door was forced. It opened. A match was struck. A candle lit. Holmes motioned for Carter and me to follow. The man inside the cottage was young and slender. He commenced a search amongst the books. Having found one, he returned to the light and began paging through it, then sighed and snapped the book closed. Carter stepped forward and took command. Stay where you are. What? Don't move. Where are the police? What? Oh, I should have known you'd still be watching this place. I suppose you now imagine I'm connected in some way with the death of Nathan Savage. I assure you, I am quite innocent. Well, that's first to decide. Let's start with your full name. Nigel Sykes. I see. Initials N.S. And what may I ask are you doing here? Oh, is this a casual conversation or an interrogation? It's a police investigation. Then perhaps I'd better wait until I can have a lawyer present. If you are innocent, it would be better to speak up without fear of the consequences. Oh, very well. Did you ever hear of Hewitt and Sykes, the West Country bankers? No, never. Yes. They failed for half a million pounds years ago. To the ruination of many wealthy families in Devon and Cornwall, is that right? True. Sykes was my father. Ah, interesting. Pray continue. Yeah, but keep it short and straight. Well, I was a boy at the time, but I always believed in my dad. I never believed that he stole the securities, like everyone else. He swore he could turn them to good use, and every creditor would be paid in full. He left us a list of the securities he had taken, and swore he would come back once his honor had been cleared. He left by sea for South Africa, and no one ever saw or heard from him again. We believed the securities were lost with him at sea. Then a short while ago, I discovered, through a business friend, that some of the securities had come onto the London market. I spent months trying to trace them. I discovered the original seller was a Mr. Nathan Savage, the owner of Crouch End. I had to find out what he knew of my father. But before we could meet, he met his death by someone else's hands. I attended the inquest. There was mention of logbooks, diaries here in this hideaway cottage of his. And you tried to get in here last night. You failed. You've tried again now, and you still haven't found what you wanted. Is that not so? There is an old diary here. The pages dealing with the time of my father's disappearance have been ripped out. Mad Nat Savage covered his tracks well. That's the truth. I have nothing else to add. 
I've told you the whole truth. I never even spoke to Nat Savage, and I know nothing of his murder. Is that so? Then how do you account for this? A tobacco pouch for the initials N.S. Not Nat Savage, as we'd first thought, but Nigel Sykes. Well, well where did you get that from? I thought I... You I... dropped it near the body, Mr. Sykes. I think you'd better not say any more. Take your own advice and wait for a proper lawyer. Not that I think he will be able to get you out of this in a hurry. Well, I think it's been a good night's work. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Shall you return to London in the morning? We did not return to London the next morning. For in spite of the lateness of our going to bed, Holmes was up at dawn. And having borrowed a bicycle from the landlord of the Hare and Hounds, seemed to have travelled over a large area of Burnham and Southminster. He joined me for a hearty breakfast. Oh, Watson, what do you think of things? Well, you've been up to something, Holmes, I can tell, but you're not at all satisfied with Carter's conclusions, are you? I'm disappointed in that young man. I'd hoped for better things from him. One of the first rules of criminal investigation is never to accept the obvious as the end result. You have an alternative to the arrest of Nigel Sykes? Of course. Ah, here is Carter himself. Now we shall hear the latest news. Uh, well, Carter, have you extracted a confession from young Sykes? No, not yet. But he will talk sooner or later. He faces a full-scale interrogation at the yard this afternoon. Ah, and we shall have to conclude the case before that. Neither Watson nor I can afford to be away from Baker Street longer than lunchtime. <laughs> What does that mean, Mr. Holmes? Well, simply that you've got the wrong man, Carter. What? Just look at certain facts. Young Sykes is simply not the type who would have defied Nat Savage. He cannot have been the man heard to be arguing with Savage in the cottage two nights before he was killed. Sykes is clean-shaven. The man we're after has a beard. You may still be after a murderer who uses a gun and kills with a bullet. I'm convinced the man is an expert archer. Now ask yourself, who carries a bow and arrow around with him these days? <laughs> Blessed if I know. No one. Well, that's why your theory is so implausible. No, not at all. The art of archery is to kill swiftly and silently. In other words, to hunt. And hunt without being heard. Oh, it still doesn't make sense to me. Look, Mr. Holmes, if you've got something up your sleeve, then don't hide it. Let's have it straight. No, you can have it straight, as you call it. In exactly one hour, Carter. All you have to do is to conceal yourself in the loft of the stables of this inn at 11 o'clock. What you see and hear will surprise you, I have no doubt. Oh, and make sure that there are armed men at your disposal, won't you? We shall all feel very much more secure. Uh, will you excuse me now? I have messages to send off from the post office. The fast tables at the back in one hour. And this time, I don't think we shall have to wait all that long before arresting the right man. You asked me to come here. I had never have taken this risk. Oh, I didn't send for you. You sent for me. But this is ridiculous. I, I'm your note here with me. I sent no note, I tell you. Then what, what does... She almost discovered something. It's a trap. Come on, let's get away from here. Quickly, quickly now, quickly. Move yes. if I were you. There are what? men surrounding the stables and up there in the loft. Oh, what the devil? Get out of my way. Call him, Watson. Carter, call your men. Bar the door. Oh, here you are, both of you. There's no way out. What? I demand to know the reason for this. We'll give you every reason if you can explain your relationship with Mrs. Savage. Just what is your name, sir? Find out. His name is Dylan Drew. He was no partner of Nat Savage's long ago in South Africa. Before Savage married Grace and came back to this country. Isn't that so, Drew? You are the man who befriended Nigel Sykes' father and made an enemy out of Savage. You are the bearded man who dogged Savage for weeks and then cold-bloodedly murdered him. No, no, it wasn't like that. He did it to save me. Dylan killed Nat when he saw he was about to attack me with that hunting knife. He was mad with drink and accused me of betraying him. I'm the one that would have been dead if Dylan hadn't shot him. Shot him with a bow and arrow, correct? <laughs> well, you seem to have it all worked out, mister. Yes, that's how I killed Mad Nat. I didn't murder him. I killed him. Grace is right. I did it just in time. Someone should have done it years ago. He was evil all the way through. There were the three of us back in the old days. Nat Savage, Tom Sykes, and me. Sykes had securities and was about to make a great deal of money from them out in South Africa. Then he uh, disappeared. 
I found out later that Mad Nat had stolen all his possessions and had him killed. I got proof of that eventually by tearing pages out of Nat's diary. I kept them. Nat disappeared, then I started the long search after him. You knew he'd come back to England and buried himself somewhere in the country. Might I suggest that you aspired to the life of a gypsy, travelling by horse and caravan through the southern counties, earning a living as a tinker and poaching game and fowl by the use of a bow and arrow. Old-fashioned, but extremely effective. <laughs> you have it all worked out like I say, yes. That's about it. Then I found him here. It was an old score I had to settle. I, I tried to squeeze money out of him. Threatened to expose him for what he was, a cheat and a murderer. He promised payment, but I, I knew he wasn't to be trusted. I rested my caravan in a nearby clearing in the woods and watched him night and day. Then he went wild, got drunk and ran berserk. Grace heard him, came down and tried to calm him. He went after her with a knife. As he chased her across the bridge, she stumbled. He was standing in a patch of moonlight as he raised the knife to strike. I took aim. I couldn't miss. It, it's exactly as he said. I was about to be killed. Uh, I pushed the arrow right through him. Washed it clean in a stream. Strange. It was over so quickly, and he hardly made a sound. We agreed to leave the body to be discovered later. It gave me good time to get myself and the caravan out of the district. We agreed not to meet for some time until the scandal had all died down and... And I reckon we'd have got away with it if it hadn't been for this trick of forcing us together. How did you manage to trace me? Put all this together? Elementary. You left clear tracks of your horse-drawn caravan. If you were implicated, you would not take the chance of remaining alone for long. You thought you'd find safety in numbers, so you joined up with a camp of genuine gypsies. They're outside Southminster at this very moment. I traced them. I made inquiries about you and left a note that I was sure would bring you back here. I sent a similar message to Mrs. Savage. It was the only way I could effectively get a confession out of you. Yes, I think the rest is up to you, Carter. I'm sure you'll handle it without further help from me. Well, shall we go, Watson? We can catch that lunchtime train as planned. We did catch the train and in plenty of time. Once again, I sat back in my seat and pondered over Holmes' extraordinary ability to piece facts together from starting at the right places. It was the nature of the wound that intrigued me, Watson. Once I was sure it was a bow and arrow that was used, I naturally had to look for the sort of man who could use that weapon. It had to be an old-timer, not a youngster like Nigel Sykes. Yes. But Holmes, there's still that wretched tobacco pouch. Ah, Sykes will have a bit of explaining to do there. You see, he did go to Crouch End on the night of the murder. And he found the body. His were the screams that people heard in the dead of the night. Unfortunately, he dropped the pouch. If we hadn't traced Dylan Drew, that might have landed him in the dock. As it is... Well, one wonders just what he'll do and what's left of his father's securities. Interesting speculation. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the Lulworth Cove mystery.
The summer of 1895 was a particularly hot one by English standards. Well over 80 in the shade for weeks on end, or so it seemed. I found it particularly trying, for I was aware that most of my patients were feeling the effects of the heat. Those with serious complaints were enfeebled by long hours of perspiring in bed, and others had their minor troubles aggravated by the bad tempers of their families. I was fairly irritable myself when one day I returned to Baker Street to find Holmes sharing a cool jug of lemonade with a young gentleman I'd not met before. Ah, Watson, come in, my dear fellow. You must be exhausted. Put your feet up. Have a glass of cold lemonade. Meet young Inspector Gavin. Oh, how do you do, Inspector? It's a great pleasure to meet you, Dr. Watson. I've heard so much about you. Of course. Gavin is from Dorset. I knew his father. He was at Scotland Yard, and Gavin's determined to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> a long way to go yet, Mr. Holmes. I've only just been made inspector, and to trust my luck, I've been landed with an almost impossible task. Yes, you were just about to tell me about it when Watson arrived. Take the lemonade, Watson. It really is most refreshing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ah, this is... I do speak freely in front of Watson. He's been by my side through more cases than I care to remember. Now tell us, what is it that's troubling you? Well, uh, as you know, I'm attached to headquarters in Dorchester, and we receive reports of all cases that happen along the coast of Dorset. Recently, our attention has been drawn to a series of fires at Lulworth Cove. Actually, it's a fairly small, closed community. There are a string of summer cottages that are shut up during the winter months and open up on holidays and during the summer by their owners or guests who rent them. Well, about a year ago, one of these summer cottages was burned to the ground. No one was able to find a specific cause for the fire. In the end... It was thought that a tramp had broken into the place and somehow caused the blaze. Is that what the owner thought? Did he claim insurance? Yes, it was a very modest amount. Algernon Francis was the owner's name. He moved some of the rescued furniture neighbours had managed to get out of the fire into a nearby house and decided to live there until he could rebuild on the previous site. But this fire was only the first of a shocking series. Several more houses along the coastline were altogether or partially destroyed, including Algernon Francis' temporary home. Mm, that's most interesting. Pray continue. Oh, naturally, the local people were up in arms, and particularly when they thought that they had found a reason for the fires. You know better than I do, Mr. Holmes, that the place to pick up gossip is in the local pub. And the local pub at Lulworth Cove is the Seagull's Nest. A meeting extraordinary was held there, presided over by Mr. William Spaulding, a middle-aged bachelor who lives alone in his family home on the cliffs and, being of independent means, gives most of his time to civic and philanthropic enterprises. He had the full support of the locals. <coughs> it must be clear to everyone that all of these fires cannot have been caused by accident. Ah, you're right, sir. Yes, very clear. Uh, the incidents are assuming the proportions of a social disaster. Why are these fires occurring? It must be the work of a single person or a select number of people. But there is another reason for setting fire to a house. It can't be insurance, as it applies to too many owners and their insurance companies. If it's the work of a madman, then it don't need no reason, do it? Yeah. But there is evidence that certain items of value have not been found after the fire. Articles of value, paintings, furniture and family silver have not been recovered. Now, supposing the fires were simply a cover-up for important burglaries, how about that? We must take prompt measures against any repetition of these dastardly crimes. I suggest a citizen's emergency committee, uh, uh, guards to be posted at various points, a uh, uh, patrol system in direct touch with the police. Uh, splendid idea. Spalding must be the chairman of the committee, of course. I second that. Let's form the committee straight away. I don't mind. I don't mind. So, Spalding was elected and immediately made application to Dorchester for help. I was sent down and made inquiries. But quite honestly, Mr. Holmes, I'm baffled. Nothing else has happened. By that, I mean that there have been no new fires. But the place has turned into a village of suspicion. Neighbor is turning against neighbor, friend against friend. It's becoming a place of locked doors, drawn curtains, and whispered suspicion. Yes, I can understand that. The fact is that I am now known in the district. <laughs> Wherever I go, people are so cautious that I can get nowhere. I was wondering if uh, you and Dr. Watson wouldn't consider taking a few days off and coming down to Dorset. 
You could stay at the seagull's nest and, well, perhaps pick up a few clues that may help me. I, I'm anxious to prove myself for this case. Anything you advise will be of great value. Well, I do admit that the problem is an intriguing one. Naturally, you feel the pyromaniac is a local man. Yeah, I, uh, I beg your pardon. The pyromaniac, the person who causes fires, the uh, arsonist. Uh, oh, oh, yes, uh, uh, must be local. Otherwise, uh, how would he know what was the value in these houses? Right. Well, Watson, what do you say? Well, I'd very much like a few days off down by the sea, especially to get out of London in this heat. I shan't have much to attend to over the weekend. Yes, I'm all for it. That's good. Then our answer is yes. We shall be delighted to stay at the Seagull's Nest if we can get in there. Oh, I'll see to that. I'll have a word with Adam Geary. He's the landlord. Nice enough old fellow, but crippled with rheumatism and gets about in a wheelchair. His daughter is Anne Geary, who's a tower of strength in the community. And there is a, a third member of the household in that pub. His name is Pat Boyce. And uh, I'm very much afraid that he's the fly in the ointment, as it were. Well, in what way? Well, I suppose every English country village is supposed to have one. He's a bit uh, simple-like, weak in the head, the village idiot. He can't speak all that well. It never makes much sense. The Anne can look after him, and she can get things out of him, but no one else can. Of course, you can imagine that lots of the locals think he is the cause of all the trouble. The uh, pyromaniac, as you call him. Do you think that, Captain? Uh, no. No, I, I don't. But, well, you come down and make up your own mind, Mr. Holmes. Shall I make a definite booking for you? Two days later, we were down in Lulworth Cove, Dorset. The weather was still hot and the skies cloudless. But the sea breezes were wonderful. And the gull's nest, a most entrancing old inn. Adam Geary and his daughter Anne made us most welcome. And, of course... It wasn't long before the mystery of the outbreak of the fires was discussed. Uh, all is quiet at the moment, of course, but uh, well, there's many who think it's just a lull before the storm. Oh, no, Dad, that's no way to think about it. Rather say that the precautions that we've been taking have had the desired effect. Mr. Spalding has done a wonderful job of the organization. Every citizen who belongs knows exactly where he or she has got to be when they go on duty. I'm sure it's having the desired effect. Uh, but if this man who caused the fires is in some way mentally unbalanced, then surely he must be apprehended, regardless of whether there are more outbreaks or not. Ah, that's what I say. That's the work of the police. We're just protecting our own homes. And perhaps it'll stop now. Well, damage has still been done. Well, imagine what it would be like if this pub were to catch fire. Me in this stern wheelchair, unable to get out. Oh, no, no, that's myself. enough, Dad. Why must you always look on the black side? Oh, have you had sufficient, Mr. Holmes? Dr. Watson? If so, then I'll be clearing away. Oh, would you like another helping? Oh, an excellent supper. Thank you. No, no, for me. Hey? Thank you. It was spent. Oh, my God, you darling boy. How many times I told you not to burst into a private parlour like that, eh? Sorry, I... Oh, oh, no, calm down, Captain. Be quiet now. Don't try to speak. Oh, just be quiet. That's it. Now, these are two new guests staying here at the inn. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and this is Dr. Watson. Now, you will smile and touch your cap whenever you see them. You do so now. Good evening, Patrick. Good evening. Oh, get him out of here, Anne. You're embarrassing our guests. Get him out. Please, please, not at all. As a medical man, I'm used to dealing with all kinds of people like this. The main thing is that these people are, are not to be frightened. Now, just ask him to sit down. Oh, how well, very pleased I am to hear you say that, Dr. Watson. The people here don't understand, Pat. They think because he's slow that he doesn't understand. But he's brighter than anyone thinks. Oh, oh, oh. Now sit down, Patrick. If there's anything to tell me, you'll do so better if you sit quietly first. Oh, gracious. Now what? Please, not a fire. Adam, Anne, come on, there's another fire. The oh, cottage no. up on the far side of the cove. Oh. The light all over. Come on, everyone. Oh. Get every hand on the I can hardly describe the scene near the beach at Lulworth Cove. By the time we reached the burning cottage, half the local population was there. The fire had got a good hold, but a bucket chain was formed, and it was soon brought under control. Men rushed to and fro, helping to salvage furniture and valuables from the rooms. Eventually, the fire brigade moved us all away, and tired and exhausted, our clothes and bodies covered with ash and water, we realized our task was over. Holmes was able to ask a few questions. Anyone know who raised the alarm, the first to see the flames? I did. I can see the place clear enough from my cottage across there. First, I thought it was the sunset reflected in the windows. 
Then I realized it was a fire inside the front room. I came on over to confirm this. There was no one about? You didn't see anyone. Uh, then that young simpleton Pat Royce came down from behind the cliff. I sent him to raise the alarm in the main village while I got the neighbors out. We've been working like slaves ever since. Who does the place belong to? Oh, a friend of mine, Major Higgins. He's away up north at the moment. I'll have to send him a wire first thing in the morning. Oh, it's a sorry mess. No mistake. I agree. You've done an excellent job of work. What is your name, by the way? Hall. Alex Hall. Well, perhaps you'd like to call in at the Seagull's Rest for a pint of beer, Mr. Hall. I'd be very pleased to send you a drink. Mm, and I'd be very pleased to accept one. Give me half an hour to clean myself up and I'll be over. The bar trade at the Seagull's Nest was extremely busy that evening. So much so that when Inspector Gavin arrived, Holmes suggested that a handful of us retire to the small private parlour, taking our beers with us. It was there that the questioning continued. I take it that quite a lot of Major Higgins' furniture and valuables have been saved. Yes, thank goodness. Poor man. Only been away a couple of days. It was well planned, all right. No one on duty at that time in the afternoon. Oh, wicked shame. Something's got to be done. You seem to be making no progress at all, Inspector. We're supposed to be here with me in my wheelchair. We're doing to our and... best, Mr. Mm. Gillian. That's right. That's enough of that, Dad. Let's concentrate upon what has happened, not what might happen. The thing is that I know now that it's definitely a planned fire to cover for a robbery. How do you know that, Mr. Holmes? Because I know the Major's house. I know that he has a large grandfather clock in his sitting room. Well, I was one of the first to get into the place when the fire started. The clock wasn't there. It had been stolen before the place was set alight. Mm. Well, that's a valuable clue. You're sure of this? Of course I'm sure. It has the most distinctive chime. A very fine piece of work. And it wasn't there. That's most interesting. I imagine the grandfather clock is not an easy thing to steal. Ah, Mr. Spaulding, do come in. I uh, heard you all gathered here. I, I feel it's my duty as chairman of the Citizens Emergency Committee to demand that you question the boy, Pat Royce, Inspector. Pat? What for? Well, it's clear that he's involved in some way. He's, he's always around on the scene of these fires before anyone else. You know, the poor lad is soft in the head and... Uh, Probably doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, Dr. Watson here is a medical man, and he will bear me out when I say that many deranged people are fascinated by fire. It's a known fact. Well, I don't know that I can agree with that, Mr. And I most certainly cannot. I'm surprised at you, William. I really am. Just because Pat's back wouldn't can't answer for himself, you naturally pick on him. It's grossly unfair. Now, Annie, we must face facts. We really must. Oh, it's no use, Inspector, trying to get the news out of Pat. You know how frightened he gets. The fire has scared him. He won't be able to talk, even to me, for some time. If there's any questions to do, I think I should do it. But please don't disturb him tonight. Well, it's up to you, Inspector. But the folk in these parts have had enough. If they do find the person responsible, then I, I won't answer for their actions. There could be a lynching. Tempers of that high. There will be nothing of the kind. And I refuse to be pushed into making irresponsible accusations. I shall conduct this investigation in my own way. Methodically and as thoroughly as possible. It will mean personal interviews with everyone concerned, alone. I think mass meetings only stir up hysteria. Now, having said that, I should like to start with you, Miss Geary. Will everyone else please return to the bar? I shall call you all in turn. You and Dr. Watson will stay, won't you, Mr. Holmes? And so the questioning continued in a more reasonable manner. The inspector interviewed some dozen of the local people who lived near the scene of the latest fire. Holmes listened intently, sprawled in a chair by the open window, his head upon his chest and long fingers pressed together. He made no comment and eventually retired for the night in a somber mood. I found it hard to sleep, and when I did, my mind was filled with the sight of flames and the smell of burning timber. Morning dawned crisp and clean, and Anne Geary served us an excellent breakfast. I've been talking to young Pat, Mr. Holmes. He's in a rare state. Couldn't get much out of him. But he says he saw someone leaving Major Higgins' garden just before that fire started yesterday. Ah, that's most interesting. Were you able to get an identification from the lad? Not yet. He goes all to pieces when he tries to explain. It takes ages for him to calm down. But I'll, I'll try and have a good long talk to him later. I'll take him to church. He likes church. Has a soothing effect upon him. Oh, he isn't at all a violent boy. I'm sure he didn't start the fire. You don't believe he did? Do you, do you, Miss Holmes? No. No, I'm quite sure that he didn't. Oh, thank goodness for that. Well, I'll be getting a bit more work. 
I'll talk to Pat after church. And I'm sure I can get him to give me a description of the man he saw. Would you like another pot of tea? Holmes and I spent a pleasant morning walking along the seashore. As we returned, we passed the church and noticed Anne Geary talking to a group of her friends. Pat Boyce, neatly dressed, stood respectfully to one side. Later, they walked off in opposite directions. Anne wasn't present at lunch. And it was late afternoon, while we were smoking our pipes in the back garden of the inn, before we saw Pat Boyce again. He suddenly appeared in the most terrible state of excitement, crying and stuttering and throwing his arms about. Oh, oh, great. Oh, what is it? What okay. happened back now? Calm down. Calm down, my boy. He's trying to tell us something. He's pointing. Pointing over there across the fields. Wasn't there something seriously wrong? This boy is in a dreadful state. Let him take us over there. Convince him that we will follow him. I did my best. Pat seemed to understand and ran ahead pausing and pointing and waving while we hurried after him. Some half mile across the fields, he stopped and pointed to a disused shed. He refused to go near. When Holmes and I entered... There's nothing in here. This hut isn't used for anything. Wait. Look, Watson, look there, on those sacks. It... It's Anne Geary. Oh, great heavens, Holmes. Blood. A head she... She's been most brutally murdered. News spread over the district at lightning speed. The whole of Lulworth Cove was in a state of panic, and people streamed towards the police station. Inspector Gavin called for more men from Dorchester and Weymouth... There was a general clamour for the arrest of Pat Boyce, but Holmes would have none of it. It's clear to me, Gavin, that Anne was murdered by the arsonist. Now, young Pat is not responsible for those fires. To start with, he hasn't the natural guile or intelligence to work out when to start the fires and be unobserved. Added to that, there is proof that they were intended to disguise a burglary. Pat Boyce could never steal valuable property and hope to dispose of it. No, no, the answer does not lie with him. Then who is responsible, Holmes? And why was Anne Geary killed? She was killed because she got part of the truth out of young Pat. And the arsonist became aware that she knew too much. Yes, I think it's time we had another talk to the man Alex Hall, Gavin. Perhaps you can arrange for him to visit Mr. Spaulding's home and talk there. Shall we say it just before eight this evening? Can you organise that, Gavin? Inspector Gavin was able to organise the meeting. I think we were all surprised, including William Spaulding. But he made us very welcome. Well, gentlemen, this is a great pleasure. You knew her well, didn't you, Mr. Hall? Not as well as I should have, Mike. Uh, she was in love with someone else. She told me, sir. I don't know who it was. Perhaps you can tell us, Mr. Spaulding. Uh, me? Why? Why, no, no, of course not. I, I liked the woman, but there was no... Wait a moment. Listen. Clock striking. But I... I know that sound. The chimes, they, they're like... They're like the clock that belongs to Major Higgins. Where is it coming from? From above. A grandfather clock in an attic? Odd, don't you think? Care to show us the rest of your house, Mr. Spaulding? Every room, please. No, 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 but denied killing Anne Geary. But Holmes said... He will break down the cross-examination. He's clearly mentally disturbed. I suspected him the moment he took over the chairmanship of that committee. He was able then to know the exact movements of the fire guards. He was also clearly on intimate terms with Anne Geary. She was the only one who called him William, and he called her Annie. I think there'll be no more troubles in Lulworth Cove after this, thank goodness. Thanks to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, no, no, I don't want my name mentioned at all. This is your first successful case, isn't it? Congratulations. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Very nice casting, Holmes. 
Yeah, I must say, I'm enjoying this trip tremendously. It'd be rather more satisfying if we caught some fish, Watson. What are you always telling me? Patience is a virtue? Well, they've been here a couple of days. Now, after all, what have we come to Norfolk for? Complete rest. Enjoy the broads, fishing, walking, generally taking a lazy holiday. Well, I'm quite content. Oh, it's all very well for a couple of days, but then I find I need something to concentrate upon. I think you should concentrate upon your line, Holmes. I think you might have a bite. Hey, hey, you there. You want a bank there? And if I have, then that man has ruined it. Holmes! Sherlock Holmes, surely it must be. Who on earth? Are... I'm not known in these parts. By heavens, it's Tubby Spencer. Do you remember him, Watson? Superintendent of the yard many years ago. Well, well. What am I see doing up here? present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Neen River Mystery. The summer of 1889 came very late, but it suited me quite well, for I'd been busy the whole of August, and it wasn't until September that I had time on my hands. When I did, the summer really started. Sun came out, temperatures rose, and it seemed an ideal time to take a short break. Most holiday makers had gone home, the resorts were deserted. I persuaded Holmes to join me for a few days on the Norfolk Broads. We'd found a small inn which was reasonably comfortable, and for two days we'd enjoyed the walking and the scenery. And then one morning we'd been disturbed by the well-remembered figure of Superintendent Spencer, or rather, ex-Superintendent, for he'd retired from Scotland Yard many years ago. Holmes, Watson, well, this is a wonderful meeting. I inquired at the inn, and they told me I'd find you on the river. Chappie Spencer, this is a surprise. Good to see you. Hey, Watson? Yes, yeah, certainly is. You're looking well, Superintendent. Oh, no titles, please. I gave that up years ago. Just plain Spencer. Or Tubby, if you like. What are you doing in these parts? The wife and I bought a pub when I retired. The Angler's Rest at South Wooden, near the mouth of this river. Nice spot. We're a well content there. How did you find us? Oh, your fame spreads far and wide, Holmes. Once I'd heard the name Holmes and the description of a tall, angular fellow who walked the fens in a deer stalker hat, accompanied by a burly fellow who was a doctor, I knew who it was. Well, it's splendid to see you again after all this time. Good to see you. Uh, tell me, uh, are you satisfied with your stay at the local inn? It's the wheat sheep, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I think we can say that we're, they're making us comfortable there. Don't you agree, Holmes? Oh, yes, yes, I have no complaints. But uh, perhaps you have a reason for asking that question, Tuppy. Although South Wooden is but a short way off, you've travelled here at some haste to find us, have you not? Now, how did you know that? You were always a very careful dresser. Your outfit is still smart. You've not become slovenly in any way. <laughs> Yet your boots are badly tied, your socks don't match, and your tie is inside out. you dressed hurriedly. You've even taken to horse to reach us, hence the riding crop in your hand. <laughs> Why the haste, Terry? Something wrong? <laughs> I can see that you are just as observant as ever, Holmes. Yes, I heard that you were here for but a few days, and I was anxious to see you before you departed. Oh, well, we've a couple of days more left of the holiday. You needn't have hurried. Oh, that's good. And then perhaps I might make a suggestion. If you care to see a little more of the district, why not leave the wheat sheep and come across to my place? Well, there is free accommodation for you at the Fisherman's Rest. My wife will be glad to meet you. She's a rare cook, I can tell you. <laughs> and you'll have plenty of time to explain to us just what it is that's worrying you. What is it, Tuppy? You say that you're no longer a member of the force, but you're still interested in crime, aren't you? And it is a crime that you wish to discuss, isn't it, Tubby? Tubby Spencer simply grinned and inclined his head. And that was enough for Holmes. He had exhausted all his interest in fishing. The mention of the word crime was a bait far more attractive to his mentality. Within minutes, we'd gathered together our fishing gear and were on our way back to the inn. By lunchtime, we'd been taken by donkey cart across the Fenlands to South Wooden. 
The fishman's rest was in every way superior to the inn we'd just left. And Mrs. Spencer made us very welcome. After a fine meal, we retired to Tubby's parlour, where we lit our pipes and sat near the open windows that looked out towards the river's mouth. Hmm. Well, come on, Tubby. This is the ideal time to explain what it's all about. Well, now, Holmes, you've got to understand that South Wooten is a very small place. Not much goes on here, and the population is sparse. So, as, as most villages, gossip is part of the day-to-day -day diet of most folk. But recently, something has happened that's caused a real stir. Two people, a man and his wife, have simply disappeared. Disappeared? Hmm. Well, Margaret and Bill Easton. Well, they live in the large cottage right up near Goose Fen. They've been married some eight years. She was born and raised here. He's a Londoner she met and brought up to Norfolk after their marriage. He got a job as a salesman in King's Lynn. He's been doing very well. Well, there was talk of him opening his own business, and then something must have happened. The plan was abandoned. Bill used to go away on trips connected with his work. And left three days ago, they both did. No one's seen them since. But uh, three days is no time at all. They could turn up at any moment. Mm. What makes you think mm. that anything is wrong? Surely it's far too early to become anxious in any way. Oh, I hope so. That's why it's not been reported officially. But the Easterns have always been a bit of a mystery couple. Keep themselves to themselves. And this mystery has been borne out by Luke Merivale. Who's he? Well, he's their lodger. A rum sort of cove. He arrived in these parts about a year ago. Works at the local garage as a mechanic. Well, there's nothing known against him, but he's not liked. A bit of a snooper. And hasn't made friends except a few poachers and the like. Mm. Well, rumor has it he's a, he's a bad lot, but as I say, there's nothing known against him. Anyway, he's very upset about this disappearance. He says there's been foul play of some kind. On what facts does he base these suspicions? Look, why don't you let him tell you himself? He's always calling in a bar in late afternoon for a pint. You get talking to him. He'll tell you everything. I'm sure he will. He's a tall, skinny bloke. A bit servile, but he will talk. Oh, I am very pleased and honoured to meet you, Mr. Holmes. It's a great day for South Wales. A great day, famous detective. Thank you, but Dr. Watson and I are simply on holiday. This is in no sense a business visit. You must always be able to give a little advice about criminal matters. Can't help being interested, I'm sure. For instance, now, my landlady and her husband, perhaps you bird. Strange goings on in our place, my husband. Mr. and Mrs. East? No. I'm sure they're in great trouble. Well, that's if they're still alive. Oh. Well, tell me more, Luke. Uh, come, let me fill your glass and then tell me what the mystery is all about. Uh, Tubby, can we have the same again, please? Coming up. Oh, thank you kindly. Well, now, it's this one. I've been born at the Eastons for nearly a year now, and I was quick to realise quite a few things. One was that Bill Easton had had trouble in the past. He'd, he'd done time, like, been in jail. Oh, yes, I can recognise an old lad, all right. And it seems that she, that's his wife, had met him just after he came out. Something to do with a charity meeting. They fell in love, and she brought him here to South Wooden, and he went straight. Nothing wrong in that, of course, but... Well, he paid the price for his crime, embezzlement or something it was. Anyway, some months ago, I happened to come down to my bedroom and they was in the park. I was going out and went up the passage to get me cab that was hanging on the wall stand. I couldn't help hearing what they were saying. I didn't listen on purpose, boy. I couldn't help it. Bill, Bill, what are we going to do? We can't go on like this. We've been paying out money regularly. For months. I know, I know. Morgan, I, should have, I shouldn't have started it. I should have had the guts to define from the very beginning. But I thought he would honor his word. He swore that if I gave him a few hundred quid, then he would go abroad. Leave us alone, instead of which he's still here. But we could go to the police. Blackmail is a foul crime. But then it would all come out anyway. There wasn't anything he could do if he talks. I just, I'll, I'll just have to find some cash somewhere. When I give it to him, I'm going to tell him it's the last he's going to get. He can do his damnedest. Oh, dear, will it do any good if I saw this man? No. no. Adam West is a foul and violent man. I don't want my wife to be involved with him. But I am involved. I am. Oh, my things have gone to that swine. It's not fair. It's not fair. Don't cry. Don't cry, don't cry. 
So you see. You... I knew that Bill and Margaret Easter have been blackmailed by this man called Adam West. Who he is or where he lives, I can't say. Anyway, it accounted for the strange sort of atmosphere that's been in the house. And then, only a couple of nights ago, I was going upstairs when I overheard them talking once again. This time it scared me a bit. I knew he kept a revolver in his bedroom, but I've never seen him use it. I'm going to put a stop to this, Marge. Even if I have to use this. Bill! Bill, no! No, you... You can't. You can't think of such a thing. The man is a coward. I know only part he is a coward. No one would have done what he has unless he's a rotten coward. This will scare me to silence. Oh. I know you. I'm meeting Adam West late this evening. And I'm going to put a stop to this once and for all. Bill, don't please. Let me try. Let me meet him, please. So you see, Mr. Holmes, it's clear to me that Bill and his wife both went off to tackle this black man, Adam West. They had a gun and they was going to meet him. Well, they haven't come back, so so I reckon there's something tragic out there, like. Now, what do you think, eh? Well, it certainly bears investigation, Luke. Did they not say where this meeting place was? Oh, no, no, I didn't hear no places mentioned. But I reckon... Hey, 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 look, everyone, look at this. This Billy Suzette, found down by the river mouth, and it's, it's got a bullet hole through it. <laughs> It's difficult to describe the sensation that broke out on the bar of the Fisherman's Rest. The man who had entered holding a large countryman's hat was Silas, well known in those parts as a casual worker during the day and a poacher at night. But for once, his poaching activities were not under question. He approached the bar and threw the hat onto the counter. Tubby Spencer picked it up immediately. Yes, yes. Oh, this is Bill Easton's, all right. Got his initials inside. Uh, Recognise it anywhere. Uh, may I see that, please? Yes, yes, there is a bullet hole on it. No, you, you, you think the same? Come on, let's go to the police. This must be handed over to the police at once. Police? What, Sergeant Peppercorn? What good is he? It has to be officially reported. Now, come on. Come on, Silas. You must take us down to the police station and make a statement. Come on now, the rest of you clear the way. Come on, Silas. Silas was led out, and after a few minutes, Holmes motioned to me that we should also leave. It was typical of Holmes that he didn't wait for the police to arrive. Mention had been made of the river, and that was enough for him. We were down on its banks within twenty minutes. It was still broad daylight. Holmes noted the footprints on the sandy path, and eventually he stopped by some tall reeds bordering the marshlands. Ah, yes, I think this must be it, Watson. You see, the reeds are bent all over the place towards us, mostly. Which means Silas the poacher must have come from the river this way. Come. Yes. The trail leads towards the water. It's getting awfully damp underfoot, Holmes. Isn't this where the wooden marsh becomes dangerous? There's a quicksand at the mouth of the mean river, I'm told. Yes, I shouldn't be at all surprised. Ah, the foliage gives way as it slopes towards the water. Yes, now careful now, Watson. This is very important. We found the spot before others have got here and trample all the evidence into the earth. Yes, footprints. But this way, uh, tread on the grass to one side. Holmes? Holmes, what's that? Uh, uh, white, uh, fluttering on those reeds. Yes, a length of cloth. <laughs> Let me Ah, yes, a flimsy piece of material. It could be from a woman's dress and... Ah, look, Watson. Blood. Oh, yes, this is where it happened. I should think the hat was found about here also. Yes, take this, Watson. It's vital evidence that a crime has been committed. Take it while I study these footprints. Yes. Here's where the struggle took place. Very clearly defined in the muddy sand. This is most interesting. It tells me a great deal. We are indeed fortunate, Watson. Watson? Uh, there you are. You've got here before us, have you? Holmes, this is Sergeant Peppercorn from the Wooten Police. Uh, I'll explain who you are and how we want to find ourselves out here. Oh, good afternoon, Sergeant. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Holmes. Uh, uh, Dr. Watson. Oh, no. Uh, a real fine state of affairs, this be, eh? Uh, I reckon there'd be trouble here, eh? Undoubtedly, Sergeant. A murder has been committed, perhaps two murders. This shows the scene of the struggle. And Watson found a strip of women's clothing. It's covered with bloodstains. 
There seems no doubt that Mrs. Easton's attack here. Oh, and, and this is a spot where Silas said he found the hat. So, uh, well, it, it looks like both Bill and Marge Easton have been murdered. Eh? Well, the, the, the bank, no sign of bodies about, is there? There are yeah, tracks. Anyway. There are tracks leading this way, not towards the river, but through the reeds and marshland. Look, very clear, wide, and... It's all shut and down. Oh, oh, best follow it. I, I don't know if that'll be of any use. That trail leads straight into the wooden marsh, and from then on, it's the mean quicksand. If the man responsible for all this is a local fellow, then he may know a, a safe path through the quicksand. But then all he has to do is dump the bodies in the right places, and they'll never be found. Well, nothing has ever been recovered from the mean quicksand. Mm, that's a perfect way to dispose of a body. Yes, I think I'll leave all the rest to you, Sergeant. I found out all I need from the scene of the crime. We were getting back to the fisherman's rest. Oh, uh, the uh, hat, is it still there, Sergeant? Oh, oh yeah. I thought you might like to examine it, Mr. Strong, so uh, I left it with Tubby's wine. Oh, good man. You don't mind if we take this strip of clothing, do you? I'll see you later on, Sergeant. Come, Watson, there's work to be done. We got back to the inn in record time, and Holmes took the hat from the suspense. We sat again in Tubby's parlour, and Holmes was silent for about half an hour while he subjected both hat and torn clothing to minute scrutiny through his magnifying glass. I could tell that he was puzzled. By the time Tubby Spencer returned, he was sitting quietly puffing at his pipe, lost in thought. Well, at least I didn't bring you over in a wild goose chase, Holmes. No, no, no. The goose at goose end is not wild, Tubby, but... Extremely clever. There's a man called Adam West, you mean? Yes, I agree. Of course, Sergeant Peppercorn has got in touch with headquarters at King's Lynn. Uh, they will have notified Norwich, and the country police will be over here before we know where we are. Oh, I don't think I wish to get involved with them, Tubby. We've got quite a way ourselves. We're, we were almost in at the kill, as it were. Are you agreeable to carry on with this as a private investigation? <laughs> oh, I'm a private person now, and not a Scotland Yard man. Yes, of course. Then it'll be a pleasure to work with you again. Oh, good. Now, what are your thoughts about this up to the moment? Well, on the face of it, it appears that Bill Easton went out to keep the rendezvous with Adam West, who had been blackmailing him. We know he was armed. I should judge that his wife followed him. There was a confrontation down by the river. Perhaps Easton pulled a gun and tried to fire at West. His wife intervened. There was a struggle. West shot Easton. Then after another struggle, in which Margaret's clothing was badly torn, he overpowered her. He threw her into the quicksand and disposed of Easton's body in the same way. Yes, yes, that is a workable theory. But uh, you don't agree with it? Oh, no, not at all. Then might I ask what your thoughts are up to this moment? I'd sooner keep them to myself for a while. They're rather disorganized, and I hate rambling thinking. What about you, Watson? Well, I have to agree with Tubby. There's only <laughs> one thing that I'm not sure about. What's that? The, the uh, lodger, Luke Merivale. He's a shifty sort of man. I wonder if his evidence is to be trusted. With only his word for it that uh, these conversations he overheard actually took place. For all we know, there might not even be a blackmailer called Adam West. Splendid thinking, Watson. That's really very astute of you. Full marks. Oh, thank you, Holmes. You see, if his story's correct, then why didn't he move before? Uh, why, for instance, if he is an inquisitive type of person, and he obviously is because he eavesdrops, didn't he follow Easton and his wife and check up on their movements on the night of the crime? Why, indeed. Of course, he might have been too scared. Or he might be even more involved. Lodgers have been known to disrupt domestic harmony, you know. Well, it's uh, worth thinking about, Holmes. Wrong, Watson. Totally wrong. You are, in fact, both wrong, but... It is getting late. I suggest a little light supper and an early night. Tomorrow morning we can resume our investigations. I shall first send off a telegram to your old firm of Scotland Yard, Tubby. And in the morning I suggest a trip to King's Lynn. King's Lynn? But why, Holmes? Easton's place of work. I think we might be able to pick up a few missing threads from quite an opposite direction. And meanwhile, your wife tells me there is cold game pie and cider for supper. Shall we join her in the kitchen, Tubby? <laughs> I knew from Holmes' attitude that we should get no more out of them that night. The next morning, after an excellent breakfast, the three of us, for Tubby refused to be left out, journeyed by pony trap to King's Lynn, where we easily traced the firm of churchmen and sons where Bill Easton used to work as a salesman. The chief clerk showed us into the small office that Easton used. Yes, uh, yes, this is where poor Bill used to work. Uh, we haven't touched anything, of course, because... Well, because we're still hoping that all these rumours are ill-founded and that 
Lieutenant. Uh, uh, that's his desk. Thank you. I'm afraid the chances of you seeing Bill Easton again are very remote. But I'm glad you've left everything undisturbed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I shall be in my office if you wish to discuss anything further. Uh, excuse me now. Best if I can see what's so important about searching his place of work, Holmes. We should have thought a search of the house would have been more profitable. Not if there was something he wished to conceal from his wife. Ah, this, this for instance, the wallet, and in the wallet's letters. Ah, there's one letter in particular. Listen to this. My dearest Adam, just a short note to say that I shall be waiting at the same place for you. I love you and will wait for you for always. I know that we shall come together in the end and live comfortably for the rest of our lives. Yours, Pearl. Letter to the blackmailer? Yet Bill Easton came by it. Holmes, do you think this is significant? Could Easton have been planned to turn the table and blackmail the blackmailer? Lady Pearl has unfortunately, by sheer force of habit, perhaps, written her address at the top of the paper. 12 Sheepcops Lane. Well, our next port of call is clearly indicated. Come, gentlemen, let us visit this Pearl lady. I think we're nearing the end of our chase. Sheepcot Lane was on the other side of the town, but we found it quite easily. Holmes walked rapidly up the steps, and a buxom young lady answered the door. You are Pearl? We are the police. Kindly let us in. We wish to ask you a few questions. What? What's your name? You can't come in here. We are in. Now, where yeah. is the man who calls himself Adam West? Adam? He ain't... He ain't here. He's gone to... What is it, Pearl? I thought he had someone... Bill... Bill Easton. That is correct. Bill Easton who served his first term of imprisonment as Adam West, and who will now hang for the murder of his wife, Margaret Easton. You'd better take charge from now on, Superintendent Spencer. Terry Spencer took charge automatically. Easton broke down once he realized he'd been caught. Holmes drove the pony cart back to the fisherman's rest and explained. You see, Watson, there were two things that simply didn't fit in with Tubby's theory, that a blackmailer had murdered both Easton and his wife. The first was the scene of the crime. That struggle clearly indicated only two sets of footprints, a man's and a woman's. There was no third party. Hence, the struggle was between Easton and his wife. The second was the hat. Easton fired a bullet through his own hat to make everyone think that the bullet had lodged in his brain and the body thrown into the quicksand along with his wife's. But he made a big mistake. He fired the gun from inside the hat so that there wouldn't be a hole on the other side. There was clear evidence of the powder burns inside. Hence, no murder. Yes, he'd invented the character of Adam West as a blackmailer, threatening to reveal his criminal past in order to drain away his wife's savings. He salted them away with his own money in order to run off with Pearl, his latest mistress. Scotland Yard confirms that he was both Adam West and Bill Easton. Well, I've had a very enjoyable fishing trip. It ended with quite a satisfying catch after all, didn't it, Watson? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watts. Hey. Hey. Anyone in here? Anyone mucking around in these stables? Uh, come on now. I can see you there in the shadows. Come on, show yourself. All right. What are you going to do about it? What are you doing here? These are private stables belonging to Mr. Paul Chester. Too bad. I've just lost my way, that's all. Sorry, bye for now. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That ain't good enough. I'm sending for the police. You won't cause any trouble with your wife. No. Well, we'll see about that. You asked for it, mate. Right. 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 <laughs> We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Porter Muse Mystery.
Sherlock Holmes was accustomed to dealing with mysteries and murders, but as far as I can recall, there was only one case where a death occurred almost on his doorstep. You see, running parallel to Baker Street is Chilton Street, and in between, at the back of number 221B, there is a small mews, Porter Mews. The stables are clearly seen from our back bedroom windows. Number 108 Chilton Street is owned by Paul Chester, an undersecretary at the Admiralty. And it was in his stable, in the mews, that the body of his coachman, Ben Mead, was found that autumn morning. Naturally, someone thought of Holmes immediately. And, not stopping for breakfast, we both hurried to the scene of the crime. Ah, Constable, good morning to you. Oh, good of you to pop over, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Lindsay, the name. I'm standing guard here until the inspector arrives. Now, nothing's been touched since the alarm was raised. Good, good. One of those rare occasions when I'm first on the scene and not the last to arrive. Uh, this is the man Ben Mead. Yes, I've often seen him at work down here. Uh, tell me, has Mr. Chester been informed of this? Uh, Mr. Chester doesn't seem to be at home, sir. The place is all locked up. Uh, that's how this man was found. Uh, the housekeeper arrived. Uh, she doesn't stay in the house. Uh, she couldn't get in, and so she came down here to find Ben. <laughs> when in a flaming hysterics, she didn't call the police. Uh, she's next door, if you want to talk to her. Uh, later, later will do. Let me first take a look at the body and the whole stable. Uh, the horse and carriage aren't here. I take it the Chester has gone off with them. Now, the body. Well, it must have been a fight, Holmes. Look at the way everything's been thrown about. Oh, yes, there's been a fight, all right, but an unfair one. It seems to me that this poor fellow was knocked down, and then, before he had a chance to pick himself up, he was hit across the base of the skull with a heavy instrument. This man gave a good account of himself, according to his facial injuries. Blood everywhere, and look at his knuckles, and... Yes, what's this? Ah, yes, yes, a coachman's wheel hammer. Blood and hair on it, yes. This is the murder weapon, all right. Now, I need as much light as possible. Now, where's my glass? Yes, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, it's clear from the footprints in the earth by the door that Ben came in here and disturbed someone. I should say quite early last night. There was a fight. He inflicted some injury upon his opponent before he was knocked down. He was meaning I should think about... Here, when the fatal blow was delivered. Yes, I think I'd like to go over everything alone, if that's all right with you. And then, when the inspector arrives, you can send him up to my rooms, Constable. I think I can put him on the right track straight away. Oh, uh, that's a relief to know, Mr. Holmes. Lucky to have you on the spot, so to speak. Uh, I'll tell the inspector straight away. And so, about an hour later, as Holmes and I were finishing breakfast... Mrs. Hudson showed in our old friend, Inspector Lestrade. Ah, Lestrade. I wonder that Scotland Yard has been called in on such a minor case of murder. Uh, morning, Holmes. Morning, Watson. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, the powers that be heard you'd been at work, and they thought it might be more important than it first seems. Uh, murder on the premises of anyone who's employed at the Admiralty has serious undercurrents. Yes, but this murder occurred in the mews, in the coaching stables at the back of Mr. Chester's house. Nothing to do with Chester. That's right. But what is not known is that the house was burgled last night. And the housekeeper was let in, and when they opened up the place, they found that all of the famous silver plate had been taken. Now, these two events cannot be unrelated, Holmes. The man who killed Ben Mead must have used the mews as an entrance to the house. There is, of course, a connecting gate and a pathway to the back door. Mm, yes, but let's get the sequence in the right order. Ben Mead investigated the coach house, was killed by an intruder who then took Mead's key and went into the house and stole the silver plate? Oh, no, I think not. Well, I, I don't know what order it happened in, but uh, the two events must be connected. Uh, the coincidence is too great, don't you agree? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Well, Holmes, where do we start? Any ideas? Oh, yes, plenty. It's a question of marshalling my thoughts. Now, let's take the death of the coachman as a start. You're looking for the murderer. He is approximately five foot eight inches, he has red hair, and he has a tooth missing from the front of his mouth. Holmes, uh, you, uh, you aren't serious. Never more, sir. But, uh, how did you arrive at these conclusions? Oh, my dear Lestrade, you're as infuriating as Watson. You should know my methods by now. They are totally scientific. Nothing that I say is guesswork. I examined the coach stable in great detail. I found evidence. The fact that the dead man had put up a fight was very clear. He was bruised about the face. Now, bruises are very strange things. They come about in various ways. After death, for instance, they do not grow into blueness. The blood is not circulating, you understand? That's how we can tell the time when death occurred. Now, the knuckles of Ben Mead's hands showed definite, clear cuts 
He'd landed several blows, adhered to the blood on his hand with various hairs. I have them here in this envelope. Uh, they are, as you can see, rather vivid red hairs. Hmm. Uh, yes, yes, I see. All right, Holmes, carry on. There's a broken tooth in that envelope also. I picked it up from the straw. It must have been from the man Ben was fighting, as Ben's teeth are quite intact. Also on the beam of the stable, there were similar red hairs. They are also in the envelope. They show that if the man was hit and staggered back, his head would have hit the post at roughly five and a half feet from the ground. That's reasonable to assume, therefore, that he is a small man. He must have had red hair and a beard. It's all quite elementary, really. Oh, uh, oh well, it's uh, something to go on, isn't it? Oh, I think so. Now, London must have hundreds of men with red hair, but not all that many who also have broken front teeth. It narrows down your search somewhat, you must agree. Now, I've suggested in view of the fact that there was also a robbery, that the man was hired to do this job, therefore he is a professional and an experienced crook. Uh, may I make one final suggestion? Oh, by all means. Try Limehouse. There's a gin hall near the river. It's called the Waterman's. It's a place where all kinds of seamen gather. At the back of the hall, there is an old coach house which is used as a boxing hall and gymnasium. Oh, I've long suspected that it's merely a front cover for various smuggling activities. If you can get a couple of plainclothes men to dress as seamen and ask a few questions, you could pick up the lead on the man you're after. Well, uh, that's a great help. Thanks, Holmes. I'll do exactly that. Good. Well, the best of luck, Lestrade, and keep me informed, won't you? Lestrade left, feeling rather pleased with himself. And I knew that if he succeeded in making an early arrest, Holmes would take none of the credit. In fact, Holmes appeared to lose all interest in the case until later that day when Mrs. Hudson showed in yet another visitor. This time, it was a man of considerable importance, Sir William Benningfield of the Admiralty. Uh, good day to you, Holmes. Um, I don't know if you remember me. Uh, we met a couple of times at the Diogenes Club. Uh, your brother, Mycroft, introduced us. Of course I remember, Sir William. Uh, pray do take a seat and tell me why I'm so honoured by this visit. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> well, the fact is that we seem to have hit a spot of trouble. Uh, this is, of course, in the strictest confidence. Naturally. It's my assistant, young Paul Chester, the fellow who lives just at the back of here. Uh, the gentleman whose coachman was killed in a fight last night. Yes, yes, that's right. I don't know if that has anything to do with my problem. I can't see how it can have. But anyway, the fact is that Chester has disappeared. He can't be traced at all. But he should have been in the office at the Admiralty yesterday, and today there's not a sign of him. We're very worried. You think he also might have been attacked? Huh? Eh? Oh, no, 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 I, I don't think so. The fact is that for some time now we've been aware that certain information has been passed on to foreign powers. Very vital information regarding the latest naval armory. As you know, we in Britain pride ourselves on our secret service as best in the world. Information coming back to us leads us to believe that someone in the Admiralty has turned traitor. Hmm. And you suspect it's Paul Chester? Oh, grave accusation, Holmes. I hardly like to put it in so many words, but the possibility does exist. Uh, recently, I've been watching Chester. Only he and I have the keys to the safe where the codes are kept. Very few of us handle the top secret stuff. The codes are continually being changed. Now, I know Chester has been at work on certain papers... I am reasonably sure that he has been passing copies on to a contact in Austria. Your brother, Mycroft, is over there at the moment and has confirmed that the information is being leaked out there. And you think that Chester may have got wind of this, that he might be aware that you suspect him? That's right. I fear that he may be skipping out of the country with the latest plans. It's important that we find him and stop him. You say that he's been missing for two days. And he could easily be aboard a ship or even across the channel. Could be. But we must check. The point is, Holmes, will you help us? I'm sure Mycroft would wish you to. Yes, yes, of course. I shall do everything I can, Sir William. Yes, this case is becoming extremely interesting. Yes, I shall do everything I can. Sir William Benningfield left, and I went about my own business. I had a large number of calls to make and didn't return to Baker Street until early evening. And Holmes was not at home. Mrs. Hudson had set the table for supper, and there was game pie and vegetables hot on the stove. 
I was helping myself to this when the door opened and a shabby old tramp let himself in. Look here, my man. Well, what do you mean by calling in here? How did you get in? And who are you, anyway? You, you must be the doctor. Dr. Watson, ain't that right? That is correct, but answer my questions. Who are you and what do you want? How did you gain entrance to these rooms? <laughs> you, you really are my best audience, Watson. Oh, I always yeah. feel my disguise is a foolproof if you're taken in by them. Holmes, well, I must say that this is one of your better attempts. I was completely taken in. Well, what have you been up to this time? Well, I thought I'd do a little checking up around the Limehouse district myself. The Strade's men stand out like sore thumbs down there. I spotted them in the Waterman's gin hall immediately. Fortunately, they made my own investigation pass unnoticed. Yes, I found Ben Mead's murderer. All right. You have? Oh, yes. A very undesirable creature by the name of Joe Crumb. He's exactly five foot eight, has red hair and a beard and a front tooth missing. I've advised Scotland Yard and the Strade should be about to make an arrest, I should think. That's fast work, I must admit. Uh, Holmes, uh, is there a connection between that man's death and the disappearance of Paul Chester? I believe there must be. It's far too coincidental. Missing papers from the Admiralty, an undersecretary who disappears, silver plates stolen from his house and his coachman is murdered all at the same time. No, no, no. There must be some link. But what is the link, Watson? That's the point. It's a far more complicated case than it appears. Ah, now that, unless I'm very much mistaken, will be our old friend Lestrade. Oh, would you be so good as to let him in, Watson, while I change out of these things? Uh, give him a glass of brandy and invite him to take supper with us. I shall not belong. I did as Holmes instructed. For it was indeed Inspector Lestrade waiting outside on the doorstep. He accepted my offer of food and drink gratefully, and over supper told us of his success. Uh, we arrested the man, Joe Crumb, Holmes. He's now in jail and we're pushing forward his trial. But, uh... Well, uh, frankly, I'm wondering if the evidence will hold. It's rather too circumstantial. Men have been hanged on far less evidence. He is a murderer, I have no doubt about that. Providing you have a good prosecuting counsel, I think you should get a conviction. No, I'm not so sure. The man's attitude is so darn confident. Uh, he doesn't say much, just does a sly, lopsided grin. Refuses to comment at all. Simply says he's innocent and that's that. He is not innocent, he is guilty. I've been down to Limehouse myself and picked up quite a few tidbits of information. Nothing that I can pass on to you to be used as evidence, but from what I learned, it confirmed all my suspicions. Joe Crumb killed Ben Mead, and all that remains is for you to prove it, Lestrade. Now, would you like a little more game pie? Holmes promptly dropped the whole case. Several times I asked him if he was making any progress with his investigations into the disappearance of Port Chester, but he merely said that the time wasn't right. Sir William Benningfield called a couple of times and was given more or less the same answer. I could see that he was disappointed in Holmes, but Holmes didn't let that worry him. He was concentrating upon other matters. Days went by and even weeks, and eventually Joe Crumb appeared in court on a charge of murder. Naturally, Holmes and I attended the trial. The defence was conducted by Hugh Starcross, the most able man. Members of the jury, you must be amazed at the weakness of the case you have been brought here to judge. In all my long experience, I have never known a criminal charge supported by such flimsy, scanty evidence. As it unfolds, you will see that no rational mind can find the prisoner guilty. My client is not content, however, to be acquitted for lack of evidence. He claims the right to prove his innocence. He will show that he could have had no part whatsoever in the death of the coachman, Ben Mead. That means he's about to produce an alibi. Well, the, the usual questions first, though. A prisoner at the bar. You have heard that at the scene of the crime, there was evidence of a fight and the finding of red hairs and a broken tooth. <coughs> you have red hair. Yes, sir. Natural, too. Always have had this colour here. You also have a front tooth missing. Uh, can you tell the jury how you lost that tooth? Uh, Waterman's Jim, Limehouse, boxing. Lost it about oh, three three months ago. Fella called Max Baker, called me one in the face and knocked me too far. Oh, that's Baker down there, he'll tell yes, you. Yes, yes, just confine yourself to answering the questions. I shall bring the necessary witnesses to testify as I think fit. And now, on the night of the 21st, when this death took place, <laughs> can you account for your movements? Oh, so I can. I was a... Uh, I was in the Waterman's till about, ooh, ten o'clock. Then I went across to the pub. Three ducks. 
Stayed there till closing time, playing darts. Then uh, went with the landlord to play poker. Had an all-night session. Oh, one quite a bit, too. Mm. And now we shall hear the confirmation from the landlord. Yes, he'll now be called. That's him, that large, fat-faced man with the black hair smarm down. He will testify for Crumb. Holmes, you seem quite pleased that things are going so badly. If this continues, then Crumb will be acquitted. Oh, yes, yes. I should think that's almost certain. Well, I think there's very little need to stay in here more, Watson. The jury won't take all that long to make up their minds. We may as well go and get ourselves a cup of coffee, I think. Don't you? Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, my lad. <laughs> Naturally, I was greatly upset and so was Lestrade. Scotland Yard had been made to appear rather stupid. He was far from pleased and very much inclined to blame Sherlock Holmes, who was quite unimpressed by the whole of the proceedings. In fact, later that evening, he seemed rather pleased with himself. Tonight, I think we can actually move on the case, Watson. It, uh, I, I, I thought it was all over. Crumb has been acquitted. Well, you may have been right in thinking him guilty, but he's got away with it. Not entirely. Not entirely. He has been made to reveal his hand, and I think now we can step in and solve the whole mystery. I've asked Lestrade and his men to meet me later. First, I have to send off a few telegrams. One to Mycroft in Innsbruck, another to the landlord of the Three Ducks, and a third to Sir William Benningfield. Then we journey to Limehouse, suitably clad, of course. I'm sure I can find an old suit that'll fit you, Watson, and a large cape with a pocket that can conceal a revolver. Well, if you want me to come with you, or you think it might be dangerous. Well, that's right. I've been inactive for long enough. This time, things were brought to a head. Don't you agree? Come, make preparations. It could be a long night ahead. And so, on a rainy, windy night, Holmes and I took a cab to the east end of London and made our way by foot to the Three Ducks public house. We didn't go in. It was nearly closing time. We waited down a side alley. And after about half an hour, two men left by the back entrance. I could tell by the light of the gas lamps that they were Joe Crumb and the landlord. Swiftly and silently, we followed. They made their way down towards the river, and at St. Catherine's Wharf, they stopped and entered a small disused warehouse. Holmes seemed to know the way, and catching me by the sleeve, guided me through the darkness. The two men lit a lantern. There, there's he. They're kneeling on the floor, about to open a trap door in the floor. Holmes, Holmes, what's all this mean? Shh, you'll find out very soon. Wait. risk too many crumb here. What a devil. Don't move. There are two guns on you and both my friend and I are crack shots. Cover them, Watson. Let's get this trade in here. He and his men have been following me. That's it. The game is up, Crumb. You may have got away with murder once, but this time you won't be so lucky. This time you will face a charge of killing Mr. Paul Chester, whose body you have just placed in that sea chest. You blasty clever sworn out you? You'll have plenty of time to listen to explanations later. Oh, oh, ah, yes. trade. Good, right on time. Take these men away. Then I think you can make yet another arrest. A bigger fish this time. These are just two sprats to catch a mackerel. Come on, Watson. Our work here is over. After the arrest of the two men in that warehouse, events moved at a bewildering pace. The body of Paul Chester was found, wrapped in canvas. It was clear that he'd been murdered, his throat cut from ear to ear. Under cross-examination, the landlord of the Three Ducks broke down and confessed everything. He turned Queen's evidence, and so implicated none other 
than Sir William Benningfield. Holmes was not at all surprised. You see, it was Benningfield's whole idea. It was he who had turned traitor and was passing on the naval secrets. Paul Chester found this out and was ready to expose him. So Benningfield had to get rid of him. The plan was to burgle the house in Chilton Street, steal silver plate, and then send a message to Chester where to find it. Chester was lured to Limehouse, where he was killed, and his body placed beneath the floorboards of the warehouse until it could be shipped aboard a boat and dropped out at sea. Unfortunately, Joe Crumb was discovered by Chester's coachman, who was killed in a fight. I knew that it was the beginning of the case and not the end. Once Crumb was acquitted, he got overconfident. The landlord, being the spineless type, reacted to a telegram I sent to him, saying Chester's body had been found. They led us to him. My brother Mycroft is due back in England straight away. He'll deal with Benningfield. I think our job is over, Watson. So much for the Porter Muse mystery. Interesting case, but a little too close to home for comfort. Don't you agree? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Holmes, you're in. Good. I've been hoping you'd call, Watson. Come in, my dear fellow. Come in. Pour yourself a drink and light up a pipe. You're most welcome. Uh, well, well, it's a long time since I've seen you so happy, Holmes. Uh, not happy, Watson. Stimulated. Look, a note that was sent round earlier at breakfast time. Here, read it yourself. Oh, very well. My dear Sherlock Holmes, I am back in London for a short while. I have an apartment in Regent's Buildings, Chester Terrace. May I please call upon you late this morning? After all these years, I'm sure we shall both find the meeting most interesting. I trust you still do remember me. I really at present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the return of Irene Adler. The name Irene Adler caused the years to roll away. It took me back immediately to one of Sherlock Holmes' earliest and most fascinating cases, a scandal in Bohemia. Sherlock Holmes had very rarely been defeated, and only once by a woman. That woman was Irene Adler, an English woman who conquered all Europe and became the mistress of kings and princes. I've seldom seen Holmes so fascinated by the prospect of meeting anyone. Just before noon, a private carriage drawn by two splendid white horses drew up outside. I left the lady in myself. I do not recall a more beautiful or gracious visitor. I was enchanted. She lifted her veil, and two startlingly blue eyes mocked me. The faithful Dr. Watson, at last, after all these years. Oh, my honor. Uh, 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 please, come this way. I trust Mr. Holmes is expecting me. Oh, with great anticipation. Now, allow me. Your visitor, Holmes. Uh, shall I leave you? Certainly not. You must stay. I may need assistance now that Mr. Sherlock Holmes and I have met on his home ground. Mr. Holmes. Uh, Miss Adler. Or should I not say Mrs. Norton? Ah, you do remember that I married. <laughs> you were an unwilling witness at the ceremony, were you not? No. No, Miss Adler will do very nicely, thank you. My marriage was not the success I hoped. Ah. And may I inquire what brings you back to London? That simple fact. I am now divorced and anxious for a change. I resolutely refuse to become old before my time. I have rented the most modern apartment in the city. It has a telephone, electric light, and even a gas icebox. I shall not remain very long. Just a few weeks, looking up my old friends. <laughs> <laughs> 
And foes? Ah, <laughs> yes, and foes. It is a very dull woman who reaches my age without making quite a few enemies. But I am not worried by the future, Mr. Holmes. I have always been able to take care of myself. I heartily agree with that. And you? Your work is still successful? I like to think so. Scotland Yard value me a little more highly than they did in your day. I am glad. That Inspector Lestrade was such a dullard. I most certainly hope I don't meet him while I'm here. I hope you don't either. Oh, you still think of me as a dangerous woman, don't you? That is good. I like to leave a lasting impression. But really, I must go. I have so much to do during this short stay. Oh, I almost forgot. I'm having a small soiree at my apartment tomorrow evening. After eight, I should be tremendously flattered if you and the good doctor could attend. Is that possible? I think so. What's more? I should be charmed. Good. Then we shall not say goodbye. Just au revoir. Until tomorrow, then, Mr. Holmes. Having created exactly the impression she desired, Irene Adler swept from the room. I showed her to her carriage. She bowed graciously while a small group of onlookers gawped by the railings. On returning to our sitting room, I found Holmes in a pensive mood. Mm. I wonder, Watson. I wonder. Oh, what, Holmes? I must say I've never seen anyone quite so, well, so captivating. Indeed? Oh, yes, her technique has not lessened with the years, but why, Watson? That's what I ask myself. Why? Why what? Why did she call upon me, and why is she in London? It's important that I know. Well, Holmes, I really don't follow you. Why should it not be a quite innocent visit if she now lives a totally different life? She doesn't. A leopard cannot change its spots, Watson. Irene Adler has been living in America. Her clothes may seem Parisian, but they are not. Her gloves bore the name tag of a New York department store. She's lived over there long enough to call a refrigerator an icebox. No, no, no. The lady's here for a purpose. It can only be a shameful one. I must anticipate her moves. Something to do with American crime. Oh, come, Holmes. Surely you're reading a great deal more into this than exists. I know better than to accept Irene Adler at her face value. Yes, I must warn Lestrade at the yard and check on all rumours in high society. A careful watch must be kept upon this lady's movements. And uh, have the party she's holding tomorrow evening after eight? Shall we attend? Oh, by all means, Watson. Oh, yes. We most assuredly will attend. <laughs> Ah, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, how good of you to call. Do come through and meet everyone. Allow me to introduce you. Colonel Harris. I have to admit, the lady French sure is a very thing. How can you allow her to invite a detective here? Keep your mouth shut. And Irene is not my lady friend. We've only been introduced. Get it? And these two are American friends to whom I've just been introduced. They're from New York. Uh, friends of my ex-husband. Hank Madison and Jervis Amos. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. John Watson. Pleasure to meet you. How do you do, Mr. Madison? Is this your first visit here from America? Uh, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it is. It feels kind of strange, but delightful. Everything is so <laughs> old, you know what I mean? I fancy so, yes. Are you from New York? In the jewelry business? No, no, no. I'm a banker. Uh, no. Oh, what a pity. I was so wishing to talk to an American about the true value of the Baltimore diamond. Did you say the Baltimore diamond? Yeah, that's right. I believe that it is in London and that it may be put up for sale. That is, if a private buyer cannot be found very soon. The trouble is that no one seems to know its true value. Did I hear you mention the value of the Baltimore diamond? Oh, how exciting. The fact is that they do say a crime head of Scandinavia has already purchased it. Price beyond belief. <laughs> Certainly no one I know can afford it. Oh, but come, Mr. Holmes. I will not have you monopolized by anyone. I must show you the rest of the apartment. But first, a drink? I know you will not like fancy drinks. But something cool, perhaps. Most pleasant. And here. Help yourself. See? The cupboard that contains the decanters has a small icebox. Open it and... There are round trays which are filled with ice. Isn't that so very convenient? Small enough to pop straight into a glass. I love this apartment. 
And here, my elegant golden telephone. By turning the handle several times after lifting the receiver, you can ask the operator for any number in Greater London. Isn't that so exciting? Do you think you will ever catch a criminal by making a telephone call, Mr. Holmes? Oh, is that drink to your satisfaction? Because if so, do come and meet me. We didn't stay at the soiree very long. It was the sort of gathering that Sherlock Holmes despised. A number of false people wearing set smiles, engaging in small conversation with earnest intensity. I wondered it would have been at all worthwhile. In the handsome going home, Holmes answered my unspoken thoughts. I think it was worth going to, Watson. It's extremely tiresome, of course, but it served its purpose. Oh, you really feel that, Holmes? Well, I confess I'd never felt more like a fish out of water. I gleaned a few interesting facts. I was right, Watson. There is mischief afoot. It concerns that man, Hank Madison, and the Baltimore Diamond. Yes, I don't know what form the trouble will take. It's not my job to police the whole of London, but Scotland Yard must be alerted. A crime is about to be committed. The strayed at the yard has a job of work to do. For the next few days, Holmes was engaged in serious discussions with Scotland Yard. He used to return home in the evenings irritable and frustrated. The strayed refused to take his warnings seriously. In the end, Holmes gave up. He'd done his best. Matters came to a head three days later when Lestrade burst into our sitting room. Holmes! Holmes, it's happened! Curse it! I was a blind fool! You were right, damn it! You were right all the time! Uh, come in, Lestrade. Now do calm down. Tell me what brings you here in such a sorry state. It's, it's the Baltimore Diamond. It, it's been stolen. Now calm down, Lestrade. I can understand your frustrations, but as the deed has been done, we must now apply our minds to a solution. Wearing a pathway into my carpet will not solve anything. No, oh, sorry, Holmes. It, it, it's just so, so impossible. If the crime involves Irene Adler, then nothing is impossible. Could it have been her? Well, of course it is. I've warned you repeatedly that this would happen. Now, as you seem incapable of coherent action or even logical thinking, I suggest we take a four-wheeler and go straight to Regent's Building, Chester Terrace. You will not have a warrant to search the apartment, but that can be argued about later. While we're on the way there, you can explain the circumstances in which the crime was committed. Uh, Watson, I take it that you do not wish to be left out of this? Well, certainly not. You get your coat, Holmes, and I'll get the four-wheeler. Within minutes, we were out of Baker Street and into a cab, topping our way down Park Road. The strange, who had been impressed by Holmes' keen cut decision, pulled himself together somewhat and answered the questions that were thrown at him. Knowing Irene Adler, the robbery would not be an armed one. It would be a case of deception with a deal of audacity. Not so? Uh, quite correct, Holmes. As you may know, the Baltimore Diamond was sent to this country to gain a European sale. It's been held by Samuel Twiggs of Bond Street. Though Twiggs handles the select transactions himself. He has private rooms above the shop with a strong room. A few days ago, Madame Louise Dubois suggested and requested an interview and asked to see the Baltimore Diamond. She gave full credentials, which were extremely impressive. The twigs unlocked the safe and showed them to It is exquisite. Quite exquisite. I am determined to possess it. Oh, I, I, I'm sure Madame will wear it with a great distinction. I think as a pendant, a single setting to lie low on the neck. Monsieur, I shall, of course, not carry out this transaction by myself. I have the, uh, the patronage of the young Earl of Sandown. It is... Uh, a delicate matter, uh, you understand? Our relationship? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes uh, I think so. Complete secrecy must be observed. The Earl family. And may we consider a rendezvous? The Earl, myself, yourself, and the diamond. Oh, I have no doubt it could be arranged. It would have to be at a discreet venue. The Langham Hotel, perhaps. The small private business room? That is easily planned. Oh, at your convenience, madame. I think Friday afternoon at three o'clock. Can you manage that? Oh, I shall uh, make a point of it, of course. Very good. That is decided. Oh, there is one small matter. Mm -hmm. The Earl is very young, very well known, and naturally this process must be conducted discreetly. He will not use his own name when you meet. He always calls himself 
Dr. Westbury when he travels incognito. Oh, very wise, very wise. Yes, I often do that myself. Uh, uh, Twigs of Bond Street is also uh, too well known. Uh, I am known as uh, Mr. J. Marsh, a uh, uh, commercial traveller when undertaking uh, delicate missions such as this. Oh, that is most satisfactory. May I then arrange for a meeting at the Langham Hotel on Friday at three between Dr. Westbury, Mr. J. Marsh and myself. Uh, not forgetting the small article that lies in the case before us. Thank you so much, Mr. Twiggs. I do hope the transaction is successful. Yes. Irene Adler, all right. Blonde wig, French accent. She could fool anyone. After all, she was a famous theatrical star. Well, go on, Miss Spade. What happened next? Clearly, there was no Earl of Thunder. No, but there was and is a Dr. Westbury. And according to him, a French lady, Madame Louise March, visited him in his consulting rooms in Harley Street that same day. She was very distressed. It was regarding her husband. It, uh, it really is so, uh, so embarrassing, Doctor. You see, my husband, he, uh, he is suffering from, uh, from the brain fever. I do not know what I can do. He, he acts quite normally until these attacks, and then, uh, then afterwards he... Uh... Please do not distress yourself, Madame Marsh. Tell me frankly all about your husband. Well, I, uh, I am a French woman. Uh, my, my husband, he is English, and far older than I am. You will appreciate that there are difficulties in such a marriage. I am able to deal with most of them, but lately James has, uh, has been suffering from, uh, from delusions. He... He keeps wishing to give me gifts, expensive ones that he cannot afford. He he imagines he is a, a wealthy jeweler. He really believes he is such a man. Oh, if you could only speak with him, see his state of mind for yourself. Why did you not bring him along here today? Oh, oh, but that is impossible. He would never consent. But perhaps if uh, if we met privately, a, a friendly meeting to to humour him. Let him talk of selling jewelry. He is harmless enough. But you could observe his behavior. Perhaps prescribe something to calm him when he talks wildly. I, I, I really love him very much, but I cannot continue like this. Please, won't you help me? Of course I will, madame. And now, when can I see him? Well, uh, we are at the Langham Hotel for a few days. If you could call there on Friday afternoon, say at three o'clock, I could introduce you as a friend. We might have tea served in one of the private rooms. You could talk together. I could leave you alone to speak privately. Is that satisfactory, Doctor? Could you manage Friday at three o'clock? Oh, yes. It's Irene Adler, all right. The meeting was held yesterday afternoon, not so? Both the jeweler and the doctor, dazzled by Madame Dubois' charm, didn't doubt her sincerity. Yes, they all three met at stand with the Baltimore Diamond. Oh, that is so. Uh, both Twiggs and Westbury, aware that they were dealing with the most delicate problem, the most cautious of their meeting. I can well imagine it. Irene Adler at her theatrical best, playing her cards with consummate skill. Ah, so you two have met at last. Tea is served. And uh, now we must talk business. Uh, the jewels. Uh, I have it here for your inspection, uh, Doctor. Oh, Oh, may I... Oh, yes. Yes, is it not magnificent? <laughs> oh, of course I shall be so proud to accept it. Oh, the price. Can we afford it? Oh, you must have it. I, I insist uh, no one else could do it justice. Uh, don't you agree, uh, uh, Doctor? I, I'm sure you're right, Mr. Marsh. But uh, we need to talk about a great number of things. A, a consultation. Oh, I am discretion itself, I assure you. I've had so much experience in these things. That, uh, I, uh, I shall require the uh, usual credentials, of course. Place yourself entirely in my hands. Oh, if you two gentlemen are about to talk uh, intimate business, then with permission, I shall wait in the adjoining room. Uh, may I take my tea? Oh, thank you. Please do not hurry. I have plenty of time. Go into things most thoroughly, won't you? Call me when you have finished. And so she leaves them together, taking her tea and the Baltimore diamond with her. The jeweler and the doctor are left to discuss their business at completely cross purposes. Neither daring to offend the other with straight talk for some time. It must have been a good ten minutes before they realized the truth. But they'd been tricked into thinking the other person was a different person. By that time, the French madame had vanished with the diamond. Is that it, Mr. Strait? That is it, exactly. 
And what steps have you taken? An immediate alert. All the usual procedures, descriptions, etc. Totally ineffective. It's even a waste of time questioning Irene Adler. You'll find that with the help of her two new American friends, she'll have a perfect alibi. Oh, then what are we to do, Holmes? It's all very well arriving at her apartment in a few minutes' time without a search warrant, but if she is guilty of this cunning robbery, she could have disposed of the diamonds by now. Oh, no, 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 that she will not do. You do not know the lady as I do. She's delighting in this deception. That's the reason why she came to me in the first place. Yeah, she got the better of me once years ago, and now she thinks she can do it again. Now, but look, we're turning into Chester Terrace. Things will become quite interesting very soon, I think. Regent's Buildings, Chester Terrace, was almost deserted. And the butler at Irene Adler's apartment informed us that his mistress was out riding in the park with the American, Hank Madison. Lestrade introduced himself, and the butler recognized Holmes and myself from the evening of the party, and we were shown in. A pile of luggage stood in the passage. Madame Adler was due to leave for the continent. Lestrade was all for a thorough search of the cases and the rest of the apartment, but Holmes restrained him and insisted that we sat quietly and waited. To my surprise, although the hour was early, Holmes mixed himself a strong drink with ice before joining us. We waited for some time before... Hi, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson. And can it be, after all these years, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard? Well, what a surprise. Uh, you know my friends, Mr. Hank Madison and Mr. Jervis Amos. Uh, Glad to meet you. Hello there, uh, Holmes. Uh, Watson. Good day to you. And pray, why am I so honored by three guests? I hope the matter isn't all that serious. For the three of us are about to leave on my tour of Europe. I know that, madame. But I must first insist that a thorough search be made of this apartment and all your personal belongings. The Baltimore diamond has been stolen, and we believe you are responsible. I beg your pardon. Oh, you can't be serious. Oh, but of course you may search as much as you please. Tell me, when was this diamond stolen? Yesterday afternoon at three o'clock from the Langham Hotel. Indeed. Oh, that must have been while we were riding in the park. Oh, I guess so. I called for a Madame Adler at 2.45. You were out in the park until after four. Ah, many people saw us. I was looking at my best, I think, in a green and yellow gown with white accessories. There were photographers out there. I refused to pose, but they must have photographed us in the carriage. So you see... I told you that Madame would have an alibi. And I really do think it will be a waste of time to conduct a search. It's both inconvenient and undignified. Do please continue with your investigations in the manner you think fits, Lestrade, but allow Watson and I to retire. Uh, I shall say goodbye now. Goodbye, Irene Adler. I think it most unlikely that we shall ever meet again. Are you ready, Watson? I couldn't have been more amazed. In all my years with Sherlock Holmes, I'd never known him throw in the towel over a case. But he remained unperturbed. And instead of ordering a cab to take us home, he suggested a walk through Regent's Park. There, sitting by the lake watching the ducks, he said... Like to smoke a pipe, Watson? Oh, I feel in no mood for smoking, Holmes. Uh, just, just, what are you thinking about? Allowing that woman to get the better of you like that? But she hasn't got the better of me, Watson. Here, take my tobacco oh, pipe. Well, I don't really wish to. Holmes. Oh, what's all this about? This pouch is soaking wet and the, and the, the tobacco is drenched. Well, what's this mean? You, you can't smoke this soggy stuff. Look deeper into the pouch, Watson. Uh, gracious me, it's, a, it's the diamond. Holmes, I don't understand. It's simple. Irene Adler obtained the diamond by impersonating Madame Dubois. She had an alibi because her American friend, Jervis Amos, who's a young man of slight build, dressed in her clothes, and was taken for a ride in a carriage all yesterday afternoon by Hank Madison. When she got back to her apartment, she dropped the diamond into a tray of her fancy ice box, where it lay frozen and concealed. Uh, I found it there when I helped myself to a drink. Oh, Holmes, Holmes, this is... it's amazing. Yeah, she worked it out wonderfully well, didn't she? But then, so did I. For I was able to refill the ice tray with water and drop a valueless glass imitation in place of the diamond. Yes, I do hope this trade takes a long time to allow the ice to set. <laughs> It's rather important to me that Irene Adler doesn't discover how she's been tricked until she reaches Amsterdam. Most satisfactory teaching her a lesson after all these years. Don't you agree, Watson? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes. 
with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watts. Very disappointing. Oh, gracious, Holmes. What are you doing? What's this awful smell? What are you burning? Ah, uh, Watson, I didn't know you were at home. I, I'm afraid my experiment has been a complete failure. I, 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 what is that? I haven't seen such a revolting sight since medical school. Are you dissecting an animal? Uh, alas, yes. It's the frunken head of a small monkey, no less. I had hoped it would be a genuine human head from Borneo, but alas, it's a fake. Most disappointing, Watson. Had this been the real article, then I might have gained a valuable clue regarding the Sarawak Frang organization. As it is, well, I failed before I've even started. Oh, really, it's too vexing for words. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the drunken head. I've recently learned through all manner of sources that the Sarawak Frang organization is moving into the east end of London again. Now, its members rule by fear and superstition. Now, you're a much-traveled man. You know the eastern mind. It's as unfathomable as their faces are inscrutable. Uh, as I say, it's a pity. I thought I'd found one of their genuine heads. Oh, surely a shrunken head can have little or no commercial value, Holmes. What possible use could it be put to? Well, as I was saying, it's superstition. A Sarawak head from Borneo is believed to have magical properties. It can convey messages from the unknown. Oh, that's absolute rubbish. Dead head can't talk. People can be coerced into thinking it can. There are very many Chinese and Burmese folk living in London who would be in awe of such a specimen. Oh, anyway, it's a fake. So the whole exercise can be abandoned. I shall have to look elsewhere for other clues. A couple of nights spent in Limehouse might tell me something. You wouldn't care to join me, would you, Watson? Frankly, no. To shiver around in those dens filled with smoke disguised as an oriental is not my way of spending a pleasant weekend. And I was hoping you might join me in the country. I've had an invitation from an old friend, haven't seen him for years. Mm. A, a, a doctor chap who's also travelled extensively in the Far East. His name's Clive Carter. Lives out at St. Albans. Are you sure you don't want to change your plans? <laughs> no, 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 I... No, I shall be quite happy pursuing my inquiries. We shall just have to go our separate ways for a few days. Yes, great pity about that head. And so I packed a small bag on the Friday night and travelled down to St. Albans, leaving Holmes to pursue his bizarre studies in Limehouse, little suspecting that our activities would complement each other quite soon. I found Clive Carter a little changed, a trifle more stout, a few more grey hairs but still the same thoughtful, kindly man. And, of course, there was much to talk about. I hope you'll be comfortable here, Watson. I'm sure I shall. It's a most charming place. Yeah, I see plenty of souvenirs around your walls. Oh, yes. At first, I thought they might appear out of place. But the house itself has a vaguely eastern atmosphere to it, don't you agree? Yes. Well, that struck me when I first came in through the garden. I can almost smell incense burning. <laughs> I haven't gone as far as that. If you want the real thing, wait until you see Professor Middleton's house. It's the one across the end of the garden, the other side of the lane. He invited us over for a drink later on. An eccentric old fellow, but has a wonderful eastern wife. Oh, extraordinary. You know, I seem to be surrounded by shades of the Orient these days. So we don't have to go unless you want... No, 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 no. I'd be delighted. Well, perhaps you'd like to wash and change and... Then we can take a stroll and call in on our way back. Now, what do you say? Naturally, I agreed to the plan. It was quite a hot evening, with dark clouds piling up and a rumble of thunder in the summer air. Professor Middleton's house was set well back from the lane and covered with thick creeper. It was impossible to put an age to the place, but once inside... It gave the impression of a vast pagoda divided into small rooms and passages. It was completely oriental. 
A Chinese servant welcomed us in the hall. You are welcome. Please to go through this way. Madame is with guests in the broad study. Please follow. Oh, thank you, Ling. I told you it would be interesting. Wait until you see Elona Middleton. Oh, she's a corker. Oh, good evening, Clive. Do come in. And this, I take it, is your friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Please, I would like you to meet our house guests. Major Bennett, who is a Hertfordshire magistrate. Hello. And uh, Matthew Grayling, whom we knew out east. I'm pleased to meet you. Hi, you know each other, do you not, Clive? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> Matthew will serve drinks. My husband is still working in his study. You will have to forgive him, Dr. Watson. He is a trifle unorthodox regarding guests. We are all used to it, of course. What will you have, Doctor? Scotch? I know what you take, Clive. <laughs> yes, thank you. I uh, think I know a mutual friend, Watson. Sherlock Holmes, daily share rooms with him. Oh, off and on for many years, yes. Uh, Clive extended an invitation for him to come down for the weekend, but he's, well, he's rather busy at the moment. Crime, I suppose. Yes, there's a lot of help in the bushy heath affair. I think I must get linked. Don't worry, I can manage them. Everybody got drinks? Good. Oh, fascinating room. These lamps must be very old. Oil from the lamps of China. And what do you think of these photographs, Doctor? Pretty gruesome, aren't they? Yes. What are they? They look like shrunken heads. Or are they masks? They are the real thing, I'm afraid. My husband has a great authority upon the human head of Borneo. To a Western mind, it must seem a strange hobby. Zulish, I call it. I've never been able to explain the interest. Often spoken to the professor about it, but he never takes the slightest bit of notice of what I say. He doesn't take the slightest interest of what anyone says. Ah, oh, there you are, dear. We were wondering where you had got to. Just talking about you, as a matter of fact. This is Dr. Watson. Mm. A friend of Clyde's was down from London for the weekend. Uh, how do you? Uh, how do you? I think I left a book down here. Uh, do carry on, don't mind me. Don't mind we were me. just talking about your interesting hobby, the photographs. Hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, far more to all that than meets the eye. I was reading the other day about the superstitions. The revival of interest in the practice. Surely you really can't believe these things are strange powers. What do you think, Clive? Well, as one who's travelled quite a lot in the Far East, I prefer to keep an open mind. I agree. We've been through some strange times out east, haven't we, Professor? Mm, yes, yes. Yes, but you can't have actually seen or heard anything to substantiate black magic and all that mumbo-jumbo. I did once. Yes, it's a fact. I remember attending an ancient rite. We were all suitably disguised, of course. We would have had our throats cut if it had been known we were Englishmen. The ceremony was held in a sort of palisade on the edge of the jungle. I hid away behind some rice sacks and water jars, and I was able to see quite clearly there were about 20 people present, including a sort of high priest himself. They sat around a pole with his blackened skull in it, and, you know, the blasted thing took. Impossible. Ventriloquism. I could see quite clearly the lower jaw moving. Trickery, strings, wild. Out in the open, on a pole, and then, you know, I could swear there was a glow of light from where the eyes used to be. I don't mind telling you, it was darn spooky. I got out as quick as I could. Never dabbled in it ever again. Another drink, Watson? It's not for me, thanks. Uh, tell me, Mr. Grayling, whereabouts was this? Oh, uh, Borneo. Then, could that head have been one of the heads of Sarawak? Well... Oh, what did you say? Well, I understand their view is very important by certain authorities. Of course, I know very little about the subject of the flag. It is not something I think we should discuss over a friendly drink. After all the storm and all this talk, can we not change the subject? No, 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 no. I don't, I'd like to know what our doctor friend means. What do you know of the Sir Robert Frank, Dr. What have you name is? I know nothing. I, I just said so. I was, well, I was just making polite conversation. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, uh, I don't wish to break up the party, but really it is coming down heavily outside. I think we should get back home while the going is still good. Don't you, Watson? Yes, if you say so, Clive. Well, it's been very nice meeting you all. Hope we shall meet again soon. You are always welcome, Doctor. You have your call? Good. I will get Ling to show you out. Oh, don't worry. We know our way. Good night, everyone. Good night. It was clear that our visit to the Middletons had not been an unqualified success. I wasn't at all sorry to leave. I didn't care for the house or the professor. And although his wife was very beautiful, there was an air of tension about her that disturbed me. It was raining quite heavily, so Clive suggested the short way back across the lane and through his back garden gate. We were just about to close it, and someone called out. Stop! 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 St
What the devil? Who's that? There, back there, in the lane. Oh, it's, it's Ling, the Chinese servant. Come on. Right. Yes, yes, it's Ling, all right. Stay here. Help me. What's in front? Support him. Ling? Ling? No, it's no use, Clive. This man's dead. The hospital was called, and we left it to Professor Middleton and his wife to make any other necessary arrangements. Altogether, it was a strange and dramatic evening. One I was rather keen to forget, but I couldn't. So next morning, I walked to the nearest post office and sent off a lengthy telegram to Sherlock Holmes. To my delight, later that day, he arrived. I introduced him to Clive, and he came straight to the point. Ah, Watson, your telegram arrived just as I got home this morning. From what you say, this is a most interesting coincidence. You mentioned the Saravak head. Is there a connection, do you think? Oh, yes, sir, I know, Holmes. Something very strange is going on. We had a very nasty evening, didn't we, Clive? Oh, most strange. And I'm more than glad to see you here, Holmes. You're very welcome. Oh, thank you. Yes, but it's clear that the scene of the action is across the lane in the professor's house. Uh, can you arrange for me to visit them? I've already called earlier to see if we could help at all. It seems that the Chinese Ling must have died of a heart attack. They've already carried out a detailed examination. There's no suggestion of foul play. Uh, Mrs. Middleton would be pleased to meet you. Yes, I think you already know one of the house guests. Major Bennett, a magistrate in these parts. Ah, yes, yes, Bennett. Yes, I remember him well. Any other guests? Uh, one, Matthew Grayling, an old friend who has worked with the professor out east. It was he who started the conversation about these shrunken heads. After that, well, the evening seems to get worse and worse. Now, who the devil can that be? I'm not expecting anyone. D excuse me. Hello, there. I'm just talking about you. There, do come in. Thank you. Uh, Holmes, this is Mrs. Middleton. I was just about to go over to your house, Ilona. Then I am glad I got here first. Poor Mr. Holmes. I must speak to you. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Middleton. Uh, please do sit down. You can speak quite freely in front of the others. Now, what has happened? Any fresh developments? No, no, but I must tell someone. I have reason to believe that my husband has one of those heads. The shrunken head of the Sarawak. Oh, he denies it, but I am sure I am right. And I think it must have a connection with the death of Ling. Mm, very likely. And someone or, or something is trying to get at the head. I, I am desperately frightened. Things are happening in the house. Last night I heard footsteps creaking along the stairs. And, and a muffled sound like... Like the ringing of a bell or a gong. Voices. The, the scratching sound like fingernails on the door panels. And this evening I... I saw a face at the window. Hands on the sill of my bedroom. Someone climbing the creepers, perhaps? I, I do not know. I, I just do not know. Your other two guests, have they heard anything out of the ordinary? Major Bennett has not. He thinks I am just an hysterical woman. And the other guests? Mr. Matthew Grayling? Well, he is making light of things, trying to help me overcome my fears. But... But I think he knows something is happening, or about to happen. I have caught him several times on the stairs, in the passages, just, just standing there, listening, as though he is waiting for someone to, to whisper to him, call him even. Oh, dear. Are they here? Let's take a swig of this. Oh, and then I suggest we all three stroll over to your house and Mr. Holmes can try and sort things out. Oh, oh thank you. Of course, these sort of manifestations don't occur at regular intervals. I, I do not suppose anything will happen and you will think like the Major, but I am wildly over-imaginative. Well, drink up and let's go and find out. Uh, Watson, will you look after Mrs. Middleton? Yes, of course. Uh, shall we get our coats, Clive? They're very well. Uh, this way. Uh, tell me, have you a revolver in the house? Yes. If you have, for heaven's sake, get it and make sure it's loaded. Come. It was a matter of minutes before we were into our coats and out of the house. The lights were on at the Middletons, and the front door was not locked. But from the moment we opened the front door... Open up! Open up in there! What is it? What's going on? This way. I was having a drink in the library when I heard the professor shout out. The major heard him, too. He's in his room with the door locked. Uh, Clive, hand me that revolver. Get Mrs. Middleton up to her room. See that she stays out of things until I send up for her. Oh, what is it? What is happening? Something has happened to him. What is it? Uh, come on, Ilona, come on. You're all right. No arguing now. Come on, Watson, up the stairs. Open up! Open up! Holmes, oh, sir. Perhaps you can help. 
I think the professor's in trouble. I was dressing in my room when I heard him call out. as in pain. I can't get the blasted door open. Stand back. Right back from the door. That's it. Now. Uh, got it. Uh, Watson. Uh, look there. Professor. On the carpet by the desk. Uh, it's too late, I'm afraid. He's dead all right. Yes. Just, just like the Chinese butler. Look there. That shrunken head on the blot of the desk. Also a letter. This must be written in the professor's own hand. Oh, let me see that. Yes, that's the professor's handwriting. Yes, I think I'll take charge of these documents. I must ask you, Major, to send to the nearest police station. Take the pony and cart if necessary. Mr. Grayling, will you please join Mrs. Middleton and try to calm her? Tell her that her husband's condition is serious, but we are doing the best we can in the circumstances. Shouldn't we send to the hospital a, a, a doctor? Uh, we already have two within the house. Watson and Clive Carter. Uh, please do what I say, both of you. I just need to give this room a very close examination. It's essential that I'm not disturbed. Very well, Holmes. I know your methods. Come on, Matthew. Very well. Poor old man. And there's that blasted head sitting there, staring down at him. Don't say there isn't a moral in this somewhere, Major. Even if you think it's all mumbo-jumbo. Good. Uh, Watson, uh, close that door. Prop a chair up against it. I mustn't be disturbed. Good night, Holmes. Do you notice anything about the body? Anything unusual? Uh, apart from the fact that his slippers are half off? No. No, I don't. Yes. Well, most people would think this fellow met his end through heart failure, but he didn't. He was poisoned, Watson. Poisoned? Yes. The same poison that I suspect killed the Chinese man, Ling. There, on the wall, a small bamboo cylinder. There are arrows concealed in one end. Now, you must know that some of these eastern poisons are quite lethal. The slightest scratch into the bloodstream causes almost instant death. The Holmes, look at this room. The windows are shuttered. There are no holes in the walls or ceiling. The door was locked from within. Don't come near while I'm doing this. A clean sheet of paper from the desk. And now the felt slipper that is half off. That's it. Now, see there now. This now lying on the paper. A small steel barb. Most of the tip. That was pressed through the sole of the right slipper. When changing his shoes after writing his letters, the professor inadvertently scratched his foot. Result? Enormous pain, a loud cry, and sudden death. Gracious, what a diabolically clever idea. Yes, particularly if the murderer wished to establish an alibi elsewhere. May I come in? Gracious, what's going on? It's all right. Remove the chair, Watson. Right. Ah. Come, Clive, let us leave this room just as it is. There are plenty of places along these corridors where we can wait without being seen. Come on, follow me. I don't understand. Matthew says the professor is alive. Uh, he isn't. He's dead. Just uh, one more thing before I attempt an explanation. Did you know what Mrs. Middleton did before she married her husband? Uh, I don't know. I, I have an idea she was a nurse. I, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, that's good enough. Right, step back into this room. Is this the one occupied by Major Bennett? Yes, that's right. Splendid. He's gone for the police and can't possibly be back for some time. Come on. Now, we, we cannot light the lamps or the candles, I'm afraid. You'll just have to stand in the darkness, but I don't think you'll have all that long to wait. Now, listen. Just stay here, Elena. Try to rest. I'm sure it's all right. I promise you I'll come back the moment I know Mr. Holmes' conclusions. He's dead. He's dead. Dad, I know you're dead. Easy now. Don't give in. You mustn't give in. Don't make a sound. Just watch. Hi? Holmes? What's... Where are you? Hi? Holmes! What the devil is going on? Where are you? Hi? What... It's all right. He's going downstairs. Wait. Quiet. I'm afraid I didn't understand this. Why didn't we stop, Matthew? Shh, shh, shh. Wait. Wait and listen. Someone else in the house. The sounds Mrs. Middleton told us. Shh, no more speaking. Come, follow me. The door to the professor's room is now wide open. A few paces. Come, no noise. Yes, Mrs. Middleton, can I help you? I, I tend to see for, for myself if he, if he... Yes, she is dead. You need not try to conceal the slipper you are holding. The poison dart is not in it. It lies there on that slip of white paper on the desk. Oh, no, no. Oh. Don't go near it. You are not taking the easy way out. You have a great deal of explaining to do. Better get it all sorted out before the police arrive. 
Don't you think, Mrs. Middleton? Quite a few hours later, when back in Clyde Carter's comfortable sitting room, Holmes was able to explain to us the details of this most extraordinary and complicated case. It was really most fortuitous that I was already studying the Sarawak Frang organization. I knew they were back operating in England, but no one knew who their agents were. It was rumored that one of them was a woman. Well, it was Mrs. Middleton, of course. She was a member of the Frang before she married. When her husband retired, she came with him to England. He was many years older, and the marriage was not at all a happy one. I wondered at first if Matthew Grayling was actively involved, if there could have been a romantic motive behind it all, but, well, that was not the case. Professor Middleton, throughout his studies, found out that the shrunken heads imported to this country were all fakes. He also suspected his wife was still in the power of the Fran. He knew he would still have to tell the truth. It might expose him and his theories to some ridicule, but... At heart, he was an honourable man. So he determined to tell all he knew. Mm, that's right. The devoted Chinese servant Ling found out what was happening. He knew his master was in danger and ran after you in the storm to seek help. Mrs. Middleton, no stranger to the ways of poison darts, got to him before he could betray her. And she then planned to kill her husband by planting a poison dart in his slippers. That's right. She came over here, told us a story that there were strange influences in the house, and we got over there too late to save the old fellow. I'm always badly affected by failure, as you know what. Yes, but you've solved the crime. And far more important, you now hold the documents which give you the lead against the Sarawak Frang that you've always wanted. Isn't that so? Yes, yes, that is so, but well, I must leave. Move quickly. With all the information in the hands of Scotland Yard, some good may come out of all this. The shrunken heads of Sarawak may speak the truth. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Yeah, I think a pint of ale, don't you, Holmes? It's a warm evening, yes. A sound choice, Watson. Uh, two ales, please, Barman. Come in right off, sir. Failure is not to be trusted. He's a fine doctor. Coroner he may be, but he cured my Betty in no time. Give a man his due, Mr. Morton. His due? If I give him his due, I'd take a horse whip up to the lodge this very evening. In fact, I'm almost persuaded to do just that. Dr. Juan Lana is not just a foreigner, he's a fake. A total fake. Now get out of my way. Oh, seems the tempers run high in this place, Barman. That's the young squire, Mr. Arthur Morton. He's not blooded. But a nicer fellow, you couldn't make in a day's match. Wouldn't hurt a fly, no, not him. Here, here are your drinks, sir. We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the Spanish Doctor. Sherlock Holmes and I had been in Yorkshire where Holmes had successfully dealt with the case of the Whitby widow. We'd been a little delayed in our plans to return to London, and feeling tired and a little weary, we'd agreed to stay overnight at the Mitre Inn and Bishop's Cross before catching the train from York. Bishop's Cross seemed a pleasant enough village, and the inn was old-fashioned but comfortable. We had a pleasant supper and retired to the bar for a cool drink to end that summer evening. Holmes had always maintained that if you wished to know what went on in country places, the way to find out was to listen to the talk in the local bar. We did, and found it quite interesting. But as we were to leave the following morning, we took scant notice. We retired to our rooms quite early, and I slept almost at once. It was quiet and blissfully peaceful until... Watson, hmm? Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, uh, 
Holmes? Uh, Holmes, what's the matter? Wake up, Watson. I've just been called by the local police. It seems there's trouble at one of the local estates. Someone has been killed, and knowing I was staying here, they've sent for me. Come, I've no wish to tackle this alone. You must get dressed immediately. Hurry, Watson, hurry. I was in no way pleased, but dragged myself from the comfortable feather bed and washed the sleep from my eyes. Ten minutes later, we were in a dog cart with a young farmhand urging his pony forward through the morning mist. Sorry, I can't tell you more, Mr. Holmes. The inspector, he just said I was to get you up to the lodge right soon. The lodge? Is that the home of Dr. Juan Lana? Why? How can you know that? Thought you'd be a stranger in this part. I am. I just happened to have overheard the name mentioned in the bar last night. Uh, Mr. Morton, I think it was, who seemed to dislike the good doctor. Ah, uh, they ain't friends. And ever since the doctor broke off his engagement to Francis Morton, Arthur's sister, be the doctor who's dead, so I understand. Dead in mysterious circumstances, I take it. I don't know any details, sir. You'll have to be asking Inspector Barry about that. Ah, there be the lodge. Won't be long now. The Spanish Lodge, as it was called locally, was a small wooden-built house on the hillside above the village. Well-kept, with neat lawns and flower beds, it was obviously the home of someone of comfortable means. We made our way up the stone steps and into the hall, where a police constable stood on guard. An inner door opened, and a plain clothesman bustled towards us. Oh, Sherlock Holmes! Uh, remember me, Inspector Berry, uh, uh, late of K-Division East Ham. I seconded to York over a year ago. Of course I remember you, Barry. Good to see you again. Oh, I hear you were staying overnight at the Mitre, and I hope you don't mind this early call, but it seemed an opportunity not to be missed. Uh, Dr. Lano owns this house, and practice has been killed. I think it must be murder. Uh, when did this happen, and what caused his death? Well, come and see for yourself. Oh, uh, good morning, Dr. Watson. I'm sorry to have appeared to ignore you. I value your visit. You may have your great help. <laughs> good morning, Inspector. Yes, if I can be of any assistance, then of course. Well, uh, this way, then. The room we were shown into was large. It contained a sofa and easy chairs, a large desk and bookcases round three walls. There was a stone fireplace, many rugs across the wooden floor. Leading from the room was a small dressing recess with wash bowls and toilet facilities. It was obvious that the doctor used his study for professional purposes. As for the good doctor himself, the side of the table, away from the window... He was stretched upon his back. No doubt that he was dead, and that it was a violent death. One of his eyes was blackened, and there were marks of bruises about his face and neck. The thickening of his features suggested to me that the cause of death had been strangulation. Ah. You use this room as a home surgery, it seems. That's right. Uh, that's the outside door. It's clear that someone entered from there, killed the doctor, and escaped unseen. That the assailant was a man is certain from the footprints outside and the nature of the injury. Yes, it's very seldom that I have the opportunity to examine a murdered man in these circumstances. I shall make a thorough investigation of the body and this room. Uh, how many people live in this house? Oh, just an elderly manservant who attends to the house. Uh, the cook, housekeeper, the coachman and the surgery boy sleep out. Mm. Did the manservant hear anything? I believe so. His name is Blobs, but he's still in a state of deep shock. Uh, perhaps, uh, once you've completed your examination, you'd care to join me in questioning him? Yes, yes, certainly. I shall be about half an hour. Have Blogs wait in the hall. Find out if there were any visitors last night and patients who were expected to call. Names and addresses of everyone he saw yesterday. Meanwhile, ah, yes, this is very interesting. I'd often watched Holmes at work, but rarely had I seen him so thorough. He examined the body and every inch of the rugs and carpets surrounding it. Then he went into the washing recess. I watched with amazement as he picked several items out of the basin with tweezers and placed them in an envelope. He spent a long time looking at the dead man and was clearly puzzled. Then, locking the door behind him, he walked across the hall to where an elderly gentleman in a state of deep shock was seated by the hat stand. I can't believe it. It's not possible. The good master's dead. You must try to recall all you can about last evening. Now, when did you last see your master? Oh, about half past nine, sir. I went in there, and he, he, he was writing at his desk, and I bade him good night and went about my duties, and it was it was about eleven o'clock when I went to go upstairs, and, and a short while later, I, I thought I heard a cry or a call of some sort, and I went back down here, and I checked on the door. Doctor! Hey, doctor, sir, I'm here. Oh, doctor, I'm back. Who is that? Who is that? Oh, I'm here, sir. Blogs. I beg that you leave me in peace. 
Go back to your room, Jim. Well, I thought uh, did you call out, sir. Is everything all right? I think you're all right. Go. Go to bed. Go easy. Oh, very good, sir. Now, let us solve this whole matter once and for all. How dare you come here and call me so? There was someone in there with him, sir, and I, I couldn't tell who it was. I, I went back to my room, but sleep came hard. And about an hour later, I, I can't be sure of the time, but I, I got up to open the window a bit wider. It being such a not night. And did you see anyone in the grounds? Well, come, man, come, speak up. Well, yes, there was someone, a, a, a man, walking away from the house, from the surgery door. I, I couldn't be sure who it was, but uh, but it, it was bright moonlight. You thought you recognized the man? Well, I can't be sure, of course, but well, yes, it it looked to me like like young Arthur Morton. <laughs> It took Holmes another hour before he felt satisfied enough to let Inspector Berry remove the body of Doctor Lana. Then. After studying the list of patients who had called the day before, he asked to be taken to Vine Cottage, the home of Arthur Morton. Frances Morton, his sister, received us. I am sorry, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. My brother isn't in at the moment. Can I help you in any way? Obviously, you've called regarding the dreadful death of Dr. Lana. We are... we are all very, very upset. Yes, I'm sure you are. Uh, please do tell me everything you know about this man. Am I right in thinking that you knew him extremely well? Was there perhaps some emotional tie at one point? Oh, you're very astute. It's no use pretending. You'll find it all out quite soon. So, yes, I I will tell you all I know about Juan Lana. Uh, please do. Leave nothing out, however unimportant it may seem. Well, Juan came here to Bishop's Cross some ten years ago. He was of Spanish blood. Some even say royal blood. He'd lived for years in... South America, and quite naturally, the villagers resented such a grand foreigner. But he was a doctor of medicine, and a very brilliant one. He established a practice. It took years for him to win the confidence of the people, but he did. He was eventually well-respected, and even well-loved. When did you yourself become acquainted with him? Uh, about two years ago, when I returned from Europe. We... We, we fell in love. And, uh, and six months ago, we, we announced our engagement. I... I find this most painful, you see. But please, take your time. Tell me all you can. Well, Juan's attitude suddenly changed. He became morose, withdrawn. It was, it was as though he was suddenly frightened, living in fear of the future. Then without any reason at all, he, he broke off our engagement. He said he couldn't marry me and that, and that for my own good, he wished me to be free. Oh, I can't tell you how, how rejected I felt. How miserable and guilty. And now he's dead. He's mad in this well, It appears that he died as a result of wounds sustained in a fight. Tell me, Miss Morton. And you may as well be quite frank. Have you any idea who could have done this deed? Oh, no. No, of course not. What did your brother feel about Dr. Lana? Did they not hate each other? Oh, it wasn't Arthur. It couldn't have been. It wasn't Arthur. Please believe me, it wasn't. Oh, tell me it wasn't us. Frances Morton had tried valiantly to control her grief. But when questioned about her brother, she broke down completely. There was little we could do but hand her over to the careful attention of her maid and leave the house. Arthur Morton had not returned, and we soon found out why. He was held for questioning by Inspector Berry at the local police station. When we entered, he was sitting sullenly at the desk preparing a statement. First thing we noticed was that his face was puffed and bruised, his left hand clumsily bandaged. Oh, come in, Holmes, Watson. Mr. Morton is about to help our inquiries by uh, telling us of his relationship with a dead man and of his movements last night. Neither of which has any bearing on the murder. I admit that I disliked Lana. After what he did to my sister Frances, I considered him a complete outsider. An untrustworthy foreigner. The fact that he is dead doesn't alter my opinions. You quarreled with the deceased on many occasions. Only a couple. After jilting Francis, he went out of his way to avoid me. He steered clear of Vine Cottage. <laughs> he knew what a reception he would get from me if he came near our home. But in spite of this, I never laid a finger on him. I certainly didn't kill him. Those injuries that you show. The bandaged hand, those bruises. How did you come by those? Gypsies. 
There had been a band of roaming gypsies with their caravans parked on my land, at the back towards the lodge. They caused trouble with fires. I went out after them last night and, well, there was a bit of a rough house. I consider I didn't come off at all badly. I see. Well, perhaps as you're talking about last night, you'd be good enough to give me your exact movements. Well, it was quite late. About 11 o'clock, I think. I was locking up when I saw the fires between the trees. I went over to remonstrate. You know how dry everything is in this hot weather. And a couple of these Romany types took exception to my orders, and I had to knock one of them down. Did you go near the lodge at that time? I walked back down the side lane. I didn't go near the house, although I noticed that the lights were on in the room Lana uses as a study and consulting room. You didn't go near the house? What if I tell you that you were seen in the grounds? Whoever says he saw me must have been mistaken. Bloggs, the manservant, says he saw you from his bedroom window. You were walking away from the surgery door. The time was after 11 o'clock. Bloggs, that old man. With failing sight, how could he have identified anyone in the middle of the night? And from the top window under the eaves. You know his window. Or could you perhaps have seen his light on also? Of course I know the layout of the house. Mr. Morton, might I ask to see the boots you wore when you went up to the gypsy encampment last night? Oh, I, I don't remember which ones I wore. They, they could be in the boot cupboard, I suppose. Why? I should like to take them with me when I return to the lodge. Do you mind? Not at all. Go. Have you any questions to ask this young man, Holmes? Uh, not at the moment, Inspector. I think he should be allowed to go home and comfort his sister. She was most unwell when we left Vine Cottage. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Please will excuse me, gentlemen. Holmes was in a particularly thoughtful mood as we made our way back up the hill to Spaniard's Lodge. And once again, Holmes let himself into the study and carefully inspected the room. He rang the bell, and Bloggs appeared instantly. Uh, can I help you, sir? Uh, yes, Bloggs. Now that the body of your master has been removed, has anything been touched in this room? Oh, uh, no, sir. I kept it locked on the inspector's instructions. Ah, uh, good. Then can you tell me if you can notice anything missing from its usual place? Uh, no, sir. I don't think so. I, it all appears much the same. Uh, of course, I haven't... Uh, why, that's strange... The photograph on the desk, it, 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 it's an empty frame. Someone has removed the actual photograph. Well, how curious. Yes, curious indeed. Because nothing else has been stolen. Dr. Lana's gold watch was still on his wrist. Money in his wallet, in his smoking jacket. Valuable cufflinks and tie pins in the box in the dressing room. Well, clearly a robbery was not the motive for breaking in here, but... Yes, the photograph is missing... What was the photograph, Bluff? Oh, it was, uh, it was one of Miss Frances Morton, sir. The young lady from Vine Cottage to whom Dr. Lana was uh, at one time engaged. Ah, uh, yes, yes, I see. Yes, that makes sense. Yes, well, thank you, Bloggs. That will be all. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, look here, Holmes. What's this all about? Blessed if I can see that any of this makes sense. Now, you surely don't think you know what happened last night? No, no, not yet. But I shall do very shortly. Well, I think it's important that we stay on at the Mitre Inn for a few days. Is that all right with you, Watson? What could I say? I was in no hurry to return to London in what promised to become a scorching heat wave. A few extra days at Bishop's Cross would be pleasant enough without the interest of the Spanish doctor case. As for Holmes, well, he seemed very intrigued. But he offered Inspector Berry no advice at all. Perhaps because Berry seemed to have already made up his mind. I've tested Morton's shoes on the ground outside the surgery door. They fit exactly into the impressions left on the flower beds. I've also been up to the gypsy encampment. There are no caravans there. Of course, they could have taken fright and left, but uh, there's little evidence of wagon tracks. No sign of recent fires. Also there, there's a woman in the village who says she went up to the lodge to ask Dr. Lana to visit her sick daughter. The doctor didn't come to the surgery door when she rang. When she returned home, she also saw... Arthur Morton coming away from the gates. I think there's no doubt about it, Holmes. I'm issuing a warrant for his arrest. But to me, it's an open shut case. No publicity yet, of course, but I'll soon gather all the evidence I need. Good heavens, Holmes. I thought Inspector Barry said no publicity. Just look at this. Great banner headlines about the murder. And an early arrest of the local squire. Mm. Well, I believe that the news has spread quite far afield. I shouldn't be surprised if most of the national papers had similar reports. Well, how did they get these reports? Holmes, 
Holmes, this isn't your doing, is it? Me? Oh, why on earth should you think that, Watson? Because you've been so strangely secretive. You've allowed the inspector to have his head in this case. You haven't told him what your own views are or given him a single clue. And yet you insist on staying here. Now, come on. What's it all about, Holmes? Tell me. Well, it's a little early yet, Watson, but regarding the giving out of clues, what would you think if you found a washbowl filled with soap and black hairs and a body with calloused hands? Hmm? Well, I, I don't understand. No, I didn't for quite some time, but be patient, Watson. We must let the good inspector tread the wrong path in order to find the right one. A path that may bring Dr. Juan Lana back to life again. <laughs> Damn it all! I don't understand it, Holmes. I've been made to look a cracking ass, all right. Here it is, spread all over the newspapers, and I haven't got my case together yet. I should be a laughing stock. How did the news get out? I don't think you should despair, Barry. In fact, I think you're going to make a startling success of this case. You do? Well, I'm darned if I can see how. Supposing we decide to all get together in this case, hold a council of war. Well, I support that plan. As a matter of fact, I've been hoping for slightly more of a lead from you, Holmes. No, I know, I know. I've had my reasons for remaining in the background. Now, why don't we decide to spend the day quietly gathering together all the data possible? And then, say, at nine o'clock tonight, we meet at the lodge. You, me, Watson, Arthur Morton and his sister Francis, Bloggs, the manservant, and any others whom you may suggest. Ah. You must all be wondering why you've been invited to come here this evening. Well, the answer is quite simple. It's necessary to conclude the investigations into the death of a man found dead in this very room. Uh, firstly, let me set all your minds at rest. None of you is guilty of any crime. But one was murdered. Someone must have done it. With due respect, Miss Morton, that is incorrect. You see, Dr. Lana was not murdered. What? Ah, yet another guess. Uh, please be so good as to answer the front door blocks. What do you mean, Lana was not murdered? You mean it was just an accident, the result of a fight? Death was the result of a fight, but... Ah, uh, please do come in. I came as soon as I could. Oh, John, I should not believe it. Sir, I am extremely what? sorry to give you a shock like this, but I have to return. I could not let another man take the blame for murder. Now, look here. Just what is all this? Your doctor, Juan Lana, the owner of this house? Then what the devil... Who was murdered then? I think it was the doctor's twin brother, was it not, doctor? But perhaps you'd be good enough to tell us the whole story. Take your time and leave nothing out, however painful it may be for you or others in this room. Very well, thank you. I feel I must tell the tale to you, Francis. It is a tale of confession. This gentleman, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, who was responsible for bringing me back here, is quite right. The dead man is my brother, Stefan. I was born in Madrid, a twin... My father, who came of the best blood of old Spain, took his family to South America when we were very young. He did well, but was killed in the riots at San Juan when we were children. We were forced to earn our own living. Stefan and I were identical. No one could tell us apart. But as we grew older, there was clearly a difference in our temperament. I have to say this. From reaching manhood, Stefan developed evil ways. I grew up in horror of him, often taking the blame for his notorious behavior. I found my career in jeopardy. But I left the Argentine forever to seek happiness in Europe. I worked hard, got my degrees, and came here. For years I thought I was free of Stefan. I found you, Francis, and fell in love. I am still in love. Oh, Juan, my dear. Then, some while ago, I received a letter. Stefan had traced me. He was coming to see me. I immediately knew that the terror of my childhood would be repeated... She would bring disgrace upon me by impersonating me, borrowing money, causing scandals. I had to protect the one I loved. I broke off our engagement. It seemed the only thing to do. Why the devil didn't you tell us all this? Now, come clean. I am of proud Spanish blood. I am not an Englishman. Oh, get on, boys. What happened, doctor? The other night, he arrived. He had walked from York and said he was tired and ill. I was shocked. His appearance. He was just the same apart from sporting a thin moustache. But my medical knowledge told me that there was some serious internal malady. He'd been in a fight with some sailors from the ship he'd arrived in at Hull. His poverty contrasted with my own well-being. This angered him. I mean, he began to abuse me, demanding drink and money. He threatened and insulted me, using the most foul language. I am a hot-tempered man, but I remained master of myself, and I never raised a hand against him. My coolness only aggravated his anger. He raved and cursed, and then 
and he became contorted in a horrible spasm and clutching at his own throat fell to the carpet. His diseased heart had broken down. His own violence had killed him. Oh, Juan, my poor Juan. I couldn't face it. It seemed there was only one thing I could do. I changed places with him, shaved off his mustache, dressed him in my clothes and took these, the ones I stand up in. And your photograph I took as a remembrance, Francis. If I am guilty of a crime, it is one of deception, but not of murder. You do believe that, don't you, Francis? A subsequent investigation into the case of the Spanish doctor proved that Juan Lana had been speaking the truth. It was proved that his twin brother had traveled over in a cargo boat from South America and that the ship's doctor testified that Stefan had a weak heart and could well have died in the circumstances described. Two things were obvious, Watson. One, the fact that the dead man had been recently shaved. I found ample evidence of that in the wash basin. And the other was the state of the man's hands. A doctor does not do a rough seaman's job. I deduced that the dead man was not Dr. Lana. So? So it had to be someone who looked exactly like him. A twin brother was obvious. The rest was easy. A great deal of press publicity, a few telegrams to the nearest port of Hull, and that was that. Well, Inspector Berry can now tell the story and take the credit... I think we can proceed on our homeward journey now. Don't you, Watson? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage as Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Now, Watson, let me see if I can hit the target with ease. <coughs> oh, yes, good shot, Holmes. Yes, but I can't understand for the life of me why you wish to bring a leg of mutton out here into the park in order to shoot at it with a bow and arrow. You know, you've done some bizarre things in your time, but never anything as bizarre as this. But why not use an ordinary bullseye target? Now, come with me, Watson, you'll see. Yes. Now, you will observe that I've shot the meat cleanly in the center... The shaft of the arrow is deeply embedded. The arrowhead sticking out the other side. Now, just try and remove the arrow, will you, Watson? I think you'll understand my slight experiment. present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Crouch End Mystery. Over the years, I'd grown used to Sherlock Holmes' strange ways. I'd learned that he never did anything without a good reason. All the same, I was quite amazed one early morning in the month of May, 1893, to be asked to accompany him to Regent's Park, where he quietly indulged in an archery practice. I knew he was a keen toxophilite, but could not understand why he should practice on a large leg of mutton. It, it, it didn't make sense. Well... Try to extract the arrow, Watson. You're a strong man. Mm, very well. Anything to humor you, Holmes. <laughs> well, I must admit, it's extremely hard. <clears throat> I'm fine. Can't pull the arrow out. Right. Now, try pushing the arrow through and pulling from the other side. <clears throat> yes, it's considerably easier. It comes through quite cleanly. The feather flight gives no trouble. Exactly. Now, observe the marks that it's left. Small and round. Now, as a medical man, would you not say that this could be a bullet wound? The bullet passing right through the limb? Yes, I, uh, I suppose it could. Yes, I suppose so. Good. And that's why I've conducted this small experiment. We can go home for breakfast now, Watson. <laughs> Very well. What a strange way to start the day. Yes, and I fancy there'll be stranger things to follow. It all has to do with the mystery down at Burnham on Crouch, of course. Well, come, let's leave before we start attracting attention. Uh, this way. Well, oh, sounds like a visitor, Holmes. Are you expecting anyone? Well, I think it'll be Carter of Scotland Yard. He's engaged upon the Burnham on Crouch case. 
I've been advised that he wishes to consult me. Uh, Mr. Carter, sir, says he has an appointment. Oh, very good, Mr. Hudson. Show him in, please. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this way, please. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, do come and join us. Just a light breakfast. Uh, thank you, but I've already had an early meal at the hotel where I stayed overnight. I came up town from Burnham on Crouch to report to Scotland Yard, but thought I'd like a word with you first. And what have you to report? Total failure, I'm afraid. I'd hoped to impress Inspector Lestrade, but I've got nowhere. You've been informed of the case, Mr. Holmes. I've read all the available evidence, including the report of the inquest, very carefully. Uh, I believe there was a tobacco pouch found near the body. Did that tell you anything? Mm -hmm. It belonged to the dead man, sir. The initials were stamped on it. It was made of ostrich leather, and that fits. Mm. He lived at Oatswan in the Cape, South Africa, for many years. He was a heavy smoker? Uh, not according to his wife. We couldn't find a pipe, for instance. Hmm. Odd. I only mentioned the pouch because that seems the only tangible piece of evidence so far. Is uh, this a new case of murder, Holmes? Oh, I do beg your pardon, Watson. I've forgotten that you know little of this. Uh, take some coffee, Carter, and go over the case for us. I should be none the worse for hearing the sequence of events once more. Just give me the essentials. Very well. <clears throat> I have my notes here. Now, uh, yes. This is the rough career of one Nathan Savage, born about 50 years ago and lived the life of an adventurer. Well, it's an ostrich farm in South Africa and prospected for gold out there. Made and lost several fortunes. Yes, about five years ago, he retired to Burnham on Crouch to an estate called Crouch End, where he lived with his wife. He died in mysterious circumstances a few days ago in the grounds of his home. An absolute enigma. At times, strict and puritanical towards his wife and others, and other times, a drunkard who had the power of evil in him. An extremely unbalanced and dangerous man. Quite. He was feared by everyone, known on the gold fields as Mad Nat Savage, and lived up to the name. At Crouch End, he was loathed and avoided by the local people, he lived the life of a recluse. He had a small one-roomed cottage built by the stream in his garden, and no one, not even his wife, was allowed to enter it, with his hideaway and furnished with the uh, personal effects of all his travels. The curtains were always kept closed, he had no visitors. Savage lived alone there, yet at the inquest, Bob Leggett, a local farmer, gave one of the few positive bits of evidence we have to go on. He said, Or oh, it were about one o'clock in the morning. I'd been up attending a sick cow and I took a shortcut along the back lane to my home. Oh, you can see that hideaway cottage from the lane and there was a light on. I saw shadows across the curtains and Madna weren't alone. There were another man in there with him. I could see the outlines of them very clear. The other fellow were bearded and they were arguing something terrible. Oh, but that were on the Monday. Savage didn't get himself killed until Wednesday, so I suppose it don't mean much. But he did have a visitor with him on Monday night, and that's a fact. All the same, it might be significant. Don't you agree, Mr. Holmes? Every detail, however unimportant, is significant. An unknown visitor to a forbidden spot is most interesting. But uh, do continue. Hmm. Well, um, come the Wednesday, Savage went into one of his blackest moods. His wife, Grace, told the court about it in the frankest manner. She said, I knew those moods. He was a drunken wild beast who roamed the ground from the house looking for trouble. I locked myself in the upstairs room all day. At night, I came down to get food. I could see the lightless cottage. It was quiet. I thought he was in a drunken sleep. I went to bed and locked the door. At about two in the morning, I heard terrible yelling. Oh, I did the sensible thing. Pulled the blankets over my head and tried to ignore it all. Early the next morning, I went out. The door to the cottage was open. I went down the path towards the stream, and well, there, by the wooden bridge, he, he was lying on his back. I thought he was still drunk until, well, till I saw the, the blood on his chest. I just turned and ran, raised the alarm, called the police, and, well, that's all I know. I swear to you, that's all I know. I was called in. I inspected the grounds and the cottage. <laughs> Never been in such a strange place, filled with trophies, books, maps, and a clutter of bottles. <laughs> Smell to high heaven. Flies all over the bed. Horrible. Yes, it must have been. But you haven't yet told us how this man Savage died. Well, I'm coming to that. It's baffling. For it seems that there was a bullet wound went right through his chest under the heart, but no bullet. Just a small hole. And no one heard shooting. Police surgeon says he'd never seen anything like it. Hmm. Yes, so he was shot by a bow and arrow, Carter. Now you see the reason for my morning exercise in the park, Watson. Bow and arrow? How could he be sure of this, Holmes? Well, I can't. 
until I viewed the body and visited the scene of the crime. But from the nature of the wound, I thought it the only possible explanation. But there was no arrow found. Yeah, well, there couldn't be if the murderer wished to cover his tracks. Now, may I make a suggestion? By all means, Mr. Holmes. Well, then I propose that you do whatever reporting you have to do to Scotland Yard, and we catch the 12.30 train to Burnham on Crouch. If I remember, such a train has a dining car. Shall we risk the Eastern Line's luncheon? What do you say, Watson? Can you manage that? Oh, and we'd better take overnight bags, just in case. As usual, I could not refuse a trip with Sherlock Holmes. And after an hour or so's hasty rearrangement of my affairs, I was at the station in time to join him and Carter on the journey. It was uneventful and quite pleasant. We took a carriage from the station to Crouch End, where we met the widow of the dead man. She was a hard-looking woman, but quite charming, and was soon telling us of the years of hardship and ill usage which she had endured. My husband created havoc wherever he went, Mr. Holmes. Towards the end, everything he touched seemed to turn evil. I do confess, if I have any feelings left, there there was a relief rather than sorrow. There, I've said it. I've nothing to add. But just one question before we ask to see your husband's hideaway cottage. I understand there was a large knife found near the body. Have you identified it as belonging to your husband? Indeed, I have. What he was doing with it out there, I cannot say. He must have intended using it on someone. But he was stopped in time, thank heavens. Perhaps he was killed in self-defense. Who knows? Yes, who knows. But it's our duty to find out. Now, Carter, will you be good enough to lead the way to the cottage? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Savage. The cottage was, as Carter described, filthy and incredibly neglected. I could tell that from outside. Carter was about to insert the key into the door when he stopped. Hello. Someone has been tampering with the lock. Someone's been trying to force this window. Whoever it was fails again entry. Yes, well, open up, Carter. Yeah. yeah, nothing has been touched, I take it. Not well, since I was here last. Oh, good. I shall take the best part of an hour to examine this place. And I must go over the grounds, particularly to the spot where the body was found before dark. Yes, it'll take longer than I thought. Perhaps you can find an inn nearby where we can rest for an hour or two. I'm afraid we shall have to stay over, Watson. If someone tried to break in here last night, then the odds are that he or she will have another attempt this evening. I think we must be here to receive the intruder, don't you think? I'm agreeable to any plans you make, Holmes. Good, then please leave me. I prefer to work on places like this alone. Uh, give me an hour, just one hour, that's all. Thank you, Carter. It took well over the allotted hour to complete his examination of the hideaway cottage and the surrounding grounds. He even ventured into the neighboring fields and appeared well pleased to discover it hadn't rained in those parts for some weeks. And the set of horse and cart tracks that led to a small copse were fresh and clear-cut. We then paid a visit to the local mortuary and inspected the body of Mad Nat Savage. I'm used to seeing death, but it wasn't a pleasant visit. And I found myself agreeing with Holmes regarding the cause of death. By the time we got to the Hare and Hounds Inn, it was quite dark. We had a short rest, and then, fortified by an excellent home-cooked supper, we journeyed back to Crutch End Estates, where Carter was anxiously waiting for us. <coughs> Thought you weren't coming back, Mr. Holmes. I'd been here for eight. Good. Then you must know that no one has yet arrived and tried to enter the cottage. No. No, no, no. no that's good. Well, we better settle down. It may be a long wait. It was some hour and a half later, as I was nodding off, my back against a large oak tree, that Holmes touched me lightly upon the shoulder. Someone was moving about along the wall of the cottage. There was a silence, a step in the gravel, and some metallic scraping. The lock of the door was forced. It opened. A match was struck. A candle lit. Holmes motioned for Carter and me to follow. The man inside the cottage was young and slender. He commenced a search amongst the books. Having found one, he returned to the light and began paging through it, then sighed and snapped the book closed. Carter stepped forward and took command. Stay where you are. What? Don't move. Where the police? What? Oh, I should have known you'd still be watching this place. I suppose you now imagine I'm connected in some way with the death of Nathan Savage. I assure you, I am quite innocent. Well, that's first to decide. Let's start with your full name. Nigel Sykes. I see. Initials N.S. And what may I ask are you doing here? Oh, is this a casual conversation or an interrogation? It's a police investigation. Then perhaps I'd better wait until I can have a lawyer present. If you are innocent, it would be better to speak up without fear of the consequences. Oh, very well. Did you ever hear of Hewitt and Sykes, the West Country bankers? No, never. Yes. They failed for half a million pounds years ago. 
The ruination of many wealthy families in Devon and Cornwall, is that right? True. Sykes was my father. Ah, interesting. Please continue. Yeah, but keep it short and straight. Well, I was a boy at the time, but I always believed in my dad. I never believed that he stole the securities like everyone else. He swore he could turn them to good use and every creditor would be paid in full. He left us a list of the securities he had taken and swore he would come back once his honour had been cleared. He left by sea for South Africa and no one ever saw or heard from him again. We believed the securities were lost with him at sea. Then a short while ago, I discovered through a business friend that some of the securities had come onto the London market. I spent months trying to trace them. I discovered the original seller was a Mr. Nathan Savage, the owner of Crouch End. I had to find out what he knew of my father. But before we could meet, he met his death by someone else's hands. I attended the inquest. There was mention of logbooks, diaries here in this hideaway cottage of his. And you tried to get in here last night. You failed. You tried again now, and you still haven't found what you wanted. Is that not so? There is an old diary here. The pages dealing with the time of my father's disappearance have been ripped out. Mad Nat Savage covered his tracks well. That's the truth. I have nothing else to add. I've told you the whole truth. I never even spoke to Nat Savage, and I know nothing of his murder. Is that so? Then how do you account for this? A tobacco pouch for the initials N.S. Not Nat Savage, as we'd first thought, but Nigel Sykes. Well, well where did you get that from? I thought I... You I... dropped it near the body, Mr. Sykes. I think you'd better not say any more. Take your own advice and wait for a proper lawyer. Not that I think he will be able to get you out of this in a hurry. Well, I think it's been a good night's work. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Shall you return to London in the morning? We did not return to London the next morning. For in spite of the lateness of our going to bed, Holmes was up at dawn. And having borrowed a bicycle from the landlord of the Hare and Hounds, seemed to have travelled over a large area of Burnham and Southminster. He joined me for a hearty breakfast. Well, oh, Watson, what do you think of things? Well, you've been up to something, Holmes, I can tell, but you're not at all satisfied with Carter's conclusions, are you? I'm disappointed in that young man. I'd hoped for better things from him. One of the first rules of criminal investigation is never to accept the obvious as the end result. You have an alternative to the arrest of Nigel Sykes? Of course. Ah, here is Carter himself. Now we shall hear the latest news. Uh, well, Carter, have you extracted a confession from young Sykes? No, not yet. But he will talk sooner or later. He faces a full-scale interrogation at the yard this afternoon. Ah, and we shall have to conclude the case before that. Neither Watson nor I can afford to be away from Baker Street longer than lunchtime. <laughs> What does that mean, Mr. Holmes? Well, simply that you've got the wrong man, Carter. What? Just look at certain facts. Young Sykes is simply not the type who would have defied Nat Savage. He cannot have been the man heard to be arguing with Savage in the cottage two nights before he was killed. Sykes is clean-shaven. The man we're after has a beard. You may still be after a murderer who uses a gun and killed with a bullet. I'm convinced the man is an expert archer. Now ask yourself, who carries a bow and arrow around with him these days? <laughs> Blessed if I know. No one. Well, that's why your theory is so implausible. No, not at all. The art of archery is to kill swiftly and silently. In other words, to hunt. And hunt without being hurt. Oh, it still doesn't make sense to me. Look, Mr. Holmes, if you've got something up your sleeve, then don't hide it. Let's have it straight. No, you can have it straight, as you call it. In exactly one hour, Carter. All you have to do is to conceal yourself in the loft of the stables of this inn at 11 o'clock. What you see and hear will surprise you, I have no doubt. Oh, and make sure that there are armed men at your disposal, won't you? We shall all feel very much more secure. Uh, will you excuse me now? I have messages to send off from the post office. The fast tables at the back in one hour. And this time, I don't think we shall have to wait all that long before arresting the right man. Me to come here. I had never have taken this risk. Well, I didn't send for you. You sent for me. But this is ridiculous. I, I've your note here with me. I sent no note. I tell you. Then what? What does? You must discover something. It's a trap. Come on, let's get away from here quickly. Quickly now, quickly. Move yes. if I were you. There are what? men surrounding the stables and up there in the loft. Oh, what the devil? Get out of my way. Call him, Carter. Call your men. Bar the door. Here we are. Both of you. There's no way out. What? 
I, I demand another reason for this. We'll give you every reason if you can explain your relationship with Mrs. Savage. Just what is your name, sir? Find out. His name is Dylan Drew. He was no partner of Nat Savage's long ago in South Africa. Before Savage married Grace and came back to this country, isn't that so, Drew? You are the man who befriended Nigel Sykes' father and made an enemy out of Savage. You are the bearded man who dogged Savage for weeks and then cold-bloodedly murdered him. No, no, it wasn't like that. He did it to save me. Dylan killed Nat when he saw he was about to attack me with that hunting knife. He was mad with drink and accused me of betraying him. I'm the one that would have been dead if Dylan hadn't shot him. Shot him with a bow and arrow, correct? <laughs> well, you seem to have it all worked out, mister. Yes, that's how I killed Mad Nat. I didn't murder him. I killed him. Grace is right. I did it just in time. Someone should have done it years ago. He was evil all the way through. There were the three of us back in the old days. Nat Savage, Tom Sykes and me. Sykes had securities and was about to make a great deal of money from them out in South Africa. Then he uh, disappeared. I found out later that Mad Nat had stolen all his possessions and had him killed. I got proof of that eventually by tearing pages out of Nat's diary. I kept them. Nat disappeared, then I started the long search after him. You knew he'd come back to England and buried himself somewhere in the country. Might I suggest that you aspired to the life of a gypsy, travelling by horse and caravan through the southern counties, earning a living as a tinker and poaching game and fowl by the use of a bow and arrow. Old-fashioned, but extremely effective. <laughs> you have it all worked out, like I say, yes. That's about it. Then I found him here. It was an old score I had to settle. I, I tried to squeeze money out of him. Threatened to expose him for what he was, a cheat and a murderer. He promised payment, but I, I knew he wasn't to be trusted. I arrested my caravan in a nearby clearing in the woods and watched him night and day. Then he went wild, got drunk and ran berserk. Grace heard him, came down and tried to calm him. He went after her with a knife. As he chased her across the bridge, she stumbled. He was standing in a patch of moonlight as he raised the knife to strike. I took aim. I couldn't miss. It, it's exactly as he said. I was about to be killed. Uh, I pushed the arrow right through him. Washed it clean in a stream. Strange. It was over so quickly, and he hardly made a sound. We agreed to leave the body to be discovered later. It gave me good time to get myself and the caravan out of the district. We agreed not to meet for some time until the scandal had all died down, and... And I reckon we'd have got away with it if it hadn't been for this trick of forcing us together. How did you manage to trace me? Put all this together? Elementary. You left clear tracks of your horse-drawn caravan. If you were implicated, you would not take the chance of remaining alone for long. You thought you'd find safety in numbers, so you joined up with a camp of genuine gypsies. They're outside Southminster at this very moment. I traced them. I made inquiries about you and left a note that I was sure would bring you back here. I sent a similar message to Mrs. Savage. It was the only way I could effectively get a confession out of you. Yes, I think the rest is up to you, Carter. I'm sure you'll handle it without further help from me. Well, shall we go, Watson? We can catch that lunchtime train as planned. We did catch the train and in plenty of time. Once again, I sat back in my seat and pondered over Holmes' extraordinary ability to piece facts together from starting at the right places. It was the nature of the wound that intrigued me, Watson. Once I was sure it was a bow and arrow that was used, I naturally had to look for the sort of man who could use that weapon. It had to be an old-timer, not a youngster like Nigel Sykes. Yes. But Holmes, there's still that wretched tobacco pouch. Ah, Sykes will have a bit of explaining to do there. You see, he did go to Crouch End on the night of the murder. And he found the body. His were the screams that people heard in the dead of the night. Unfortunately, he drops the pouch. If we hadn't traced Dylan Drew, that might have landed him in the dock. As it is... Well, one wonders just what he'll do, what's left of his father's securities. Interesting speculation. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes, with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Oh, how wonderful. John, I've got a letter from my brother Percy down at Nettlebed. Oh, what of it, Mary, my dear? I hope he's well. Yes, yes, he says everything in his parish is going very nicely. 
But he recalled that next weekend is our anniversary. And he suggests that we go down to stay with him at the vicarage for the weekend. Oh, and uh, you rather like the idea. Oh, yes. We could go to church on a Sunday at St. Anne's, where we were married just a year ago. Oh, John, dear, do say yes. <laughs> Very well, my dear. If I can arrange it, I agree. And Percy also extends an invitation to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. John, dear, do you think you can persuade him to accept? Wouldn't that be quite splendid? We present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tragedy at Nettlebed. I had been married at Little Bit Church in the parish of her brother, the Reverend Percy Phelps. She'd now been Mrs. Watson for a year, and the most happy year it had been. My only regret during all that time was that I'd been forced to leave Sherlock Holmes alone in the rooms at 221B Baker Street. Of course, I'd never lost touch. I saw him several times a week, and was still able to give him assistance whenever he asked for it. I wondered if he wouldn't be bored by the prospect of a weekend in the country. But I was duty-bound to ask him. I knew I'd get a direct reply to my invitation. Your anniversary, is it, Watson? I'm so sorry, I'd forgotten. Time passes so quickly, and the last year has simply flown by. It's very generous for the Reverend Phelps to extend the invitation to include me. Well, I I'll quite understand if you simply say that you don't want to go, Holmes. I shall explain that you're too busy. Although, if you can manage it, it'll make Mary very happy. Oh, I have very many happy memories of Nettlebed. It's within the area of Great Paddock, isn't it? Yes, now, that rings a bell. Let me see, where are my scrapbooks? I think this is the one. Now, let's see. If you recall, I started making up these books some years ago. They're press cuttings and many unsolved murders. I think just about six months ago, there was a most interesting case. No one ever caught a man who strangled his wife in one of the woods. I think it was Great Foxwood. And the man's name was Perryman. Yes, now let's see. Perryman. Ah, oh, yes, 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 here we are. Yes, I was right. Some seven months back, Arthur Perryman. Yes, that was the man's name. According to all these reports, he found out his wife had been unfaithful. One night he simply ran amuck, and following her to an assignation in Great Foxwood, he strangled her and then disappeared. The police traced him to Southampton, where he gave them the slip, and it's assumed that he managed to get out of the country. One of the few unsolved murders of the year. Interesting. Yes, I did read something about it. I know, Mary was rather upset as it occurred on the lands of Sir Rodney Trimble, who happens to be a great friend of her brother's. Well, frankly, she hasn't been back to Nettlebed since that tragedy occurred. And yet, of course, she's prepared to now. Well, well this is a very special occasion. She, she wouldn't want to turn down the Reverend's in, invitation if she wants to. It, 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 she's a god to go. <laughs> well, the whole thing is most understandable. And, of course, I shall be happy to accompany you, Watson. Well, Holmes, you will, but that's, that's excellent. We shall all be so pleased. Now... I doubt if I should be able to leave until lunchtime on Friday. Mary will probably go down a day or two earlier, so uh, can you manage the 2.30 train from Euston on Friday, Holmes? Holmes agreed to the arrangement, and Mary was delighted. She sent a telegram to her brother, saying she'd be with him midweek, and that Holmes and I would arrive late on Friday afternoon. The plan worked perfectly. Our train was on time at Great Paddock Station, and a pony and trap was waiting for us. And I'd recognized the driver. It was Ben Crump, who worked for Sir Rodney Trimble. Afternoon, Dr. Watson. Afternoon, sir. You must be Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Climb in. Ah, uh, thank you. It's nice to see you, Ben. But uh, why are you meeting us? You still working for Sir Rodney? Uh, that's right, but uh, 
Well, the Reverend and your wife, they've both been out all day. So I was asked to take the trap and fetch you. There's no need to worry. I'll be home by the time you get there. <clears throat> are you comfortable, are you? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Thank you, Ben. Hey, come on in, Bessie. Come on. Up we go. Up we go. Oh, this old one. <laughs> Yes, you'll find her way back to St. Anne's without anyone holding the reins. I know. Bessie's a great favorite of my brother-in-law's. It's been a good year for you up at the hall, Ben. Times are hard, Dr. Watson. He's cut back a lot on entertaining. This weekend be the first time he's planned to shoot for nearly a year. Oh, planning a shoot over the weekend, is he? Tomorrow, the weather holds. I reckon you two gentlemen will be invited. You, uh, you like to shoot, Mr. Holmes? I'm considered quite a good shot, yes. Oh, he's one of the very best. What do you go for here? Pheasants? Woodcock? That's right. Now, there's plenty of them to be flushed out. Just hope when the beaters start, we can cut the birds off from heading to Great Fox Wood. Great Fox Wood? Ah, yes. That's where there was a murder some few months ago. Is that right? No, that's right. We, uh, we don't talk about that round here, Mr. Holmes. Some things is best forgotten. If you want to be a friend to Sir Rodney's and everyone else in these parts, well, you won't ever mention it. You got my meaning? Oh, now it looks like rain clouds over there. Come on, Bess, let's get on with it. Get us home. Within half an hour, we were at the vicarage. And all thoughts of Ben Crumb's warning had faded from my mind. It was a wonderful reunion. Percy Phelps was warm in his welcome, and Mary radiant to be able to play hostess for him as she used to in the old days. Dinner was delicious, and we sat by a pine log fire afterwards, taking coffee and liqueurs. It was a most pleasant domestic seat. Ah, what could be more delightful than having one's family and dear friends gathered around one's own heart? Uh, I am so happy to see you all. Oh, I do wish you the very best of health. May you enjoy being here this weekend as much as I shall enjoy having you. It's quite wonderful. I'm so pleased that you came with John, Mr. Holmes. I took very little persuading, I can assure you, Mary. The only thing that amazes me is that a whole year has passed since you were married. It seems but a few months. Oh, oh, oh. wait until you try marriage, Holmes. A year with the wrong person might seem like ten. <laughs> well, here's to the next ten years for you, John, and for you, Mary. Oh, thank you, dear. To a very happy couple. <laughs> Uh oh, oh dear, now who can that Now be? don't you get up, Percy, dear. Let me go and answer the door. I shan't be a moment. You men stay where you are and enjoy your drink. <sighs> well, I must congratulate you, John. <laughs> You've made my sister the happiest woman in the world. I always thought she would become a contented woman, but I never believed that within a year she could change so much. Well, she looks and sounds years uh, younger. Well, I refuse to believe that I brought her more happiness than she's brought me. Well, I suppose we're just very lucky, that's all. Yes, 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 you are. And I hope and pray that luck continues. Well, I see no reason why it shouldn't. Percy, <laughs> look who's here. Huh? Sir Rodney, oh. who's just walked over from <laughs> the hall. Do come in, Sir Rodney. Thank you, my dear. Oh, Sir Rodney, what a lovely surprise. And you've arrived at just the right time. John Watson is here and also Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, as long as I'm not intruding upon a family reunion. Hello, Watson. So nice to see you. Yes. And, and of course, I, I've heard much about you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, welcome to Nettlebed. <laughs> <laughs> so nice yeah, to you. Do join us for coffee and a drink, will you, Sir Rodney? Oh, thank you. Thank you, but no, I, I can but stop a moment. I called to find out if your guests had arrived, Reverend, and if you'd all care to join us up at the hall in our first shoot of the season. I think we've heard you of this, Sir Rodney. The old man Crump said something about it when he drove us up from the station. And I remember thinking, uh, well, very selfishly, that I hoped I'd get an invitation. Oh, good <laughs> man. That means you'll accept it. <laughs> Only too willingly. And you, Holmes? How can I refuse? I shall look forward to it. Uh, it's no good asking me, of course, but uh, Mary will, I'm sure, be delighted to join you all at the hall and act as hostess. She, she's extremely good at organizing things like refreshments. <laughs> <laughs> Would you consent, Mary, my dear? I do confess that I am in need of such help. And I'd be very, very grateful. 
The servants will do all the preparations, of course, but I need someone to be with the field carriages to serve refreshments to the guests. Oh, well, of course, I'd love it. I have done a little of that sort of thing on other occasions, so I know I can manage it, and it means I'll be able to watch John and Mr. Holmes in action. Will there be many guests, and shall I know any of them? There are about a dozen, including yourselves, mostly local people, a few from town... Oh, the only one you might know is David Endicott. David? Uh, oh, how silly of me. I've spilt my wine. Who, who did you say? David Endicott. Yes, I, um, I think I did meet him many years ago. I, I doubt if he'll remember me, though. Well, uh, well uh, I must be on my way. Uh, don't bother to see me out. I know my way. Uh, good night to all. I'll expect you up at the hall nice and early tomorrow morning. We want to start the first party to drive at about ten o'clock, so shall we say no later than 9.30? Good night to you all. Thank you so much. Good night, night, Sir Rodney. After Sir Rodney had left, the talk became general. But I noticed that Mary was very quiet. We retired early. And the moment that we were in our room, she gave a little sob and placed her arms around me. Oh, John... John, John. Mary, 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 my dear, what is it? Oh, John, I didn't think it would ever happen. You remember many years ago that that I told you I I was engaged to be married and and that the man walked out on me. I was jilted. Davis, that was years ago. What does that matter now? We're happily married. You put all that behind me. No, no, listen to me, please, dear. The man I was to have married... Is this man David Endicott? He will be at the shoot tomorrow and... and John, I... I am so afraid. So very afraid. Afraid? You mean you're, you're afraid of meeting this man from your past? Yes, I am. Afraid of... Of what might happen. You think you... You might still feel... Attracted to him? Oh, no, dear. No, nothing like that. No, it's... It, it's just that that I have found out so much more about him, and then, John, I'm convinced that he is evil. David Endicott is an evil man and can only bring tragedy to little bed. I'm sure of it. I had never seen Mary so upset. Of course, she did claimed to me before we were married that she'd suffered an unhappy love affair years ago. But I'd never inquired the man's name or asked for any details. Now we were to confront him the following day. I reassured my wife, told her that nothing could possibly go wrong, that she was to get a good night's sleep and it would all seem less formidable in the morning. But I was disturbed in my own mind. And I should have been even more so if I'd known what was going on at the hall that very evening. Ah, now that's better. Uh, David, I, I think the time has come for us to have a little talk. Hmm? Yes, Sir Rodney, what is on your mind? Surely you don't mind me helping myself to a slight nightcap? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, although I, I think I should be honest and say that you seem to be drinking far more heavily than ever... It's no way out, you know. Uh, no way out from what? From the sort of dissipated life that you're leading, that you have led for so many years. Oh, dear. Am I going to end my first day here with a moral lecture? Uh, yes, uh, yes, if that is what you wish to call it. This is still my house, and I must ask you to respect the fact that I have many guests tomorrow. You are part of the weekend, and I hope you enjoy yourself. You're a good shot and should be very useful in the team. But please, I, I know what you're like on these occasions. You can no more keep your hands off a woman than you can the whiskey bottle. I won't stand for it tomorrow. Well, that sounds more like a threat than a lecture. Why don't you just ask me to leave right now? You know full well that I can't do that. Please, David, it's important. And there are lots of really nice people coming down. One of them is someone I think you used to know very well. Mary Phelps, the vicar's sister. She's now married to Dr. Watson, who is also a member of our party. Mary? Little Mary Phelps? 
Well, well, well. She is no longer little Mary Phelps. She's Mrs. John Watson, and she's a grown woman. Mature, sensible, and very happy. Just make sure that you don't cause trouble, David. If you do, in any way, then I shall no longer protect you or give you further warnings. I shall kill you. Morning dawned bright and clear, but with a sharp wind. Mary and I were up early. She seemed pale and tense, but quite determined to go through with the day as it had been planned. The Reverend Phelps had been called out during the night to sit with a sick person in the neighboring village. And of Sherlock Holmes, there was no sign. We were having coffee in the morning room when he marched in from the garden, fully dressed and flushed from a brisk walk. Ah, coffee, what a splendid idea. Good morning, Watson. Morning, Mary. Good morning. A black with two sugars. Yes, very well. I'll pour it for you. Come and sit down. Uh, morning, Holmes. You're up and about early. I thought it as well to take a look at the lie of the land before embarking on any practical shooting. Sir Rodney has his drives all marked out, and the beaters are gathered in force. Mm, sounds very promising. Yes, yes, it does. The only trouble is the wind. From what I can make out of the planned shoot... The first drive should flush the birds out from over the land known as Barnes Bridge in the low meadows. If the wind freshens more than it is, then the birds will be taken over the farm and into Great Fox Wood. Great Fox Wood? That's right. I understand that no one likes to talk about that wood and what happened there some seven months ago. No, no, it was horrible. Even Percy refuses to discuss it. No one ever goes in there these days. And you don't know why? No, no one does. It's a forbidden subject, you see. Something no one talks about. Oh, yes, they do, amongst themselves. During my early morning walk, I came across the man Ben Crump. He's acting head marker, placing sticks with names on them where he wants the guns to be standing. I greeted him, and he didn't seem at all pleased to see me. Well, <clears throat> morning, Mr. Holmes. What were you doing down here at this hour? Oh, just finding my bearings. I see you're placing the guns. That's it. Anxious to keep the partridge out of Great Foxwood? Why? Because the beaters will refuse to go in there? They think it's evil? How did you come to know that? Oh, rumors spread very quickly in the country, as you know. Have you any theories of your own, then? I just do my job. So, I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Holmes. These beaters are fine men, but you won't get any of them in that wood. Not even in daylight. Because that's where the murder took place? Not just that. They say... They say it's haunted. That that man, Arthur Perryman, who strangled his wife because she was unfaithful to him, he, he hanged himself in there... And then they can see his body rotten from a tree. They seriously believe this. Oh, I, not only that, it, it, his spirit comes back and haunts the wood. I don't reckon I believe it myself. I knew Perryman. He's a violent man, wild, jealous. The folks around here swear they've seen his ghost. Now, so that's how the matter stands. We just got to do our best to see that the birds don't take us into Great Fox Wood. It's the wind that's the trouble. It's the wind. So, it seems we're in for a very interesting morning, doesn't it, Watson? Very interesting. Well, I do believe this is the real reason why I accepted the invitation to this weekend. Now, really, it's too bad of you, Holmes. Why can't you leave things alone and not turn a pleasant day's outing into a criminal investigation? I suppose because it's my job, Watson. Are you ready to go? I was annoyed with Holmes. I'd suspected all along. He was far more interested in the unsolved murder than he was in celebrating my wedding anniversary. I was also worried about Mary and this man, David Endicott. I wondered what they would think of each other. But when they met, everything seemed perfectly normal. David, uh, you must meet Dr. Watson and his wife. Uh, you remember Mary? Oh, of course I do. How could I forget her? Hello, Mary. How wonderful to see you again after all these years. And your husband? Very pleased to meet you, Dr. Watson. Congratulations. I can see you've made Mary a very happy woman. Thank you. I'm pleased to meet you also. You're looking well, David. I hope you are happy also. Oh, very. Watson, can I show you the shooting positions? Ben has them marked out this way. Come along, David. Coming, Sir Rodney. I hope we can meet again later, Mary. I have such a lot to tell you. You're looking quite lovely. Oh, I've been such a fool. I made my biggest mistake over you. I shall be in touch. David! Coming! Goodbye, Mary, my dear. Sir Rodney called us all to order. The party was divided up, and we set out for the first drive. I found myself in a gun position next to Holmes, with David Endicott on the far side. 
The beaters began work, and suddenly the wind freshened. Almost at once, the partridge began to leave cover and fly straight overhead. Whistles shrilled. The birds came on. They were easy targets. But to my sheer surprise, Holmes hardly produced a shot. And when he did, it was as though he deliberately aimed wild. The whole covey got through. And heading over the farm, settled gently in Great Foxwood. Holmes! Holmes, what the devil's the matter with you? You and Watson have let them all through. They're in Great Fox. Come on, men. We must beat them out. The men won't go in there, sir, I mean. Damn it, they'll have to go in there. We need them ourselves. Come on, men. Come on. Follow me. There was no time for more talk. We all felt pretty guilty at this failure, and I was determined to see that it didn't occur again, even if I had to drop Holmes' birds myself. But once we landed in the woods, we found it more difficult than we'd thought. Every possible tree seemed to have been planted there. The place was overgrown, and one could scarcely get through the jungle-like foliage. I found myself with Endicott and Holmes, with Sir Rodney to our left shouting orders. Forward! Forward! Men! There's the left! Holmes, Holmes, you right? Yes, yes. Take a grip on your gun, Watson, and make sure it's fully loaded. Come on! We may well have to use it soon. Yeah. Look, there's a clearing. There. Stop. Now, 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 wait a moment. Oh, come on, men! Come on! Stop him! Stop him! It's coming! I think it's coming! Watch out! <laughs> Great! Evans, what is it? It's, it's like a wild dog. Hey, watch out! Keep away! Run! It's the only thing! Run! Stop him! Stop him! Hey, shoot! 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 Watson, shoot! Shoot! Great heavens! What's happened? David! Um, this creature... That creature, Sir Rodney, is Arthur Perryman. The man who seven months ago strangled his wife in these woods. And then went mad and has been living here almost as an animal ever since. Poor devil. It's just as well that it's all over for him. And as for David Endicott... Well, you'd better see what you can do for him. Haven't you, Watson? I knelt beside the still form of David Endicott in the depths of Great Foxwood. I had to tear Perryman's hands away from him. Endicott was badly savaged about the face and throat. Of course, the whole shoot was called off. The guests departed with as much dignity as they could muster, and the police were called in. It wasn't until we were all safely back in the vicarage and Percy Phelps was dispensing stiff drinks that Holmes was able to complete his summing up. I'm sorry that the weekend started so badly, but I'm sure it was most necessary to solve the problem. You see, I checked most thoroughly in London before we came down here on the Perryman murder. I was sure that the police were quite wrong in thinking that Arthur Perryman had managed to escape after killing his wife. He hadn't left the country, yet no one had picked up a hint about him for over seven months. There was a rumor of a ghost in the woods. Could it be that Perryman was still there? There is a disused hut in the clearing. He'd lived there, crazed and wild. It was necessary to bring matters to a head. Of course, when he recognized David Endicott, his murderous intent flooded back. For it was Endicott who was his late wife's lover, the cause of his breakdown. It was Endicott who had a hold over Sir Rodney and was sponging off him, bleeding him white. And it is Endicott who now lies very ill in Great Paddock Hospital. I think that justice has been done. And perhaps many doubts removed from everyone's mind. Don't you agree, Watson? Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watts. Uh, there's one thing I cannot understand, Watson. I'm relieved to hear that, Holmes. You can usually explain everything away. Now, what is it that confounds you? Accountancy. Oh. I've often thought it would be worth my while to engage a lady's secretary who could put my affairs in order, but... Ah, I do confess I cannot cope with balancing these bills. You're in financial trouble, Holmes? No, I don't think so, but then you see, I understand these banking statements so little I can't be sure. Oh, well. I shall simply have to rely upon my bank manager's judgment. 
What a bore earning a living is. Present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, the unpaid debt. I knew very little about Sherlock Holmes' financial affairs, but I knew better than to try, and to offer to help would have been regarded as an insult. On the very morning when he placed aside his account books with a weary sigh, Mrs. Hudson announced a visitor. Lord Edison to see you, sir. Oh. Oh, he's not made an appointment, but I think I have the time. Uh, Ask him in, will you please, Mrs. Hudson? Please come this way, my lord. Thank you. Mr. Holmes, I'm so sorry to call without making an appointment, but I was passing this way and rang the bell upon a sudden impulse. If this intrusion's inconvenient... Not at all, no, not at all. Uh, This is my friend and colleague, Dr. John Watson. Good morning. Uh, We worked together on many of my cases. Please feel free to speak openly in front of him. (coughs) Very well. Uh, Do sit down. Uh, Smoke if you wish. I'm about to enjoy a pipe myself. Thank you. Mm. Ah. Now, I can tell that something's disturbing you. What made you rise so early and walk here through Regent's Park? Do you normally suffer from insomnia? Gracious. How could you have guessed that? Your boots are muddy. Earth clogged under the instep. Earth that has dried with leaves and the seeds of shrubs. Only one place near here where you could have picked that up. We had a shower early on, about seven o'clock. Since then, it's been a fine day. So, you must have walked out early as your coats and hats are still damp. You cut yourself whilst shaving and you're wearing cufflinks that do not match. All this indicates a distressed state of mind for a man of your station. Can I help you, my lord? I sincerely hope so, Holmes. The fact is that, like most men who have a townhouse and a cottage in the country, by the time of settlement taxes, I have very little money left. I uh, know exactly what you mean. Uh, Pray continue. Not only that, but uh, my pride has been hurt. I'll be frank, I'm something of a gambler. Not a week passes without I have a few friends in to dinner and a game afterwards. I did so a couple of nights or so ago. It was, on the whole, a lamentable evening. You lost heavily? No. No, on the contrary, I won a considerable amount. Hmm. I bet you better start from the very beginning and tell me everything that happened. You knew the people with whom you played? Oh, yes, yes, quite well. The party consisted of two men, a woman and myself. We were playing poker. One of the men was an American friend, Joe Van Heimer, over here on a short stay. The other man was Ernest Hardcastle, the son of a very old friend, Lionel Hardcastle. The lady was a charming widow, Mrs. Amanda Vane. We spent a most pleasant evening, the play going one way and then another, and the hour grew very late. Eventually, we decided upon one last game. Then came the time to settle up. Well, I guess that's enough for one night for me. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, I quite understand, Mr. Van Heimer. It's been quite a long evening. How do I stand? I think I've made money tonight. Fifty pounds, yes? Uh, you're right. Joe here owes you that. I seem to have been the lucky one. And I, the unlucky one. How much do I owe you? As much as three and a half thousand, I'm afraid, Ernest. Oh, well, it's yours tonight, mine next week. I'm afraid I shall not be able to write you a check on my own account this evening. The fact is that I'm overdrawn already, but dear Papa will help out. He always does. Will it be all right if I arrange things with him and then I'll send a check round in the course of tomorrow? Yes, yes, of course, of course. (coughs) Well, I guess I can pay you out in cash and uh, and get me a handsome back to the Dorchester. Oh, there's no need. I have a carriage waiting in the courtyard below. I should be only too pleased to drive home that way. What about you, Ernest? uh, I think I'll walk. It isn't far. Clear my head. Just as you wish. Oh, dear. What a mess we've made of this room. 
Your servants will despise us when they come to clear away. Oh, that'll not be until late tomorrow morning. I'm leaving everything just as it is, and I've given orders not to be disturbed. Oh. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's good night. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, and we'll be in touch. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> good night, Amanda. Good night, good night. Joe. Good night. Bad luck, Ernest. Oh, I'm only lending you the money. Oh, I'll take it off you again next week. Father will settle up tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for a lovely evening. I have enjoyed myself. Good night. Good night, Amanda. Good night, night, Joe. Good night. Good night. As you say, a profitable evening. Well, there seems no trouble there. Did the check arrive the next day? Two days later. It was an open check, and I went round to Ernest's bank to cash it. Imagine my surprise when they refused to do so. They stamped it not payable. The check had been stopped. Why, I don't know. You think that Ernest's father refused? Well, 3000 is well, it's quite a lot of money. Perhaps he decided that he couldn't afford it. No, no, no. Hardcastle has more money than he knows what to do with and he must have given Ernest the money to put in his own account before he could write me out the check. But why was it stopped? Why did Ernest write out a check and then have it stopped immediately? Well, it is very strange, isn't it? But why come to me? What makes you think I can do anything about it? Well, frankly, I'm afraid of some sort of scandal. Lionel Hardcastle's an extremely influential man. If he and his son feel they have a good reason for stopping that check, then I'm on dangerous ground. If I tell people that Ernest has welched on a debt, his honour will be questioned. He'll naturally defend himself, and there'll be the most almighty scandal. Every club in London will be gossiping. I can't afford that. Frankly, I need to clear this matter up silently, and I need to be paid the money that I've won. I need the cash. Mm, I see. But uh, if Ernest Hardcastle is indeed a, a friend of yours, then can't you quietly call upon him and chat this over in a friendly manner? Ask him man to man what the trouble is. I've tried that. I knew that Ernest would be at his club at lunchtime yesterday and made a point of being there. I came across him in the billiard room. Ah, Ernest. Hello. Very man I wish to see. Look here, what is all this nonsense over that check? Uh, do you think this is quite the right place to discuss such things? It's as good as any other, isn't it? Come, a short answer. Well, this is deuced awkward. I, I'm most fearfully sorry, but the, the fact is that, well... My father ordered me to stop payment. But why? I don't know. Honestly, I don't. I simply received a message from him ordering me to stop payment to you. You know what father is like. I, I have to obey, obey him no matter what he asks, and I, I simply don't know why he demanded that I did so. Oh, excuse me now. I, I have to play. And that was that. I don't feel like having an open confrontation with Lionel Hardcastle himself. I thought I'd call on you. You have a reputation of solving delicate problems with discretion. Thank you. Then, will you help? I will try. I have my own methods, of course. I must be allowed complete freedom. No, oh, you shall have it. Uh, regarding payment, as I've told you, I am rather hard up at the present. That's why I need that check. So, uh... Uh, The debt is for 3500 not so? I take it that you would be happy with the round figure of 3000 my bank manager would be pleased to accept the rest. Good day, Lord Edgerton. I couldn't help smiling at the way Holmes neatly adjusted his bank balance that morning, for I'd no doubt that he would succeed in straightening matters out. It was a simple matter for a man of his reputation to gain an audience with the millionaire Lionel Hartcastle. Glad of this opportunity to make your acquaintance, Holmes. Wish it could have been made in other circumstances. Thank you. I've been as frank as I can. I'm representing Lord Edgerton, who feels too embarrassed by the circumstances to call himself. Mm, appreciate that. If the expression does not appear too jocular, I shall lay my cards on the table. At the general settlement of that poker game, your son had to pay Lord Edgerton £3,500. He agreed to pay the debt. You advanced him the money which he placed in his account. He then wrote out a cheque and delivered it. But suddenly you demanded it be stopped. Now, to my mind, someone must have influenced you in that decision. Oh? Of course. It could surely have been one of only two people. The other two seated round that card table. Joe Van Heimer or Mrs. Amanda Vane. Mr. Van Heimer is about his business. According to the Dorchester, a very busy man. That leaves Amanda Vane. Now, what did she say to you that made you stop that check, Mr. Hardcastle? <sighs> You're as astute as they say you are, Holmes. You are quite correct. Mrs. Vane wrote me a note informing me that, in her opinion, the game had been a cheat from beginning to end. Ah, that is as I thought. Uh, do you know Mrs. Vane very well? I can't say that I do. I have met her, say, half a dozen times. That's all. And yet you are prepared to accept her accusation against the sound reputation of Lord Edgerton, a man you have known and been friendly with for many years? 
How very extraordinary. It's not extraordinary at all. You see, Holmes, I have since met with Mrs. Vane, and she is able to prove her accusation. The games in which my son lost that considerable amount of money were played with a rigged deck of cards. And Lord Edgerton used them to cheat him. Well, I'm prepared to remain silent upon the matter, provided that Edgerton drops it at once and never asks a member of my family into his home again. Perhaps you'll be good enough to convey that message back to him. Good day to you, Holmes. When I got back to Baker Street that afternoon, I found Sherlock Holmes awaiting me with some impatience. He was dressed very smartly and obviously about to go out. He insisted that I went with him. It was the last thing I wanted to do, but he was adamant. I was forced to wash and change and accompany him to Eaton Square. The sumptuous home of Mrs. Amanda Vane. I found her totally enchanting. She smiled her welcome and assumed the role of a shrewd hostess. I take it that this is a business visit, Mr. Holmes, but that is no reason why you should not enjoy it. There is whiskey and soda here and cigarettes at your elbow. I'm sure the doctor would approve of a little stimulant after a hard day. May I have a small whiskey? Uh, well, y- 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 yes, of course. Well, thank you, Mrs. Vane. But before going any further, I must point out that you've put yourself in something of a predicament. Oh, good. Really, life is so boring for me, doing the same dreary social rounds that any kind of predicament sounds most exciting. And I must admit that I'm completely thrilled at meeting so famous a detective. I shall dine out on this for weeks. Here, your drink, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, do help yourself. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. Just right. Now, Mr. Holmes, right. please explain my predicament. I feel I should know what it is. You wrote a note to Lionel Hardcastle regarding a certain poker game. Later you visited him and told him that the game was a crooked one. Due to your visit, Hardcastle ordered his son to stop payment on a check for his debts. Now, the inference is that Lord Edgerton is a cheat. Now, have you heard of the laws of libel and slander, Mrs. Vane? If this comes out and you cannot prove your accusation, a suit against you would cost you a great deal of money. Oh, I know. I was aware of that before I did what I did. But what else could I do once I was convinced that the game was cheated? Well, how do you know it was? What is your proof? Well, it's really all rather simple. You see, I have no reason in the world to complain. After all, I won 50 pounds. From whom? Joe Van Heimer. And he paid me there and then in notes. Lucky me. To tell you the truth, I was thrilled a bit. I'm normally not very lucky at cards. (laughs) I do better at love, I must admit. Anyway, the game broke up very late, and I gave Mr. Van Heimer a lift back to Dorchester in my carriage. And when I was in the carriage, I realized I'd left my vanity bag behind. (laughs) So silly. I remembered exactly where I'd left it. I put the money Joe had given me in my purse, and my purse in my large handbag. That one hanging from its strap over that chair. But my vanity bag I'd left out. Well, the very next morning, I was leaving from Euston to Tring on the early 7.20 train. I had to virtually pass the Edgerton home. I stopped my carriage and called. I know it was very early and hardly the done thing, but I knew only the servants would be up. Fortunately, old Harris, the handyman, was there. He let me in. He knows me. So it was all right. I told him I'd find my own way out. So I went into the room where we played cards the night before. It was exactly as we'd left it, even to the empty glasses and the smell of stale cigarette stubs. I found my bag, just where I knew it would be, and I was about to leave when... when... Yes, go on. Well, the early morning sunlight was streaming through the lace curtains, and it fell across the card table and illuminated the back of the cards, lying just as we left them, scattered across the table. I picked one up and looked at the glazed back of it. Then I picked up another and studied that. And then another. They... they were all marked. Marked? Yes. Very cleverly marked with pinpricks along the edge of the borders. Tiny pinpricks, which you could hardly see unless you looked for them. But if you were dealing, I knew you could tell the value of the cards by touch, providing you knew the code. I see. How very clever. And then? Why... I stood there for some minutes trying to take it all in. Then I examined the other cards. They all carried some kind of small indentation. I didn't know what to do. Then I made up my mind. I took five or six cards at random and left the house. Later, I wrote to Mr. Hardcastle and took those cards along to show him. I left the decision to him. 
He stopped Ernest's check. And really, I don't think anyone can blame him. Sure you won't have another drink, Mr. Holmes? Holmes declined a drink and wished Amanda Vane a good evening. He was silent as we walked down into Sloane Square and hailed a handsome cab. And it wasn't until we were clattering our way up Sloane Street that he broke the silence. Mm. It won't do, Watson. It just won't do. It's just a sad state of affairs for Lord Edgerton. Mrs. Vane acted very well within her rights. After all, Holmes, what else could the lady do? That is exactly the point, Watson. I'm a man who deals in facts, a man who searches for clues. But clues aren't necessarily all material ones that can be studied under a microscope. One can detect from people's behavior. And Mrs. Vane's behavior was extraordinary. Well, I thought she was a perfect hostess. I mean, when she applied to the facts of the card game, for instance, why did she go to Hardcastle Senior about the cheated game? Surely the man she should have gone to is the man she played the game with. The man who stood to lose 3,500 pounds. Ernest Hardcastle is a grown man, but a, he's not a very spoilt puppy and very much under his father's thumb. But he was the one directly involved. Why didn't she go to him? Well, perhaps she did. Uh, if she did, he'd know the reason for stopping the check. He says he doesn't. Well, I, well, I don't understand. Amanda Vane didn't go to Ernest and tell him the game was a cheat. And she didn't go to Joe Vanheimer either. Now, why? Because it was necessary to their little plot that there should seem to be no collusion between them. Collusion? What? Between Mrs. Vane and Ernest Hardcastle? Oh, yes, of course. What, you mean that the, the whole thing was an, an elaborate trick? Look at it this way, Watson. Lord Edgerton told us that Lionel Hardcastle was accustomed to paying his son's gambling debts. He's a millionaire. He's not going to have society saying his son cannot pay his way. But clearly Hardcastle knows of his extravagances. So he keeps him on a short supply of money. So short that Ernest feels that sometimes he has to trick his father into giving more. I still don't understand. I'm sorry. Ernest and Amanda Dane worked it all out. They go for a poker game at Lord Edgerton's as partners. If they both won, then of course it would be all right, but Ernest loses heavily and the party breaks up. Amanda Vane leaves her vanity bag behind on purpose. Next morning, knowing the habits of Edgerton's household, she goes round there and gets herself admitted by Harris, the handyman. She sends him about his business saying she'll let herself out. In the card room, she finds her vanity bag. From it, she extracts a slender hat pin and quickly makes a series of marks on the cards in front of her. It'll be easy. A matter of ten minutes at the outside. Then she takes some of the cards and leaves. Well, Holmes, is this possible that that beautiful-looking woman, so, so charming... And... Unlike you, I've never allowed my mind to be swayed by a woman's looks. She went to Lionel Hardcastle because she knew his reaction would be to order Ernest to stop payment on the check. Holmes, but surely you could be wrong. I mean, well, I, I can't believe that Amanda Vane is a liar. I think she's worse than that. And she gets her facts wrong. I know the train's out of Euston on a weekday morning. There is no train on the main line to Tring at 7.20. The northbound expresses don't stop at Tring. The first train out of Euston that does is the 10.5 for Coventry. It's a small point, but significant. Oh, Holmes. Holmes, if you, if you are correct, then what are we to do? Well, I think if they can cheat, then so can I. Uh, driver? Driver? Yes, sir? I changed my mind. Not Baker Street. Take us to Hanover Square, number five. The home of Lord Arthur Edgerton. And smartly, please... arrival at Hanover Square, Holmes asked me to stay in the cab. He ran up the steps, rang the bell, and was admitted by the butler. Twenty minutes elapsed before he returned, a grim smile of satisfaction on his face. Climbing into the cab, he said, Ah, well, that's that. It'll cost his lordship another hundred pounds and the hire of the Rose Room at the Dorchester so that I think it will be worth it. You have an interesting evening out in front of you for tomorrow, Watson. Uh, uh, Baker Street now. Thank you, driver. I knew better than to question Holmes when he was in one of his secretive moods. I would have to be kept in the dark along with everyone else. But I did make sure that I was free the next evening, and once again, suitably attired for the occasion, I accompanied him to the Dorchester Hotel. We were shown to the Rose Room, and there were Lord Edgerton and the American, to whom I was introduced, Joe Van Heimer. We were given drinks, and then Hardcastle and his son arrived. I really don't understand all this. What is it all about? I received your telegram, Holmes, but... Oh, Edgerton. I hardly expected this. Good evening, Lionel. Yes. Good evening, Ernest. Hello. I don't think you know Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, do you? Good evening. Look, what does this mean? If there is no explanation, then I think we should go with Watson. Please don't go before our last guest arrives. Ah, here she is. Uh, please come in, Mrs. Vane. 
Good evening. I came in answer to your telegram, Ernest. I didn't expect a gathering like this. What does it mean? Oh, come along now. Uh, please, oh, please, please do allow me, do allow me to offer what? my apologies. Mm. I'm afraid I've been guilty of sending telegrams under false names. I'm sorry, but I needed to gather you all together, and it seemed the only way. I think we all know now of the trouble that arose out of the poker game held at Lord Edgerton's the other evening. There's been a great deal of confusion, and I think it right that the truth be told between these four walls. I do assure you that as far as I'm concerned, it will never be talked of again outside this room. Get to the point, man. Very well. I have to say that a false accusation has been made against the integrity of my client, Lord Edgerton. Mrs. Vane maintains that he played with marked cards for the last game in which Ernest Hardcastle lost a very great deal of money. That accusation is completely untrue. How dare you? I stand by every word I say. The cards were marked with pinpricks, but you marked them the morning after the game <clears throat> when you called to collect your vanity back. Now, didn't you, Mrs. That's Vane? That's a lie, a wicked lie. You, you cannot prove that. No? There's one other person here who has yet to make an appearance. Let me draw back the curtain. Good evening. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I was told to come here, like Mr. Holmes said. Because this man saw you using a hat pin to make those marks. The door was slightly ajar. There's a mirror on the wall near the fireplace. You were actually seen, Mrs. Bain. Uh, you fool, you stupid blundering fool. Oh. Why didn't you make sure you were alone? Thank you. That's all we needed to know. I think Hardcastle, Lord Edgerton... You must decide future actions between yourselves, don't you? Of course, Ernest knew that once the money was in the bank, his father would never ask for it to be returned, so he was £3,500 to the good. He isn't now, but signed £500 better off. And uh, the man, Harris? He is £100 to the good. Uh, you will notice, Watson, that he didn't actually lie at all. He just had to appear. I did the lying for him. Mrs. Vane's reaction and Ernest Hardcastle's sense of guilt did the rest. Yes, uh, quite a profitable investigation. I'm sure my bank manager would be very pleased. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson. Well, that's about the size of it, Dr. Watson. I just have to travel north to Cumberland and I simply can't take young Harry, my grandson. I'll only be gone a few days. But I can't leave the boy alone in the house, and he don't know nobody in London. So you're wondering if Sherlock Holmes will allow him to come and stay here at 221B Baker Street, hmm? Well, I know it's an imposition, but... Well, Harry's a bright boy. I know he'll behave himself and not get in the way. Of course, if it relied on you, it wouldn't be so bad. For you're a doctor, can used to handling children. But Mr. Holmes, well, there's no doubt that he can be difficult. I wondered, perhaps if you talk to him, stand up the ground, as it were. Oh, all right, Mrs. Hudson, I appreciate your problem. I'll do my best to persuade Mr. Holmes. Oh, thank you, sir. There won't be no trouble, I promise you that. Harry will be as good as gold. You'll see. Present the stories of Sherlock Holmes. The Young Visitor. I knew that to put up a lively young boy in our rooms for any length of time would cause untold trouble. But I didn't see why we shouldn't try to help for a short while. There was a small box room at the top of the house that had a trestle bed in it. It could be made quite comfortable. The only difficulty was Sherlock Holmes and his work. 
He was the last man in London to want a small boy under his feet while he was engaged upon a case. I broached the subject carefully the next morning. Much to my surprise, Holmes agreed to the arrangement quite amicably. Mrs. Hudson was delighted, and on the Friday afternoon showed him the lad, all dressed in his Sunday best and schooled in the proper behaviour. Come in now, Harry, and say hello to Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? Very pleased to meet you, Doctor. So, you're Harry and you're to be our young visitor for a few days. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for letting me stay here. Harry's a bright lad. He won't make any trouble. I mean, he isn't rowdy or anything like that. As long as there's plenty of books for him to look at, he'll be as quiet as a mouse. Well, there are plenty of those, although perhaps you aren't quite grown up enough for most of them. Well, young man, sit yourself down. It's a bit early for tea. Grand showed me where everything is, sir. I can get it for you any time. Uh, well, not yet. Well, come on, sit down and tell us something about yourself. Oh, um, th there isn't much. I'd sooner hear about you, Mr. Holmes. Do you really catch criminals, murderers and people like that? And do they fight to the death at the very end? <laughs> well, not very often. A detection isn't all blood and thunder. It's a question of observation and thinking in the right manner. But I'm not working on any case at the moment, so you needn't bother about disturbing me. Oh, that's a pity. I think I'd like to be a detective when I grow up. Well, there's plenty of time for that. Now, what would you like to do this weekend? Play games? Visit the zoo? Uh, not really. You know what I'd really like? No? What? To go down Charing Cross Road and look at all the second-hand bookstores. Now, that will really be a treat. Well, if that's what you want, that's exactly what we shall do. We shall do so tomorrow morning. How's that? It's a promise. Wow! I think I'm really going to enjoy it here. I really do. Things had got off to a most pleasant start. It was clear that Holmes liked the boy, who was quick-witted and not over-familiar. True to his promise, Holmes ordered a handsome cab the next day, and the two of them started off for an exploration of the London bookshops. Charing Cross Road was the obvious start. Holmes knew every store intimately. And one in particular, Nesbitt and Son, was a great favourite. Well, now, Mr. Holmes, found anything to your liking? Uh, not at the moment, Nesbitt, but I'll browse around if you don't mind. Make yourself at home, sir. Make yourself at home. Mr. Holmes, just come and look at what I found. What is it, Harry? Look! It's an old book all filled with maps and drawings. Look! Sailing ships and pirates. All the voyages marked out. Called E. White Cosgrove. Travels of imagination and exploration. What's that? Precious me. And then, what have you got an old Cosgrove out here on the store pavement for? What's it marked out as? Five shillings. It should be worth far more than that. Well, I don't know. It came in with a job lot from a Mr. Robert Johnson of the Manor, Lake uh, Radlett. It's in a poor state. Many pages missing and the cover is stained and walked in. It's a pity. It's rare enough, but I doubt if it could be restored. Me? May I buy it? I'd love to start a collection with this. I've got half the money. If you put the other half, I promise I'll pay you back. That's all right. Wrap it up, Nesbitt. The young man's found what he wants. Very good, Mr. Holmes. We must encourage a budding bibliophile, mustn't we? The rest of that day, young Harry stayed in the box room, poring over travels of imagination and exploration. We heard not a sound from him. It was on the Sunday morning, after a brisk walk in the park, that we returned to find a visitor had called. Ah, come in, Watson. Young Harry, this is Miss Amelia Johnson. She's called about the book you bought yesterday, Harry. I rather think she wants to buy it from you. What? I'm sorry. Perhaps you'll let me explain, young man. You see, my uncle is Mr. Robert Johnson, and this book came from his private collection. I think there must have been a slight mistake. The volume should never have been included in the parcel of books sent to Nesbitt in London. Since then, a few pages have been discovered, which, when added to the book, would make it quite valuable. We found out Mr. Holmes' name and address from Nesbitt's, and he said he was sure you would agree to send it back. I'll offer you far more than you paid for it. Now, what do you say? No. I'll give you a sovereign here and now for the book. Here? See, a bright new golden sovereign. Mr. Holmes, I... I don't have to sell a book, do I? I'll never get another one like it. And if that page is missing, well, 
Well, maybe I'll be able to buy them for this lady later on. The book rightfully belongs to you, Harry. It's yours, and you've paid for it quite honestly. Of course, Miss Johnson, the missing pages may deal with the island of Corsium and the legend of the dinosaur. Uh, there is a reference to that later on in the book, isn't that so? Exactly, Mr. Holmes. It's a shame that the tales are remaining complete. We're anxious to see the volume whole again. I don't think my offer is unreasonable. Not at all. But it's entirely up to you, Harry. A sovereign back for five shillings outlay is a good investment. I don't want a good investment. I want my book and she shan't have it so there. I'm sorry, but the answer is no. Oh, well, that's your answer, I'm afraid. The child is entitled to keep what is rightfully his. He's a junior. Surely he has parents I can appeal to. People who will listen to reason. I'm afraid not. None that you can approach at the moment. He's staying with me in the box room in the roof until his grandmother returns next week. But Harry is a strong-willed boy. I doubt if anyone will make him change his mind. Not even if I made the offer five guineas? I very much doubt it. I'm sorry, Miss Johnson. I'm afraid your visit from Radliff has been a waste of time. Uh, please, may I show you out? Now, look here, Harry. We appear to have stirred up quite a hornet's nest with this purchase of yours. I'm sorry. I don't want to sell it. No, and I don't think you should. Remember, I told you that detection was observation and clear logical thinking? Well, this is the case in point. I believe that that book is far more valuable than anyone knows. Now, why did Miss Johnson go to such lengths to regain it? She knows nothing of its contents. I deliberately misled her by quoting the island of Corsium and the dinosaur, a total fabrication. Now, she's offering five guineas for a book Nesbitt thinks only worth five shillings. Now, she's not going to stop there. If she can't buy it, she will be arranging to steal it. Oh, you think so? No, oh, indeed I do. I've let her know that you occupy the box room at the top of the house with a small window jutting out onto the roof. I shall be very much surprised if you don't have a visitor call upon you this very night. A real life burglar! What do we do? Bolt the window? Call the police? Uh, there's no need to call the police when I'm here. And no need to bolt the window either. In fact, you will leave it open. Now listen, Harry... Here is a real adventure for you. Now, this is what we shall do. You will go to bed as usual tonight, but after it's dark. After the initial tussle, the two men who had entered the box room from the roof gave up. They were clearly amateurs at the game and even appeared shamefaced after the lamps were lit and the window closed. Holmes viewed them with contempt mixed with pity. As he listened to their awkward explanations, I'd never touch the job if I'd known. So help me, I wouldn't. Well, me neither. And we was just told to climb in here and get back a book that this kid had nicked from a bookstore. We didn't nick it. It cost five bob. Quiet, Harry. Well, you made a right mess of breaking and entering. Did whoever engaged you tell you who I was and who this young lad is? Oh, no. We thought we'd find the place empty. We was told what books to look for. Uh, travels of imagination, something like that. E. White Cosgroves. Travels of imagination and exploration. And I'll have you know that this is the house of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, blimey. You Sherlock Holmes? Oh, now we're for it. Before we send for the police, perhaps you can tell me the name and address of whoever put you up to this attempted burglary. A fellow called Alan Mortimer. He lives at 28 Bermondside Mansions, Main Road, Radlett. Radlett. Ah, yes. Things are beginning to form a pattern. Now, look, you two, it's clear that you have been duped and made fools of. On the other hand, had you been successful, you would no doubt have handed over the book and collected payment. How much were you offered for this job? Ten quid apiece. Ah, that confirms our impression of the value of the book, doesn't it, Harry? Look, this is what I shall do. I will turn you over to the police, but I shan't prefer charges until tomorrow. If I can clear up this matter swiftly, 
Then we will see if we can't let you off with just a warning. But if things go wrong, I shall call upon you to give evidence against the true offender. Is that clear? Oh, oh yes. yes. Thank yes. you, sir. Thank you. All right, Watson. Well, let's get these men down to the police station. Then I think we've had enough for one Sunday night. Tomorrow, we shall be paying a visit to Bradlett, to the home of Mr. Robert Johnson, where I hope we can successfully conclude this very interesting matter. And as for you, Harry, you get to bed with no more questions asked. Understand? could not resist the temptation of a trip to Radlett the following day. With the two would-be burglars still under lock and key, there is no chance of any information leading back to the man who called himself Alan Mortimer. It was typical of Holmes that he made young Harry do up the controversial book in a neat brown paper parcel with string tied in reef knots. We then took a train to Stanmore and a carriage to Manor Lake Rapids. Paying off the carriage, we walked up the long driveway. Obviously, the land and manor had at one time been a famous property. A vast lake stretched to the west of the house. An attempt had been made to control the foliage, but whoever had made it had fought a losing battle. We were crossing the final lawn when two figures appeared upon another driveway. A man and a woman. Ah, now, who do I see approaching? You have but seen her once. What do you say, Harry? An awful woman who wants to buy my valuable book. Yes, and meet Amelia Johnson, all right. Who's that with her? Yes. I'd make an even guess that his name is Alan Mortimer. Hardy bloke who organized the burglar. Now, if I'm right, young Harry, you must keep your mouth firmly shut. You are not going to let on about anything that has happened. If you do, you will destroy everything. Understand? But... Now, they've seen us, and they've also recognized us. They cannot refuse to greet us. But whatever I say, you must agree, no matter how much you hate it, you must smile and nod and be a little gentleman. Understand? But I... All right, I agree. Good. Here we are. Now, good morning, Miss Johnson. I hope you'll pardon this intrusion. The fact is that my young friend here has had a change of heart and thinks he would like to talk to your uncle about the purchase of his book. What? Uh, oh, well, I... Uh, I see. I don't know where Uncle is. I think he's inside the house. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Good morning. Good morning, Harry. Mom. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Oh, uh, allow me to introduce you. This is my fiancé, Alan Mortimer. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do? And Harry. Pleased uh, to meet you. Uh, would you excuse us? I think we'd better go on up to the house. I'd like to conclude this transaction as soon as possible. Come, Watson. Harry, this way. Uh, good morning to Miss Johnson. Good morning, Mr. Mortimer. Alan? I mean, what on earth could have happened? I thought you'd arranged everything, but there was no need to worry. Something must have gone wrong. Those men have bungled it. Well, what do we do now? If Uncle gets that book back, that man Sherlock Holmes is quite Look, capable. Look, we shall just have to wait. If Holmes does work things out, it will go very heavily against us. But we shall just have to wait and see, shan't we? Within a few minutes, we were up at the house. An elderly manservant showed us into a large, dilapidated room where, from behind an enormous desk, a thin, distinguished man rose to his feet and made us welcome. He explained his circumstances and how he came to part with the book. As you can tell by looking around you, Mr. Holmes, my family have fallen on rather hard times. We used, in the old days, to be very wealthy. My ancestors have lived here for hundreds of years. I am the last of the Johnsons. Yes, naturally, I wish to end my days here. The thought of giving up the place at my age is repugnant to me. So I have been forced to sell my possessions in order to live. Amongst the things I got rid of is the family silver and many rare books. I sent a whole lot to Nesbitt and son. Amongst them was the Crossgrove. I failed to see why you wished to return it. I don't. But there's a riddle attached to this book, Mr. Johnson. And I think with your help, I can solve that riddle. And perhaps in doing so, I'll be able to help you overcome some of your more pressing problems. Riddle? What sort of riddle? I don't understand. Open up the book, Harry. Very well, sir. Now, to start with, I want to know who was the original owner of this book, his background, the sort of man he was. Well, that's easily answered. It was my great-grandfather, old Peter. He returned for many years sailing the world and did a lot of rebuilding to this manor. He created the lake, set out the gardens, 
<laughs> he was an eccentric, an amiable adventurer. Ah, so he landscaped the grounds. Harry, turn to the centre spread pages of the book. But those are the two pages that show the south of England and the Isle of Wight. There are lovely monsters and even a whale blowing water spout. Look, lots of pirates and galleons. It's a bit messy, though. Someone seems to have written in the margins. Can't read it very well. What's it mean, Mr. Holmes? An examination of the writing through a magnifying glass. Ah, yes. T-R-E-S-O-R-T-R-O-U-V-E. Oh, Tresor Trouvé. Treasure found, or as we say, treasure trove. Yes, and it's on the island marked with a cross, very near to that water spout. A treasure? On the Isle of Wight? <laughs> I think not. Let's come to the window. You see the French windows open out with a view across the lake. Now, do you see anything unusual about it? Oh, bless if I can. Uh, well, it looks a bit overgrown. That's if you forgive the observation, Mr. Johnson. Oh, I agree, but... Personally, I've never liked that lake. It seems so oddly designed. No symmetry. Just everything thrown together. Look more closely at the small island towards the far end. I think if we had a bird's eye view of its shape, we would be reminded of something. Now, does it mean anything? Well, I... I, I must confess I don't know what you're getting at. Well, what about you, Harry? Come along. You're a bright boy. What does it remind you of? Well, funny. I've got it. It's the same shape as a map. The Isle of Wight, like in the book. Ah, exactly. But I don't understand you. You mean that old Peter landscaped that lake and island to, to resemble this map? That's it. Now, wait a moment. There must have been a reason. What's the, the treasure trove? You think that there's some sort of treasure hidden on that island out there? Well, one can but assume that old Peter worked all this out for that reason. It explains why this book is so valuable. I presume that you have a boat that can get us across to the island, Mr. Johnson. Well, there's an old rowing boat more down there. Oh, I haven't been across to the island for months. Oh, Giles, my manservant, will know if it can still be you. Good, then I suggest a trip to the island and a little exploring, don't you? Wow! Very treasure! The boys at school are never going to believe this. Come on! Oh, I don't understand. There isn't any water spot, Mr. Holmes. So how can we know where to look? Uh, what's that half hidden in the reeds and bushes? Looks like a sort of fountain. Hey, a water spot! Pull up alongside it, Watson. Right, Herb. Uh, there. Right. Now, you have a spade, Mr. Johnson. Right. Let's get ashore and start to dig around that fountain. I think but a few paces the other side is the nearest we can attempt. Uh, ready? Yes, 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 I'm ready. <sighs> ah, there's something here. It's metal. Joe, look. There's a small metal box. Now, <clears throat> come on, give me a hand. Uh, smooth away the earth, Harry. Right. All right, open it. Yes, it doesn't appear to be locked. If it is, prize it open, Watson. Right. <sighs> sight met our eyes when the small metal box was open. Even though the sovereigns it contained had been buried in the moist earth for all those years, they appeared almost newly minted. They were genuine enough. The look of sheer amazement on Robert Johnson's face was only matched by the wonder of young Harry. I really believe that at that moment all this young boy's dreams came true. It was simply a fairy tale for him. Back at the house, Robert Johnson couldn't contain his delight. But Holmes, unperturbed, had to curb his enthusiasm. I'm afraid we now have to come to the unpleasant part of the whole adventure, Mr. Johnson. I have to tell you that your niece is not the timid, loyal creature you thought her to be. She found some missing pages to the book by White Cosgrove. On those pages must have been the information that elsewhere in the book was the clue to all this money. Perhaps it said... Look at the centre pages, something like that. Anyway, she didn't tell you. She went to Alan Mortimer, the man she wishes to marry. She and he made a plan to get hold of the book, seek out where old Peter had buried his fortune and claim it for themselves. They would have tricked you out of this money. I think when you confront them with this treachery, they will be unable to deny it. If they do, well, I have proof. Witnesses now under lock and key. Get rid of both of them and enjoy your old age, Mr. Johnson. 
I, I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Holmes. Surely there must be some way, some reward. Holmes refused the reward. The young Harry Hudson went back to London with ten shiny sovereigns in his pocket. The happiest lad in the whole world. Listen again next Sunday to The Stories of Sherlock Holmes with Graham Armitage's Holmes and Kerry Jordan as Dr. Watson.